This is Audible. These lectures are part of the Great Courses. The Great Courses cover a broad array of university-level disciplines. The lectures in each course are either 30 or 45 minutes long. By listening for less than an hour a day, you can finish even the longest course in just weeks. Browse our catalog or website at thegreatcourses.com and imagine how much you could learn if you spent just 30 minutes a day for the next year in the best college classrooms in the world. The lectures are university professors carefully selected by The Great Courses and its customers for intellectual distinction and teaching excellence. These lectures are part of the Great Courses series. These lectures are titled Living the French Revolution and the Age of Napoleon. Your lecturer is Professor Suzanne M. Dazan. Dr. Dazan is the Vilas Schenner's Distinguished Achievement Professor of History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She holds an MA and a PhD in History from the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Dazan's love of teaching has been recognized by numerous awards, including the University of Wisconsin Chancellor's Distinguished Teaching Award. Dr. Dazan has sought out wider audiences for her teaching by participating in Wisconsin Public Radio's University of the Air, the Chicago Humanities Festival, and seminars and workshops sponsored by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Among the books she has written or co-edited are The Family on Trial in Revolutionary France, and the French Revolution in Global Perspective. Lecture 1, Introduction and the Old Regime Monarchy. Let's start with three moments in time. It's early June. 1775, in the magnificent cathedral at Reims. The young Louis XVI is only 20 years old. He walks toward the altar for his consecration as king of France. He's outfitted in a glorious long silver robe. The stands in the cathedral are packed with aristocrats and high clergy. The common people are waiting outside. In his hand, the bishop has a vial filled with the holy oil of the French monarchy. This is the exact same oil that a dove had carried down from heaven to baptize the first Christian king of France 13 centuries earlier. The bishop anoints the young Louis. The king then bows his head to the solemn moment. His wife, Marie Antoinette, overcome with emotion, bursts into tears. Now, fast forward 18 years later. It's fall, 1793, four years into the French Revolution. A band of revolutionaries enters the Cathedral of Reims. A blacksmith mounts onto the altar. The crowd is cheering nervously. He snatches the vial of sacred oil and smashes it to smithereens with his hammer. The monarchy itself has fallen. How could that drop of oil be sacred? Now fast forward another 11 years to 1804 in the Paris Cathedral of Notre Dame this time. Pope Pius VII marks the brow of Napoleon Bonaparte with a new sacred oil. Napoleon is magnificent. He's wearing ermine, silk, and diamonds. He stuns the crowd by seizing the golden crown and putting it on his own head. Fifteen years before Napoleon crowned himself emperor, revolution had broken out in France in 1789. That revolution would last for ten years. At first, the French anticipated sharing power with their king. But eventually, they overthrew him and attempted to build a democratic republic in which every man had a share in power. The revolution was radical. The revolutionaries also attacked the church. They abolished the privileged world of aristocrats. They tried to institute social and legal equality in many ways. In the process, they unleashed the terror and then resurrected their republic. The revolutionaries' attempt to institute representative democracy and equality was flawed, but it changed the modern Western world forever. And when the revolution couldn't deliver all that it promised, it produced still another political experiment. In 1799, the Corsican general, Napoleon Bonaparte, staged a coup d'etat. 
He seized control of the fragile revolutionary republic. Before long, he had made himself emperor of France and then emperor of a huge swath of Europe. This course explores this astonishing and pivotal period of European history. This lecture will introduce some themes of the course, and then we'll take a look at the French monarchy at Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. At the heart of this course lies an important question. What happens when a people living in a deeply hierarchical society and a traditional monarchy try to invent modern democratic politics and an egalitarian society of rights-bearing citizens? How do you wrench the modern out of the old? Before we spend 48 lectures answering that question, I should introduce myself. My name is Suzanne Dazan. I've devoted my career to studying the French Revolutionary era. This era, its actors, its dreams, its politics, its tragedies, it just won't let me go. I seem to be addicted to the French Revolution. In college, I wrote my first serious research paper about a revolutionary journalist named Camille Desmoulins. He was audacious enough to call for an end to the terror. At the time, I thought he was heroic and idealistic. I realized later that his motives were much more complicated, but I still named my first laptop after him. In my own research, I have focused the most on those places where the revolution touched the intimate lives of ordinary people, religion, the family, daily life. I still remember opening my first carton of documents from the French Revolution at the National Archives in Paris. I was just a 24-year-old American student, and I couldn't believe they would let me touch those pages. I was thrilled. Of course, I couldn't read them at first, but 18th century handwriting is, is actually pretty easy. And before long, I was busy trying to figure out how French citizens lived the revolution. Thousands of other historians have been just as intrigued by this era. Take Napoleon Bonaparte. Apparently, there are more books and articles published about him than there are days since he died. That makes tens of thousands of studies on Bonaparte alone. Why have so many people been powerfully drawn to examining this period of history? For one thing, the revolutionary and Napoleonic era undeniably had a cataclysmic and lasting impact on all kinds of realms. Politics, social relations, religion, war, empire building, the intellectual and literary world. Europe would never be the same. Other parts of the world, especially the Caribbean and the Americas, also felt the impact. So the revolutionary and Napoleonic era shaped the modern world in historically specific ways that we'll look at. But at the same time, this era fascinates us because the actors dealt with such timeless human problems. There's something deeply compelling about the rawness of this moment of history. It lays bare humanity at its most idealistic and its most tragic. Almost nothing can match the zeal and fervor and heady optimism of the early revolutionaries. They were filled with fire to build the egalitarian republic. And almost nothing can match the tragedy of the terror. That moment when the dreams of liberty and equality fell beneath the blade of the guillotine. The French Revolution doesn't generate a pantheon of heroes or a set of founding fathers like the American Revolution. Its legacy is too divisive. It's too controversial for that. Napoleon. Napoleon maybe comes closest, but he too was a deeply polarizing figure. At the time and later on, many idealized him and many hated him. But either way, love him or hate him, we can't fail to be intrigued by his story. A meteoric rise to power. He seems to come out of nowhere and then a cataclysmic fall. And he spends the last six years of his life on some rocky island in the southern Atlantic spinning his legacy and dreaming of what might have been. So I'm excited to share with you this absolutely compelling era of history. It is deeply human and gripping in its drama. And it was undeniably pivotal in producing ideas, political models, and social experiments for the 19th and 20th centuries. Now, what are some of the themes of the course and some of the significances of this era? The first theme revolves around politics and political creativity. We will ask, how did the French create and experiment with multiple kinds of politics? Political changes occurred at a dizzying pace during this 25-year period. And for the 19th century, the revolutionary era kicked up many political options and models, 
including constitutional monarchy, representative democracy, revolutionary dictatorship by committee, liberalism, conservatism, and authoritarian one-man rule in Napoleon. But for now, let's focus on the largest political legacy, the sudden invention of democracy, the creation of a republic in the largest, most populous monarchy in Western Europe. In 18th century France, just like in the other powerful countries in continental Europe, a single monarch held power, inherited power that came from God. In theory, that power was absolute. But the revolution opened up politics to thousands of new players, first to elite leaders and then to almost everybody. How did France take up their apprenticeship in democracy, or as they would call it, republicanism? How did so many actors in France set about trying to create new political practices and ideas? As more and more people got involved in politics and worked to change the world, it generated unbelievable excitement, energy, and creativity. But the sheer opening up of politics also produced violence, conflict, counter-revolution, and the terror. Why? Why and how? And then the revolution also led to a great paradox. A single individual first seemed to save the republic from itself, but then he crowned himself emperor. We'll ask how that occurred and explore how it transformed the revolution's political goals. The French Revolution posed the problem of democracy in the most acute and explosive way for modern Europe. And this problem of democracy was not just political, it was also a social question, the question of equality and rights. Beyond politics, as a second theme, we'll explore the breathtaking, all-pervasive impact of the revolutionary and Napoleonic era on everyday life. How do you create equality and remake people as rights-bearing citizens? How do you ratchet equality out of centuries of embedded hierarchy, aristocracy, and privilege? The rest of Europe and even America looked on in shock. The revolutionaries introduced all kinds of astonishing social and cultural experiments. They abolished aristocracy and privilege. They took away the wealth and lands of the Catholic Church. And they even tried to shut down religious practice. The revolutionaries declared that all laws applied equally to all men. They gave Jews rights, for example. They allowed wives to divorce their husbands. And they abolished slavery after thousands of slaves rose up in revolt in the colonies. We'll ask how so many innovations like these affected ordinary people's lives. But here's the point. Well, it's two points, really. First, the revolutionary era had huge significance because it posed the question of rights and equality so acutely for the first time in Europe. Earthly equality, not spiritual equality. And second, it had lasting power precisely because its actions were so radical. In France, but also beyond, people knew that a sea change had taken place. The earth was shifting beneath their feet. It was exhilarating and terrifying. Tradition, the bedrock natural order of things, like God, church, king, and social hierarchy, they were suddenly gone in this massive country. And the French and Napoleon tried to bring some of these social and cultural changes abroad as well. The revolution was also startlingly new. That newness, that radical possibility of change, that helped to define what it meant to be modern, especially taken together with other changes like the Industrial Revolution. Now, a revolution like this, such a far-reaching revolution, it couldn't be contained within France. And Napoleon, with his restless ambition, he definitely couldn't be contained within France. So that leads me to my third theme, the international impact and significance of the revolution and Napoleon. The revolution drew inspiration from a transnational exchange of ideas. It also generated enormous international excitement. At the same time, among the kings of Europe, the revolution fell like a bombshell into European geopolitics. It ended up unleashing Europe-wide war, 23 years of nearly nonstop warfare. In this world of war, Napoleon rocketed to fame, and from his very first victories, his actions had international consequences. We'll ask what impact revolutionary ideas and practices had abroad in the French colonies and across Europe and even the Americas. The revolutionaries themselves tried to spread revolution abroad, 
but they also wanted to seize territory. At the height of revolutionary expansionism, they enlarged France's borders, and they also created eight sister republics, Italy, Switzerland, and the Netherlands. Napoleon, of course, would go much further. He created a European empire stretching from Holland to Croatia, from Poland to Spain. So this era posed quintessential questions for modern empire building. What is the relationship between democracy and colonizing other peoples? How does Napoleon invent new and influential forms of empire, militarily, politically, culturally? The revolution and Napoleon generate no end of compelling questions about international dynamics. Okay, we have a lot to do. Let's start by looking at the monarchy at Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette. We'll look at the changing nature of kingship on the eve of the revolution. Louis XVI was in the Bourbon family line, descended from the Capetian dynasty that had ruled France since 987. Over the centuries, French kings had enlarged their territory bit by bit through inheritance, conquest, and marriage. More recently, they built a powerful bureaucracy of royal officials across the land. The king made the law. In theory, his power was absolute, though it was limited by his own religious conscience and by certain fundamental laws of the kingdom. He couldn't pass the throne on down to a female heir, for example. And in practice, the great size and the diversity of France limited his power. In Catholic France, the church held great authority and also supported the king. According to the divine right of kings, the power of an absolutist monarch came straight from God. And just as God acted as a father to humanity, the king was father of his people. The young Louis wrote down, the charity of the prince must be modeled on the charity of God. Since medieval days, French kings had two bodies, one mortal body and one sacred one. Louis XVI's first body, his mortal physical body, stood about six feet tall. It was rather stout because every morning he consumed one roast chicken, six eggs in sauce, and a slice of ham, all washed down with a bottle and a half of champagne. His mortal body had blonde hair, blue eyes, a weak chin, a ponderous style, and an ungainly gait. His physical self loved hunting and locksmithing more than he loved his wife. But as king, Louis XVI had a second body, a sacred body, that according to the divine right of kings would never die. As Bishop Bossuet had said to Louis XIV a hundred years earlier, you are of the gods. The man dies, it is true. But the king, we say, never dies. Each mortal king would die, but French kingship lived on always, sacred and eternal. The king's coronation in the great cathedral at Reims acted out this sacredness for all France to see. And after his consecration, Louis XVI went out into the crowd and he performed the royal touch. For centuries, French kings had had the miraculous power to use their touch to cure individuals who were suffering from a skin disease called scrofula. In the royal touch, the king made the sign of the cross on the forehead of his subject, and the king said, the king touches you, God heals you. Louis XVI touched over 2,400 subjects that day, but he used a slightly different phrase. The king touches you, may God heal you. Notice just a hint of doubt about the power of miracles and also a hint of doubt about the power of mere kings to channel the divine. And in fact, Louis XV before him had stopped performing the royal touch. In the 18th century, the king was still seen as a powerful being anointed by God to govern France, but his full sacredness seems to have slipped just a bit. The Enlightenment, the great cultural movement of the 18th century, the Enlightenment had produced questioning about the power of the divine. Enlightenment thinkers had suggested a new model of kingship, a model based not on divine right, but on a social contract with the people. Many authors theorized that kings should make policy by responding to Enlightenment thinkers and experts. In fact, Louis' main advisor had even proposed that he skip the consecration as too absurd a ceremony for this Enlightened era. But Louis insisted. The cultural ferment of the Enlightenment put pressure on kings to reinvent themselves. Some decisive rulers, like Frederick II of Prussia or Joseph II of Austria, they took up the challenge and invented a new kind of enlightened absolutism. 
But as for Louis, he was caught between two tendencies. On the one hand, he welcomed advisors who were steeped in Enlightenment ideas about reform on behalf of the public good. But on the other hand, he saw himself as the sacred and ultimate guardian of tradition, privilege, royal authority, and the hierarchical society of aristocracy and church. As a young man, he recorded, I know that I owe it to God for having chosen me to reign. That commitment would make it excruciatingly difficult for him to be king in a time of revolution. What was Louis XVI like as a personality? When he took the throne in 1774, the year before his official coronation, he was only 19 years old. He was shy and quiet. He had awkward manners at court. He didn't have much natural grace or personal flair. He was slow to speak, slow to decide, slow to act. He wrote, I would rather let people interpret my silence than my words. Many observers at the time and since then thought his understated style was a sign of a lack of intelligence. But he wasn't really dumb. He was pathologically indecisive, a serious problem for a king. Louis sincerely tried to be the best king he could. He tried to be benevolent and charitable toward his people. He called them his children. As a leader, he had a studious interest in issues of foreign policy and finance. He was well-read in history and geography. He learned German, Italian, and English. He even began translating Edward Gibbon into French. Louis had a mind for detail. He loved hunting and kept meticulous records about every rabbit, boar, or stag he had killed. And from age 11 on, he noted down each horse he rode, all 128 of them. His journals recorded detailed lists of expenses for the royal household. But his diary didn't leave behind reflections that would reveal his soul, or even very much about what he thought about kingship. Whatever his flaws, Louis XVI remained beloved by his people. Many of them liked his unpretentious style. In 1778, one gossipy newspaper commented, no one could be more natural and amiable than Louis XVI. Now the press and the people were much less enthusiastic about his wife, Marie Antoinette. She was pretty, she was lively, with blonde hair and blue eyes. She had an aquiline nose. She cut a stylish figure. And she was the 15th child born to the formidable Austrian Empress Maria Theresa. In the spring of 1770, she journeyed west from Vienna. On a neutral island in the Rhine River, she put aside her Austrian clothes. She dressed herself in a ceremonial French robe and said goodbye forever to her Austrian entourage. A few weeks later, she and Louis were married. She was only 14. He was 15. This match had been made in hopes of cementing France's unpopular diplomatic alliance with Austria. Becoming a French queen was not easy for the Austrian princess. For one thing, for years, she couldn't accomplish her most crucial mission as queen, giving birth to an heir. Seven long years passed before Louis and Marie Antoinette even consummated their marriage. Their lack of fertility was an affair of state. Spies perched in the royal bedroom and crude rumors dogged the royal couple. Finally, Louis underwent a small operation. Then Marie Antoinette successfully gave birth to four children, including two boys, but her reputation never fully recovered. And as she faced other difficulties, many of the French never really forgave her for being Austrian. At court, her clumsy attempts to further the Austrian alliance fell flat. Her own husband was opposed to the alliance. As a girl, she'd gotten remarkably little education. She was not very well prepared for the swirl of politics and factions at Versailles. She lacked judgment, and she never learned to maneuver well in this political labyrinth. She didn't exercise the wide patronage expected of a French queen. Instead, she actually alienated many people by developing private parties and a separate luxurious social world at the Petit Trianon and at her peasant hamlet at Versailles. She said, there, I can be myself. This cliquishness won her few friends. One duke complained, except for some favorites designated by whim or intrigue, everyone was excluded. Marie Antoinette gained a reputation for frivolity, and rumors spread that she took both men and women as lovers. In 1785, an incident took place 
that through no fault of her own, tarnished her reputation even more. It's called the diamond necklace affair. It's worth telling the story of this swindle because it gives us a window into a crucial point. Attitudes toward the aristocracy and privilege were becoming more critical in the 1780s. On the fringes of the court, there was a clever but poor lesser noble woman, the Countess de la Motte. She had her eye on the Cardinal de Rohan. This aristocratic cardinal came from one of the oldest, grandest noble families of France. He clearly hopes to win the queen's favor. Maybe she could be a path to power, and he aspired to the highest ministry. With all her charm and guile, the Countess de la Motte suggests to Rohan that she could put in a word with the queen on his behalf. He eagerly agrees. Soon the Countess begins forging suggestive notes from the queen to the cardinal on lovely blue paper. Rohan is smitten. He's sure that the queen caught his eye and nodded to him at the royal supper. La Motte even hires a prostitute to masquerade as the queen in the Garden of Versailles. That woman stands in the bushes at twilight, and this impersonator presses a red rose into Rohan's hand and says mysteriously, you know what this means. Then she disappears into the shadows. From time to time, the Countess de la Motte says to the Cardinal, the Queen is short on funds. You know, Louis is a tightwad. So the Cardinal de Rohan willingly forks over some money to the Countess to pass on to the Queen. And he doesn't notice that la Motte and her husband are living in a grander style than before. Finally, one day, La Motte tells Rohan about a necklace, a diamond necklace of incomparable beauty and value. Three rivers of diamonds, 647 flawless gems, gorgeous teardrop pendants. This masterpiece costs 1.6 million livres. Rohan hesitates, but finally, he agrees to obtain the necklace. He puts down a small payment, and he promises the jeweler that the king will pay the rest. La Motte quickly gives the necklace onto her husband. He breaks it up into individual diamonds and smuggles it to London, where he uses it to buy things that aspiring nobles need, things like tiny silver tongs for asparagus. Meanwhile, Rohan is eagerly, eagerly anticipating the moment at Versailles when Marie Antoinette will appear wearing the necklace. Instead, the jewelers show up at court to demand payment. The king and the queen both say, what necklace? Then all hell broke loose. Louis XVI made a colossal mistake. He didn't deal with the situation behind the scenes. Instead, he directed the highest court of the land to try the Cardinal de Rouen, the Comtesse de la Motte, and her dubious accomplices. The Countess was sentenced to be whipped, branded as a thief, and imprisoned for life. But the high court found the Cardinal not guilty, for he was a man of tremendous noble stature. And as for Marie Antoinette, the high court didn't put her on trial, of course, but in the court of public opinion, her name was dragged through the mud and the slime with shysters and prostitutes. Across France, even in the poorest villages, people speculated. Everyone knew that she loved glittery things. Many thought the queen had in fact engaged in shady dealings or an illicit love affair to get that coveted necklace. Pornographers let their imaginations run wild. Why not to pick Marie Antoinette in bed with the Cardinal de Rouen, the Countess de la Motte, and the diamond necklace? And at the same time, the lawyers writing about the affair produced spicy legal briefs about court intrigues and sexual dalliances. All France was gripped up by the tale. She was in fact innocent, but rumors and writings on this affair built dangerously on Marie Antoinette's existing reputation as a political meddler and as a frivolous and extravagant woman. And the king himself emerged looking weak, or at best he looked politically inept. If he couldn't control his wife and his court, how could he possibly run France? And above all, to the ordinary Frenchman or woman, the lustrous world of the high aristocracy at Versailles clearly was riddled with degeneracy, corruption, and lust after wealth and power. The diamond necklace affair offers a small window into the growing climate of criticism in France in the mid-1780s. People were becoming dissatisfied with the wealth and privilege of aristocrats. And perhaps they even began to question the absolute power of the king. In the next lecture, we'll dig deeper into the old regime and into possible causes of the revolution. We'll look at the hierarchical society of France from the privileged aristocrats at the top to the peasants at the bottom.
Lecture 2. Privilege. Old Regime Society. In this lecture, we will explore Old Regime French Society on the eve of the revolution. Let me start with two big questions. From the very beginning, the French Revolution was a social revolution. The revolutionaries wanted to remake society from the ground up in the name of equality. Why does the revolution become so radical in its social goals? And the second question. Strangely enough, this radical revolution does not break out in a poor country, but in one of the most economically dynamic countries of 18th century Europe. This is a great puzzle. Why does the revolution happen in one of the wealthiest countries by 18th century standards? By examining the social structure of old regime France, we can at least begin to answer these two big questions. We can start to understand why the French Revolution happened. There was a complicated tension in old regime society on the eve of the revolution. It was a society caught between two worlds. On the one hand, it was structured by privilege, hierarchy, custom, and tradition. Birth and blood should determine everyone's status. Nobles should rule over commoners because, after all, they have blue blood naturally flowing in their veins. On the other hand, this is a society that's tremendously dynamic. Commercial exchange, openness to new ideas, growing cities, new money, new goods from the colonies. Lots of things were up for sale, including the system of privilege itself. And many people argued that it should be merit, not privilege or birth, that determines status. Now, this tension between the old world and the new world is absolutely crucial for unlocking why the revolution happened. By the 1780s, there's a real mood of uneasiness, discontent, and uncertainty, even among the elites. Even though many people are clinging to the system of privilege for their own sakes, they're also questioning it deeply. To set the mood, I want to tell you about one of the most popular plays of the 1780s. It was a play that questioned the traditional system of hierarchy. The play by Beaumarchais is called The Marriage of Figaro. It undermined and mocked the old aristocratic value system. And like the diamond necklace affair in the last lecture, this play will give us an insight into the mood of critical public opinion in the 1780s. First, let me emphasize that the theater could be a very political space in the 18th century. The theater was a place for playing with ideas or even criticizing the crown. Ordinary people, even illiterate people, could go to plays. It was cheap to get into the pit in the standing room section on the floor of the theater. Now, Beaumarchais wrote The Marriage of Figaro in 1778. The royal censors rejected it. In fact, it seemed so radical that the head censor showed it to the king himself. And Louis XVI famously said, this shall never be played. It would be necessary to destroy the Bastille itself before this play would be without dangerous consequences. This man mocks at everything in the government which should be respected. So the play was censored and banned from public production. It was read in private salons and became secretly popular. Finally, in 1784, the royal censors decided to allow it to be performed in one of the main theaters of Paris. Early. On the day of the play, crowds of four to 5,000 people were already in the courtyard of the theater, lining up for tickets. When the doors opened, the crowd poured in. Some accounts claim that three people were even trampled to death on the way in. And during the performance, the audience was very moved. Apparently, women fainted at crucial moments. The Marriage of Figaro became one of the smash hits of the century. It broke records. It played 73 nights in its first year, it made 350,000 livres within eight months. Incidentally, this play would become the basis of Mozart's opera, his 1786 opera by the same name, but he toned down its controversial nature. Now, why was Beaumarchais' play so controversial and so popular? Why did people rush to see it? Now, if you read it now, it doesn't seem so subversive, but at the time it did. In the play, Figaro, the servant, worries that his lord, the count, is plotting to seduce Figaro's fiancée, Suzanne. The plot plays with an old medieval tradition that noble lords had the right, they had the privilege, to steal away 
new peasant brides on their wedding nights. On this first night, the Lord would replace the poor peasant groom in the wedding bed. Now, this no longer happened, but it still held symbolic power. Figaro plays a feisty servant who's constantly one-upping his master, like so many other theatrical servants before him. But he also voices his anger at the system of privilege. Here's Figaro in his most powerful soliloquy. Because you are a great nobleman, you think you are a great genius. Nobility, fortune, rank, position. How proud they make a man feel. What have you done to deserve such advantages? Whereas I, lost among the obscure crowd, have had to deploy more knowledge, more calculation and skill, merely to survive than has sufficed to rule all the provinces of Spain for a century. Of course, Beaumarchais meant France when he said Spain here. His play hit a nerve. It was profoundly egalitarian. It was anti-hierarchical. In the 1780s, it joined a whole chorus of public questioning, public criticism of immoral aristocrats. How could they deserve so many privileges? Wasn't Figaro right to question inequality and injustice? Let's turn back then to look at the social world of the old regime. How had society traditionally been imagined and organized before 1789? First, and most important, old regime society was hierarchical. Hierarchy structured every relationship, the king over his subjects, lords over their peasants, men over women, masters over slaves in the colonies, clergy over lay people. Why did people at the bottom of this structure put up with it for so long? At the time, everyone believed hierarchy was natural. God had sanctioned it. It was part of the divine order of the universe. And the king had the job of mediating between the different ranks of society. And hierarchy had existed forever. According to medieval ideas, French society was made up of three estates or orders. The first estate, those who pray, the clergy, that is. The second estate, those who fight, the nobles. The third estate, those who work, everybody else, from the lowliest peasant or vagabond to the richest non-noble merchant. Each of the first two estates, the clergy and the nobility, made up about 1% of the population of France. And the third estate accounted for the other 98%. At the heart of this hierarchical system of estates was an essential principle, the crucial principle of old regime France, privilege. Society was not imagined as a group of individuals equal before the law. Instead, society was imagined as different groups, each with different legal status and functions. Privilege literally meant private law. If you had privilege, it meant you had special status before the law. And various groups had all kinds of privileges. For example, only the Glassmakers Guild could make stained glass windows. Only the church had the economic privilege of collecting the tithe. Only merchants in certain overseas trading companies had the privilege of monopolizing various kinds of trade, like trade in sugar or fish or slaves. And some cities had the privilege of paying less taxes than peasants did in the countryside. Privilege was absolutely everywhere. The laws of old regime France structured inequality into the very fabric of society. Now, the first two estates, the clergy and the nobility, had the most privileges of all. By law, they were free from almost all taxes. They didn't pay the hated salt tax. They didn't pay duties on wine or other goods. And all the clergy and most nobles escaped the tax on the land. This was the heaviest tax of all, and it was the peasants who paid more royal taxes than any other group in France. Aristocrats had symbolic privileges also, only nobles could carry swords or wear fancy red high-heeled shoes. Only nobles sat in the front pew of the village church. Even the French word for lord meant privilege and hierarchy. Seigneur meant lord, referring either to the noble lord or to the Lord God. The nobles' economic privileges were most crushing for the peasants. They made up 80% of the population of France. In France, there was a system known as seigneurialism, in which the noble landlords had the right 
to collect various dues, payments, and services from their peasants. Here's what the peasants collectively owed the local bishop, the seigneur of Gabien. A hundred setiers of barley, a setier is about 85 liters, 28 setiers of wheat, 880 bottles of olive oil, 18 chickens, four pounds of beeswax, four partridges, just one rabbit, also a pound of pepper, two ounces of nutmeg, two ounces of cloves. The bishop could eat well-spiced chicken dishes sautéed in his 880 bottles of olive oil. Now listen to what the peasants in the tiny village of Perios in the south of France had to say. The seigneur treats us like slaves. We are very poor because we don't have the same rights and privileges as others do. The seigneur also controlled the local justice system that tried petty crimes and settled conflicts over property. To get a sense of the system, let's watch the noblewoman Jacquette de Gombo de Bonoge as she takes possession of her land, her inherited seigneury, in 1759. In a formal ritual, she visits every village parish within her lands. At each parish, the priest blesses her with holy water. She sits down in a special seigneurial armchair in the church. She rings the church bell three times ritualistically to show that this parish will be part of her lands and that she's in charge of high justice. In each parish, the villagers gather to offer her homage and listen to her pronounce formally, I am taking possession of the parish and the church. Each peasant takes an oath in a ritual of deference. He also signs a notarized document that makes clear what he'll owe her. Chances are strong that the peasant can't really write. Maybe he will sign with the traditional trusty X, or maybe he draws a duck or another mark. He promises so many days of labor per year, so many baskets of wheat or rye, so much cash, maybe so many chickens. Sometimes he has to pay some strange tributes like bird feathers or leather gloves. Now, there were some lands in France that had no lord, and anyone owned that land free and clear. But most peasants lived under seigneurialism. They owed all kinds of dues. Dues to grind their grain in the lord's mill, dues to bake bread in the village ovens, dues to press grapes in the wine press. At every turn, the lord's privileges weighed on the peasantry of old regime France. But rather than keep on listing privileges, like a, a, some kind of outraged revolutionary, I'm going to tell you a fairy tale. This story takes us a little bit further into the mental world of the peasants. Now, chances are you've heard of this tale. It's called Little Red Riding Hood. But I'm about to tell you a different version than the one we know. The one I'm telling is the original version, and it gives us insight into the peasant struggle to survive. One day, Little Red Riding Hood set out to her grandmother's house through the woods to bring some bread and milk. She ran into a wolf who asked, where are you going? To my grandmother's house. And the wolf said, by the path of pins or the path of the needles? So she answered, by the path of the pins. So the wolf took the path of the needles and beat her to the grandmother's house. When he got there, he killed the grandmother, poured her blood into a bottle, and sliced her flesh on a platter. The wolf put on the grandmother's clothes and hopped into bed to wait for Little Red Riding Hood. Little Red Riding Hood came along and knocked on the door. Tuck, 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 which is French for knock, knock, knock. Who's there, said the wolf. It's hard to do a wolf imitating a grandmother. Little Red Riding Hood, <clears throat> come in, says the wolf. So Little Red Riding Hood goes in. The wolf offers her meat and wine. She eats the flesh and drinks the blood of her grandmother. A little cat over in the corner says, slut, to eat the flesh and drink the blood of her grandmother. Then the wolf tells Little Red Riding Hood to undress and get in bed with him. She asks, what shall I do with my apron? The wolf says, throw it on the fire. You won't need it anymore. So she does. She gets in bed. Grandmother, how hairy you are. All the better to keep me warm in winter, my dear. And grandmother, what big shoulders you have. All the better to carry firewood, my dear. And grandmother, what long nails you have. All the better to scratch fleas, my dear. Grandmother, what big teeth you have. All the better to eat you up. <clears throat> and then he ate her up. That's it. The end of the story. There's no woodsman showing up to rescue her. In the modern version, in the one I heard as a little girl, the woodsman comes in, he chops open the wolf, and Little Red Riding Hood and the grandmother jump out, whole, healthy, happy. That version, the version with the happy ending, was written down in the old regime by a writer who wanted to entertain aristocrats with folk tales from the countryside. But that writer cleaned up the peasants' tales. He made them less brutal, less harsh, 
for members of the aristocracy because they didn't live so close to the edge. Now, if you think about the original version that I told you, what stands out is its brutality, the nearness of death, and above all, scarcity. Within the oral culture of the French peasantry, this fairy tale is about coping with a harsh world, a world with dangerous wolves in the forest, a world with not enough food on the table. Parents use this fairy tale to tell their children, you have to be crafty, you have to be wary to live in this brutal world, this world of hunger. And as the original version of the fairy tale suggests, it was a harsh world. The struggle to survive was a day-to-day -day reality. Under seigneurialism, most peasants scraped out an existence by farming on very small plots of land. These tiny acreages could not really sustain them if there was a crop failure or famine one year. Now, famine had long, long plagued the French peasantry. Back in 1709, the winter was so cold that the wine froze in Louis XIV's glass, and almost a million people died in France that year. Over the course of the 18th century, famine became less common, but the threat remained. And in 1789, it would become too real again. Here's what the peasants of Montjoie had to say in 1789. We stagnate, living in misery, crushed beneath the entire weight of the most inhumane and detestable feudal system, victims of the thousand abuses that the seigneur heaps upon us. Now, I've talked about the dues owed to the Lord, but the heaviest burden on the peasants were actually the taxes that they were forced to pay to the crown and they owed a tithe of 5 to 10% of their crops to the church. But there's a question. Remember, I mentioned that the 18th century experienced an economic boom. Why didn't those economic good times help out the peasants more? Well, for one thing, the population was growing fast. More people meant more mouths to feed. The peasants were splitting up their land into smaller plots for the children who were living in higher numbers. For another thing, as France got richer, the wealth was very unevenly distributed to different regions and different social groups. And most of the economic growth didn't take place in the countryside and farming. Rather, it took place in trade and commerce, especially in foreign trade and colonial commerce. So that meant that a small group of well-off peasants who were engaged in commercial farming could benefit from these changes, but most peasants, the average peasant, did not. In fact, peasants owned less land in the 18th century than they had earlier. Wealthier investors, city people, bought up most of the best land to get rising rents and to collect seigneurial dues. And lords became modern. They embraced this entrepreneurial spirit to get as much profit as they could from the land. And more and more owners lived far away from their land, and they gradually lost ties with the peasants. One historian put it this way, in the course of three centuries, the seigneury has evolved from a personally ruled mini-state to an investment portfolio. We can easily see why the peasants resented their lords. Now we need to go from the countryside to the cities and look at another part of society, the dynamic wealth and the privilege among the elites in the cities. Now, cities are growing fast in 18th century France. They're fueled by this dynamic population growth, new wealth coming in large part from the colonial trade. In the cities, you find this new wealth and luxury side by side with gut-wrenching poverty. Here's how one newcomer described Paris. I had imagined a town of superb streets, palaces of marble and gold. I saw only dirty, stinking alleys, ugly black houses, and an air of filth and poverty. Beggars, carters, mending women, the cries of women selling herb tea and old hats. It's true that teeming cities like Paris were overcrowded, smelly, scary, filled with many people living on the edge. In fact, more than half of the city population was too poor to even be listed on the tax rolls. Above them was a class of master artisans, journeymen, and small shopkeepers. A lot of these people would become hardcore revolutionaries, stormers of the Bastille. I won't forget them in this course. But for now, let's focus on the elites and the middle classes. This new system of wealth and the old system of privilege coexisted side by side. Wealth from this big mid-century boom was concentrated, however, in certain areas and groups, like the urban professionals and especially the merchants, the financiers, and businessmen. If we look at stuff, at the world of goods, we have one window into this boom economy and the growing inequality of 18th century French cities. France in this time period underwent a consumer revolution. In Paris and other cities, the middle and upper classes had 
more access to a new world of consumer goods. Lots of these goods came from abroad. Sugar and coffee from France's colonies in the Caribbean. By the way, in the 18th century, Parisians spent even more on coffee than they did on cheese. Okay, what else did they have? Fine calicos and muslins from India, Persian carpets, porcelain from China, chinoiserie, fancy products from China, became a real mania in the 18th century. And France's own industrious artisans also produced fancy domestic goods. Inlaid desks of deluxe hardwoods, specifically produced for antiques roadshow, wigs for every occasion, silk stockings, clocks, gold watches were absolutely necessary for anyone who wanted to look like an aristocrat fans, umbrellas, even some servants bought umbrellas now. Snuff boxes, handkerchiefs. One historian said between 1700 and 1789, Paris learned how to blow its nose. Now, some people were getting rich off this world of stuff. In the 18th century, foreign trade quadrupled and colonial trade grew 10 times. In France, this new hierarchy of money this new wealth of silk merchants, financiers, slave traders, it sat rather uneasily with the old hierarchy of privilege that was based on birth, blood, and land. In this context, what sense did the old model of the three estates make? What sense did the system of privilege make? And yet it hung on. Members of the middle classes who made it rich still wanted to become nobles. They wanted to gain the status, the honor, the privileges that nobility had. For a long time, it had been possible to buy your way into the nobility. A rich man could buy a royal office, a position in the French bureaucracy that gave noble status. One could buy a high judgeship, for example, or the position of the secretary to the king. This so-called royal secretary did not actually do anything for the king, but he had a noble status. Now, paradoxically, this nobility that was defined by blue blood that raced in your veins, it was up for sale. But what happened with these booming economic times, more merchants, businessmen, and lawyers tried to buy offices to become noble. So the prices shot up for the offices. By the end of the century, it cost two, three, four, five times as much to buy a noble office as it had before. And there just weren't enough ennobling offices to go around. Some of the merchant and professional classes also bought land so that they could begin to at least look like nobles. Some of them added a de to their names so that they would sound at least respectable, if not noble. For example, Robespierre's family had done this, but no one was fooled. Now, while the bourgeoisie wanted to become nobles, the nobles wanted to tap into the commercial riches of the bourgeoisie. According to old tradition, Nobles got their honor from owning land and fighting in wars. They could not dirty their hands by engaging in commerce or manufacturing. If they did, they would actually dishonor themselves and literally fall out of the second estate. They'd have to pay taxes like commoners. So how could the nobles get a share? Well, many of them funded business ventures behind the scenes. Better yet, another way to get that wealth was to marry your son to the daughter of a financier or merchant. That way, your noble son kept his title and his honor, but he gained the lady's wealth, and she moved up into the noble ranks, doing her family proud. To give just one example, in 1749, Joseph Mondor, he had noble blood that dated back to a crusading knight, an ancestor in 1166. He saved his family's fortunes by marrying an heiress from the bourgeoisie of Lyon. So France's elites, both noble and wealthy non-noble elites, they had a foot both in the old hierarchy of privilege and the new hierarchy of commerce and exchange. These two systems essentially contradict each other, and the nobles and the non-nobles are invested in both of them. So this new, no new elite mixes old nobles, new nobles, and rich commoners. And the old hierarchy of privilege seemed to lose its validity. The new power of money, exchange, capitalism, called into question the old system of privilege. In addition, the Enlightenment, that great cultural movement of the 18th century and the subject of our next lecture, the Enlightenment unmasked privilege as just one more flawed aspect of the old regime. Elite people who read Enlightenment texts discussed how illogical privilege was. They clapped loudly at our play, The Marriage of Figaro. 
But even though privilege seemed cheapened or even ridiculous, members of the second estate clung to it all the more. Some nobles became liberals and supported the early revolution. But when push came to shove, most of the privileged orders defended the system tooth and nail. One matchmaking aunt pushed her niece toward the best possible marriage with an ancient noble family. Listen to this exchange. The young woman says, oh, aunt, I know their ancestry well. It is a name that echoes like a trumpet. Yes, replied her aunt. After the latest creation, everyone agrees that titles no longer mean anything. Only an ancient name can show nobility, and they are the king's cousins. And here is what the Chevalier d'Arc had to say as he disdained the class of merchants and defended the honor of nobles. Let us favor all those among the third estate and all those who attain distinction through commerce. Let there be rewards for them, even honors, as long as those honors are not the same as those granted to noblemen. Privilege was not so easy to undo. It was everywhere, affecting everything. It affected laws, taxes, guild production, the distribution of wealth in the countryside, the status of nobles, whether they were old or new, the prominence, the prestige of the church. You know, inequality ruled in old regime France. It was embedded in law, in practice, in every way. Everyone knew it, from the poorest peasant or urban beggar to the richest nobleman. As France grew richer, and as the world of exchange created a new society, this hierarchy that used to seem so natural began to lose its grip on the minds of the French. When Figaro grew angry at nobility, fortune, rank, position, his words echoed powerfully. Perhaps the best thing to do would be to uproot privilege, wrench it out of the very fabric of society, and hurl it away. Lecture 3, The Enlightenment. The great cultural movement of 18th century Europe and the Americas was known as the Enlightenment. This lecture will explore the ideas of some of its leading thinkers and will look at the Enlightenment as one of the crucial origins of the French Revolution. The Enlightenment was also known as the Age of Reason. This movement combined scathing criticism with great optimism. Enlightenment thinkers, they're also called philosophes, they tore the mask off the flaws of old regime monarchy, church, and society. But at the same time, they believed vibrantly in the possibility of reform. They thought it was possible to literally remake society according to the most rational and scientific principles. And maybe most potent of all, the Enlightenment was a movement Thousands of French men and women in salons, cafes, libraries, and, and literary societies took part. They read broadsheets and books. They debated Enlightenment questions. How could one tap into reason? How could one discover the natural laws of the universe and the natural rights of men? How could new forms of knowledge bring progress and happiness right here on Earth? For the revolutionaries, this heady combination of criticism and optimism and public discussion held real power. In 1791, two years into the revolution, French leaders, French revolutionaries, took a newly built church called saint Genevieve in the heart of the Latin Quarter. They renamed it the Pantheon. They turned it into a secular monument, a national mausoleum. It would be a burial place to honor the great men of the new nation. And who did they bury there? What handful of men made it into the Pantheon? a couple of revolutionary political leaders, that won't surprise you. But the revolutionaries also went to northern France and they dug up the bones of two Enlightenment thinkers. These men had both died in 1778, 11 years before the revolution began. Voltaire and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau was a wildly popular novelist and a brilliant political theorist. Voltaire was France's most famous Enlightenment philosopher. He was a brilliant, witty man, an anti-clerical crusader. A hundred thousand Parisians lined the streets to watch his sarcophagus brought to the Pantheon during the Revolution. On top of a big chariot, there was a sculpture of the skinny Voltaire resting. His body was draped in purple. His face looked calm and wise. And on the side of the chariot, it read, poet, historian, philosopher. He ennobled the human spirit. 
and taught us we should be free. In the Revolutionary Parade, there were National Guardsmen, cavalry decked out in blue, white, and red, also deputies, artists, young women dressed in white, city officials, members of the Jacobin Club, stormers of the Bastille. Three years later, in 1794, the revolution had grown more radical, and the French now turned to Jean-Jacques Rousseau. They took his remains to the Pantheon in a parade that was just as magnificent. One participant carried on a velvet cushion the social contract. This was Rousseau's book, his visionary treatise on politics that inspired the revolutionaries. Now, why did the revolutionaries claim the Enlightenment? And why did they particularly claim these two men as a source of inspiration? We'll talk about Voltaire and Rousseau in a few minutes. But since the Enlightenment was a movement, and not just the writings of a few men, first I want to talk about the broader context. In France, over the course of the century, literacy rates doubled. By 1789, almost half of men and a third of women in France could read. And they did read. The 18th century, not just in France, but also across Europe and the Americas, the 18th century witnessed an outpouring of the printed word. This was the century of the pamphlet, the century when newspapers truly began to come into their own. The novel had been invented in the 17th century, but in the 18th century, it took off and grew very popular. A talented writer, one who really caught the public spark, could publish and sell enough to earn a living. This was the first era when a man, or more rarely, a woman, could actually earn a living by writing. He wouldn't need the backing of an aristocratic patron. A lot of writers barely scraped out an existence, but some works hit it big. Like Candide, for example. That was Voltaire's most famous novel. It's a satirical tale about a naive young man who travels around the world, and along the way he makes innocent observations that reveal just how absurd religious intolerance and persecution were. His experiences also exposed slavery and human greed. Candide's forceful combination of satire, philosophy, and social commentary, its very humanity turned it into a bestseller. In its very first year, 1759, Candide went through 17 editions and sold 20,000 copies. It was translated into English and Italian, and that was just the beginning. Now, I should point out that it was published clandestinely outside France in 1759 because it had subversive material. Censorship weighed heavily on the authors of Old Regime France. Technically, any book, any pamphlet, every play had to receive the approval of a royal censor. But at least half the books and pamphlets, including practically all the bestsellers of the Enlightenment, half of them were published outside France in places with easier rules, most often in Amsterdam or Switzerland. Then they were smuggled illegally back into France. They could be books on politics, pornography, maybe books that attack the church or the king, attacking the church with a title like Christianity Unmasked. Maybe it would be a libelous attack on Marie Antoinette. Now these smuggled in books circulated with big success. But writers faced the very real likelihood of being in prison for their work and booksellers and printers were thrown into prison at even higher rates than authors. Between 1750 and 1779, almost 1,000 people were imprisoned in the Bastille. 40% of those had to do with the book trade, authors, publishers, booksellers, peddlers, even journeyman printers. Voltaire was thrown into the prison twice during his lifetime, and he off and on lived away from Paris just to stay safe. It's not surprising, then, that he championed the freedom of the press across his lifetime. He allegedly said to one of his rivals, I do not agree with anything you say, but I would defend to death your right to say it. Paradoxically, when the old regime state tried to repress scandalous or subversive works, the repression only fanned the flames. It made them more popular. It made them more desirable because they were illegal. Even the head of royal censorship who sympathized with the Enlightenment, get this, this is what he said. A man who has read only books with the formal approval of the government would be behind his contemporaries by nearly a century. In the 18th century, ordinary people, the reading public, developed strong opinions about what they read. They formed passionate attachments to certain authors. Voltaire and Rousseau, for example, 
had become cult figures long before the revolutionaries brought their remains to the Pantheon. One woman who was swept off her feet by Rousseau's best-selling novel, The New Eloise, she wrote to him, I have your portrait placed above my table, exactly as a believer places above her oratory the image of the saint for whom she has the most fervent devotion. In a nutshell, the 18th century saw the formation of a new public sphere, a newly literate audience, a literary marketplace filled with authors scraping out a living by their pens. And crucially, there were all kinds of public places for debate. The locations for literate men and women to discuss and share the ideas of the Enlightenment multiplied in the 18th century. The most well-known are the salons, these were social meetings in private homes where elegant and intelligent women guided male philosophs in conversation. They discussed the latest manuscripts and the newest Enlightenment ideas. Likewise, in provincial cities across France, intellectual clubs formed. Their members came from the middle classes, the nobles, even the clergy. Some of them, known as provincial academies, had evening conversations and they sponsored essay contests posing enlightenment questions like, how can we improve agricultural productivity? Should Jews have the rights of citizenship? Or what are the origins of inequality among men? And is inequality authorized by the laws of nature? Rousseau would make his name answering that last question. There were other places where enlightenment debate took place. Freemason societies, public lecture halls, scientific clubs, and my personal favorite, the cafe. Now, the first cafes had been opened in London, actually, in the mid-17th century. They spread from there to Paris, Vienna, and Berlin. By the 1720s, there were about 380 cafes in Paris, and the number tripled by 1789. The cafes at first were mostly male spaces. They were spaces of freewheeling conversation where a man could hear the latest news, discuss politics, maybe play chess, read newspapers or pamphlets that were there to be shared. Cafes were associated with modernity and associated with politics, but they were also crawling with what the French called mouche or mouchard, meaning flies. It, that was the nickname for police spies who were everywhere eavesdropping they would turn in any subversive writer. Coffee that had been imported from colonial plantations in the Caribbean or Indonesia fueled the conversation. In the words of one philosophe, Montesquieu, there is one public house where the coffee is prepared in such a way that it imparts wit to those who drink it. At any rate, no one leaves the place without thinking that he is four times wittier than when he went in. In the Enlightenment, people were alive with reading and talking. Some historians have even argued that just the act of all this reading and debating stirred up the capacity for critical thinking and paved the way for revolution. Now let's focus on Enlightenment authors and what they wrote and what they did. In this complicated intellectual ferment of ideas, we need to ask what aspects of Enlightenment thought and action particularly influenced the revolutionaries? What new ideas made revolution popular, possible? We'll highlight three big topics. Voltaire's quest to define natural rights, then the making of a massive project known as the Encyclopedia, and finally, Rousseau's political thought. Rights, progress, politics. All three of these issues matter a huge amount to the French revolutionaries. Let's look first at Voltaire's interest in natural rights. Voltaire was born François-Marie Arouet, born in 1694, the son of a notary. When he was a young writer in his 20s, he rearranged the letters in Ahoué. Why not throw in an L, maybe an I, turn the U into a V, and come up with the pseudonym Voltaire? Over his more than 80 years, he wrote in all kinds of genres, classical tragedy, epic poetry, novels like Candide, history, and above all, social commentary and satire. He became especially well-known for his acerbic pen and his biting sense of humor. Now, in some ways, Voltaire was an unlikely predecessor to the revolution. Politically, he believed in reform from above by enlightened kings. He was a friend and advisor to monarchs, 
especially Frederick the Great of Prussia and Catherine the Great of Russia. He was a monarchist. He was leery of democracy. Voltaire said, I would rather be ruled by a single lion than a thousand rats. He did not even believe that everyone should be taught to read. The revolutionaries didn't laud Voltaire for his political thought or his non-existent egalitarianism. But he had something that really dazzled them. He had the fire. He could dip his pen in acid and just show the inhumanity and injustice of the old regime state. And just as important, he was irreverent to his very core. I always imagine him as a kind of flyweight boxer, light on his feet, taking shots at the Catholic Church. He was feisty and combative. He attacked the wealth of the church, its formidable political power, and also its fanaticism and superstition, as he would say. He famously quipped, if God did not exist, man would have to invent him. Or another one, I have made only one prayer to God, a very short one. O oh Lord, make my enemies ridiculous, and God granted it. Later in his life, Voltaire became known for taking up various causes célèbres. These famous court cases gripped the public imagination. They targeted the flaws of old regime state and society. They focused on one great issue of the Enlightenment and the Revolution, natural rights, human rights. This was a core question for Enlightenment theorists and revolutionaries as well. So let me tell you about the Kala affair, the most famous of all Voltaire's cases. In Toulouse, one evening in October 1761, a young Calvinist, a man by the name of Marc-Antoine Kala, ate supper with his family. He went downstairs and apparently hanged himself by the neck. He commits suicide in his father's shop. When his family found him, first they told the police that he had been murdered by an intruder. But then the family testified unanimously that Marc-Antoine had really committed suicide. Maybe they lied at first because suicide was not just dishonorable as a sin. It was also a crime. By French law, a suicide's body would be put on trial. And if it was found guilty, it would be dragged face down, naked through the streets, hung by the neck in infamy, and denied burial in sacred ground. Within a day... After Marc-Antoine's suicide, the Calas family was arrested. The father, Jean Calas, was accused of murdering his own son. I should point out here that the Calas family was Huguenot. That is, they were Protestant, a religious minority within Catholic France. About 75 years earlier, King Louis XIV had attempted to force all Protestants to either convert or leave the country. He was like other absolutist monarchs. He thought everyone in his kingdom should have the same faith. By the 1760s, the Huguenots still in France lived side by side with Catholics peacefully, but their legal status was kind of tenuous. They couldn't practice certain professions. They had to worship in secret in many places, and hostility could rise up against them at any time. To the law, Huguenots still represented revolt, danger, disorder. After Marc-Antoine's death, rumors began to circulate that his father had killed him to prevent him from converting to Catholicism. And according to one powerful rumor, Protestants conducted ritual murders. A secret conspiracy killed any member of their sect who was going to convert. These rumors affected the mood of the trial and the testimony of the witnesses, and they affected the opinions of the judges. During the trial, Jean Calas, like Many other people who were accused of murder in 18th century France, Jean Calas was subject to torture. He was stretched on a rack, and gallons of water and another torture were poured down his throat. He never confessed, but he was convicted, guilty, of murdering his oldest son. In the public execution in Toulouse, his body was tied to a huge wheel and smashed by iron bars. He was broken on the wheel. His property was confiscated by the state. Now, this could have remained just a minor provincial trial of an obscure merchant. But Voltaire found out about it, and it captured his imagination. He was sure that the Calas family had been ruined because of their religion. For Voltaire, this was religious intolerance and fanaticism at its worst. And also, to Voltaire, Calas' barbarous treatment exemplified the arbitrary despotism 
of old regime justice. Voltaire wrote, was he guilty or innocent on one side or another? This is the most horrible fanaticism in the most enlightened century. My tragedies are not so tragic. Voltaire became a virtual detective on the case after the fact. He became convinced that Kala was innocent. So he began to organize a crusade to have the verdict overturned. And here we see a crucial characteristic of the Enlightenment. It was a movement, a discussion. Voltaire sought out support for his case at court. He won over Madame de Pompadour, the mistress of the king, Louis XV. And Voltaire wrote to his fellow philosophs, shout everywhere, I beg you, for Kala and against fanaticism, for it is superstition that has caused their misery. He orchestrated a veritable campaign of public sympathy. He wrote a posthumous defense. He used the heart-wrenching story of the Kala family to attack the inhumanity of the justice system and the evils of religious intolerance. In his Treatise on Toleration of 1763, he appealed for religious freedom and human rights based on natural law. He said about the Huguenots, they ask only the protection of natural law, the validity of their marriages, the right to inherit from their fathers, and the enfranchisement of their persons. They ask not for public chapels or the right to municipal offices and dignities. Human law must in every case be based on natural law. For Enlightenment thinkers, natural law referred to the moral code, the natural truths written into the universe, perhaps by God. Finally, in 1765, the verdict was overturned, and the court in Toulouse returned the family's property and restored their good name. But it was too late to restore Jean Calas' life. Voltaire took on other court cases involving justice and human rights. Little wonder, then, that the revolutionaries saw his powerful use of the pen and his language of rights as a forerunner and inspiration for their own project. In 1791, in the parade that brought Voltaire's remains to the Pantheon, there was a troupe of actors that played members of the family of Jean Calas. The revolutionaries admired his quest for natural rights, religious freedom, and a better justice system. And they also drew inspiration from the Enlightenment's tremendous optimism, its confidence in the collective power of knowledge, education, and the use of reason to improve life here on Earth. One book embodied the project of the Enlightenment more than any other. It was called the Encyclopedia. This was a massive project. The Encyclopedia would run to 28 volumes, 17 volumes of text and 11 volumes of illustrations. It took over 20 years to complete from 1751 into the 1770s. The encyclopedia had ambitious goals. If you look up the word encyclopedia in the e-volume, you will learn that this book aimed to, quote, collect all the knowledge scattered over the face of the earth to transmit this to those who will come after us so that our children, by becoming more educated, may at the same time become more virtuous and happier. But this attempt to systematize knowledge on behalf of human progress was also illegal. When Denis Diderot, the main editor of the encyclopedia, when he began this project, he had already been thrown in prison for his earlier writings. The police who haunted the Paris cafes had a thick file on him. One of them read, a clever boy, but extremely dangerous. He plays the wit and prides himself on his impiety. Diderot's great illegal project, the encyclopedia, was published secretly in Switzerland. Then it was smuggled into France and all across Europe. The encyclopedia was a collective work. There were more than 100 contributors who wrote close to 72,000 entries. Diderot himself wrote more than 6,000 articles, from Asparagus in Volume 1 to Voluptuousness in Volume 17. Another author wrote over 17,000 entries. Clearly, he was drinking a lot of coffee. In fact, if you look up coffee in the encyclopedia, you will learn that coffee has tremendous medicinal benefit for those who are overweight or who suffer migraines. The article also tells you to use this drink with caution. It advises drink a lot of water first and add milk. The authors of the encyclopedia wanted to systematize knowledge. 
but their project was also political. It didn't just convey knowledge. It criticized the old regime state, the church, and the social institutions in all kinds of ways. For example, if you look up the slave trade, you will find a moral indictment of selling Africans. This practice, quote, violates all religion, morals, natural law, and human rights. The encyclopedia also used a clever system of cross-referencing to make satirical, political, or anti-clerical points. Under the entry for Eucharist, the communion in the Catholic mass, under Eucharist, it reads only see cannibalism. Debunking religion entered into the way that the encyclopedia systematized their project. The book included a tree of knowledge with three main branches. One branch was history, based on memory. A second one was philosophy, based on reason. And a third one was poetry, based on imagination. Now notice how secular this system of knowledge was. In this tree of knowledge, theology had lost its pride of place. It was subordinated to philosophy and therefore subordinated to reason. Theology was just a tiny twig on the tree of knowledge. The encyclopedia aimed at compiling and preserving knowledge, systematizing it, and at the same time, it made political criticisms and satires of the old regime. This project had another goal that would appeal to the revolutionaries. It also popularized knowledge. It revealed all kinds of expertise that had traditionally been secret. Diderot especially liked the idea that the secret know-how of artisans should be laid out for everyone to see. So he included in the encyclopedia these images, these carefully drawn detailed technical images with instructions on things like how to make a button, how to run a printing press, how to dig a mine. In the spirit of the Enlightenment, Diderot and the encyclopedists believed that knowledge should be useful, that learning and discoveries should be utilitarian, they should add to the progress of the human race. The revolutionaries did not put Diderot in the pantheon, but they should have, because they shared his irreverence for the past, they shared his optimism that new knowledge could bring about progress and improve society. Now the revolutionaries did put Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the pantheon, if we look at his thinking, it will help us explore one last arena of the Enlightenment thinking, politics. Rousseau was born in 1712 in Geneva in Switzerland. He dazzled the Enlightenment public with his novels, and he was also a commentator on education and politics. In 1749, the Provincial Academy, the Intellectual Club of Dijon, proposed an essay co contest to answer this question. Have the arts and sciences improved the morals of civilization? When Rousseau was walking along and thinking about this question, he went into a trance of inspiration. Later he wrote, suddenly I felt my mind dazzled by a thousand flashes of enlightenment. Swarms of vivid ideas presented themselves to me. Overcome by a giddiness resembling intoxication, a violent palpitation oppressed me. I sank down under a tree. Now, Rousseau may have sounded like he was hallucinating on some 18th century drug, or at least that he had drunk too much coffee. But in fact, he was inspired to write a response to the essay question that contradicted the Enlightenment's optimism and its confidence in the benefits of civilization. Rousseau answered no to the question. He argued that the arts and sciences had in fact made men morally weaker. They'd grown soft, effeminate, corrupt. He shocked the judges with his novel ideas and he won the essay contest. In later essays, he claimed that when men moved from the state of nature into the state of society, they learned to pretend to be what they were not. That way, inequality crept into society, and men lost their natural goodness as well as their liberty. Rousseau also attempted then to imagine a political system that would allow men to build a better kind of society. He wrote a treatise a difficult treatise called The Social Contract. It began with a striking sentence. Man is born free, yet he is everywhere in chains. Rousseau's work posed one central question. How can we create a society in which people are equal, moral, and free? And at the same time, a society which is unified and acts for the good of everyone. The Social Contract left many parts of this Difficult question unanswered, but it stressed three points. First, ideal society would be focused on a pact, a social contract between men at the very beginning of society. 
Participants in this society did not give away their liberty and sovereignty to a single ruler or even a group of representatives. They only gave it to one another, to the collective group. So Rousseau suggests that sovereignty, that's the right to govern, that sovereignty rested in the people who had agreed to the contract. And his second point, society should be governed by something which he called the general will, a kind of collective moral force that would govern society for the general good. The general will would be expressed through the laws. Although Rousseau did not say exactly how one could discover the general will, he stressed a third thing. This political system would work only if citizens were truly moral. True virtue would enable them to put into practice the general will for everyone. Women should especially cultivate men's moral characteristics. As I'll look at in a later lecture, the revolutionaries were swept up by Rousseau's project of creating free and equal and virtuous citizens. Like Rousseau, they wanted sovereignty to rest in the people as a whole. The people should somehow discover the general will for the good of everyone. This was an exciting project, but one that was hard to enact. The Enlightenment may not have directly caused the revolution, but it certainly paved the way. It showed off the flaws of the old regime, church, state, and society. It introduced powerful concepts like natural rights and the spreading of knowledge and the concept of the general will. And the Enlightenment displayed the power of the printed word and of critical discussion. But the revolution would not have occurred without one other crucial cause. France's expensive participation in the global competition for empire. That will be the subject of our next lecture. Lecture four, France, global commerce and colonization. In the 18th century, France's commercial and colonial reach spread from Asia to the New World. In this lecture, we will follow French ships to India, Africa, and the Americas, and we'll explore France's participation in a global circuit of trade and colonization. The 18th century marks the origins of today's globalized world economy. In the 1700s, it's possible for the first time to speak of proto-globalization or early modern globalization. The volume of international trade reached unprecedented levels and economic production and consumption in remote corners of the earth became interconnected as never before. Now empire building and global trade were tied to the French Revolution in many different ways. Let me highlight three. On the eve of the revolution, the huge wealth created by colonial trade disrupted France's traditional assumptions about privilege and hierarchy. And a second point, even though France got richer from commerce, the French state got deeper in debt from fighting wars to defend its colonial possessions. These two factors, the state debt and the upsetting of the social system of privilege were both crucial origins of the revolution. And a third point, France's most profitable colonial wealth was rooted in the slave plantation system in the Caribbean islands. During the revolution, abolitionists lobbied to end the slave trade. But it was a massive slave revolt on Saint-Domingue, France's richest sugar island, that pushed the revolution toward one of its most radical acts, the abolition of slavery. So both the causes and the course of the French Revolution are intertwined with the story of France's empire and its position as a global commercial power. At first, in Europe's race for goods and territory, France lagged behind. The Spanish and the Portuguese had grown rich and powerful in the 16th century by milking South America for gold and silver. And in the 1600s, the Dutch established lucrative colonial outposts from Suriname to Sumatra. They became the dominant 17th century shipping power. Their dazzling success showed everyone that moving goods around could be even more lucrative than extracting gold and silver. So European colonization changed. The quest for precious metals gradually gave way to a race to create global trade and an attempt to develop colonies that produced raw materials and could also serve as markets for goods. By the late 17th century, the French finance minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, wanted to strengthen France's colonies and expand French commerce, both to the east and the west. 
he was nicknamed the crawfish for his grasping spirit. Colbert dismissed the Dutch. He called them, quote, a nation of herring mongers and cheese vendors. But he latched on to their clever business invention, the joint stock trading company. In these companies, merchants pooled their capital to spread the risky cost of overseas trade. And very important, they also got a royal monopoly over the goods that were exchanged in one area, like the East Indies or the West Indies or the slaving coast of Africa. Merchant ships from each nation, at least in theory, they could trade only with their own nation's colonies, French colonies only with French trading companies, Dutch colonies with Dutch merchants, and so on. This system, called mercantilism, created great riches. It also created a flourishing system of smuggling and illegal trade and militant competition between the great seagoing powers of Europe. So now, let's tour French trade and colonization in the Indian Ocean, Africa, the Caribbean, and North America. First, the East. In Asia, the European traders competed for access to pepper and spices, tea, coffee, tropical hardwoods, textiles, and porcelain. In competition with the Dutch and the Portuguese, the French staked a claim to two little colonies off the coast of East Africa near Madagascar. They were called the Ile de Bourbon and the Ile de France. These tiny islands produced coffee, and they also had ports for vessels that were crossing the Indian Ocean toward India, the Arabian Peninsula, or even China. Now, the French had their eyes on a bigger prize, India, with its spices, pepper, tea, and above all, cloth. The French didn't want to introduce settler colonies there. As one commissioner put it, they wanted, quote, only some outposts, only plenty of merchandise, and some increase in dividends. In India, the French and the British became rivals. They both sought to take advantage of the disintegration of the Mughal Empire. The British would win out over the French in the long term. But even after they lost to the British in the Seven Years' War, the French still hung on to a few outposts along the east coast of India. At these fortified settlements, Pondicherry, Mahe, Chandernagar, Indian brokers would mediate between French buyers on the one hand and Indian merchants, producers, and handloom weavers on the other. The brokers helped the French get local merchandise in exchange for silver that they brought all the way from Spanish America. By the middle of the 18th century, India produced about a quarter of the world's textile supply, and the cloth trade had long outstripped spice and pepper trade in volume and in sales. They exported raw silk, but especially cotton, everything from cheap light cotton to the most magnificent hand-painted fabrics, brightly colored calicos, fine muslins, striped guinea cloth, floral chintz, maybe for making fancy curtains. Europe was swept up in a calico craze. Europeans rushed to buy these stunning fabrics. And in France, textile producers began to imitate the Indian designs. Their imitations were called Andien. And even now, to this very day, you can see the Indian influence in some well-known French textile patterns. For example, in tablecloths from Provence. Louis XV's mistress, Madame de Pompadour, she chose Indian floral motifs for her dresses. And then she had her upholstery redone in patterns made out of Andien. Even ordinary people, working people, got rid of their everyday heavy wool clothing and began to wear colorful, lightweight cotton outfits. Indian cloth flooded the market so successfully that it threatened France's own production of silk, wool, and linen. To protect these industries, the French monarchy made it illegal to import, produce, or even buy calico from India between 1686 and 1759. But the demand didn't disappear, and smugglers happily brought as much as they could lay hands on. The royal ban on Indian cloth did allow it to be brought to France and then re-exported. Textile traders found an especially ready market for their Indian cloth on the west coast of Africa. There, they exchanged it for human beings. And in the Caribbean, it was cheap Indian cloth that clothed the slaves. Before we leave the East, let me highlight one other product that was crucial for the slave trade, cowrie shells from the Maldive Islands off the Indian coast. Maldive women dove to find these little shellfish. Then they buried them in the sand until the mollusks died. 
the empty shells became shiny and beautiful. They were valued in West Africa as currency or decoration. So Indian merchants bought them from the Maldives for rice and traded them to Europeans for silver. The European ships filled their holds with this valuable ballast. 160,000 cowrie shells could buy a slave in the 1770s. The cowries lead us toward two key points. By the 18th century, European trade had truly become global. Spanish-American silver bought cloth and cowries from the East. These goods were then traded for African slaves who were shipped to the Americas. There they produced sugar, cotton, coffee, tobacco, and indigo that was brought back to Europe. And a second point, at the very heart of this global dance was the institution of slavery. The most lucrative colonial trade came from the plantations of the West Indies. The British, the Spanish, the Dutch, and the Danes all stake their claims there. And in the Caribbean, this is where the French outdid their European rivals. They had small colonies like Martinique and Guadeloupe, and they held the real Caribbean prize, Saint-Domingue. It's now known as Haiti, and it's on the large island of Hispaniola. At the time, it was known as the Pearl of the Antilles. Saint-Domingue alone produced almost half of France's foreign trade. This colony, the size of Maryland, sent to Europe 40% of its sugar, half its indigo dye, and 60% of its coffee. The indigenous people of Hispaniola had died out two centuries earlier, largely because of diseases that had been carried by the Spanish. By 1789, Saint-Domingue had about 550,000 inhabitants. 90% of them were slaves of African descent. There were also about 30,000 whites, mostly of French origin, and 28,000 free people of color. These free people of color were mostly of mixed ancestry, part African, part European. Some had bought their freedom, others had been freed by slave owners. Still others were descended from mixed race families who had lived on the island since the 17th century. Most free people of color were poor laborers or artisans, but some of them actually owned slaves themselves. However, even the richest free people of color had inferior legal status. The revolution would open up the question of their rights and question also the whole system of slavery. Producing sugar was terribly hard work. Sugarcane took nine to 15 months to grow, and once the sugarcane had been cut, it had to be ground by sugar mills within less than 24 hours. The cane juice had to be boiled down, filtered, evaporated, and crystallized. That meant that after cutting cane all day, slaves sometimes had to work a four-hour night shift to keep the mills moving. Overseers drove the slaves relentlessly, and Caribbean sugar plantations became sites of ruthless efficiency. Malnutrition, overwork, brutal treatment, and disease killed more than half of slaves within three to eight years of their arrival. One white colonist complained in 1782, they are always dying. But the harsh truth is, the plantations literally consumed the slaves. As the non Chamber of Commerce put it, without slavery, there would be no French colonial commerce to speak of. Each year, over the course of the 18th century, the number of Africans who were shipped to the New World increased. By the 1780s, slaving ships brought about 30,000 people a year to Saint-Domingue. The slave trade formed one leg of a larger pattern of Atlantic commerce that was called the triangular trade. In this triangular trade, slave outfitters went down from Europe carrying cloth, guns, calories, rum, and other goods. They went to the African coast, the West African coast, about between Senegal and Angola today. There, there was a string of European forts. These outposts were both military and commercial. They served as, as warehouses for the trading companies to hold goods and also to hold slaves who were brought to the coast by African entrepreneurs. In the Americas, the traders then exchanged their captives for all kinds of New World goods, like sugar, coffee, or hides. Then, for the third leg of the triangular trade, they headed back to Europe and started again. Between the 16th and 19th centuries, somewhere around 12 and a half million Africans were forced onto ships bound for the New World. In the 18th century alone, slave ships brought about six and a half million Africans to the Americas. Brazil and the Caribbean consumed the most slaves. 
Now, these numbers are staggering, but they don't really tell us the whole story. They don't do justice to the story. To get a better sense of the trade, slave trade, let's look at the voyage of one ship. It's called the Diligent. And a historian by the name of Robert Harms has carefully and skillfully reconstructed its story. In the archives, he discovered the journal of Robert Durand, who was the first lieutenant on the Diligent ship. In 1731-32, he traveled with the Diligent down the coast of Africa, across the Atlantic to Martinique, and back to France. Fifteen months of voyage, classic triangular trade. The Diligent was 69 feet long and 21 feet wide. It had four cannons that could fire six-pound balls. Dock workers first filled the ship with things to exchange for Africans. Hundreds of bales of Indian cloth, white linen from Hamburg. Next, the owner also bought 7,050 pounds of cowrie shells, 99 bars of Swedish iron, 16 cases of Dutch smoking pipes, and 900 kegs of brandy from the Loire Valley. He also put on board about 200 Dutch flintlock muskets, 40 barrels of gunpowder, and a barrel of flints for the muskets. Guns and ammunition, these were good trade items, but the sailors also needed them. Who knew whether they might have to put down a slave revolt or ward off a challenge from the pirate ships that were known to cruise up and down the Guinea coast. At the mouth of the Volta River, Captain Pierre Marie made his first attempt to buy slaves, but he failed. A Dutch slave ship showed up and the price of slaves shot up too high. Now European demand for slaves caused warfare inland among the different African states. When the diligence sailed down the African coast near present day Benin, for example, King Agaja, the ruler of Dahomey, had recently conquered two neighboring coastal kingdoms. His soldiers used European flintlock muskets, imported cannons, steel swords, and cutlasses that they got from the slave ships. King Agaja's wars helped provide the diligent with slaves, including Yoruba prisoners of war. Durand had the task of overseeing the physical inspection of the slaves. He had them all stripped naked so that the, that the ship's doctor could look carefully for any signs of disease. He studied their bodies and made them stretch out, run, and show their strength. Then the slavers calculated the value of the African men and women. Durand paid eight kegs of brandy for an adult man, four or five kegs for a woman. Durand's next act was to make sure that each slave was branded with the mark of the diligent on his or her right shoulder. Durand's journal says nothing about how he felt about this calculation of human value or how he felt about these humiliating inspections or branding the slaves. But one English slaving captain, John Newton, wrote that participation in the slave trade, quote, gradually brings about a numbness upon the heart and renders most of those who are engaged in it too indifferent to the sufferings of their fellow creatures. Meanwhile, the diligence carpenters rebuilt the inside of the ship where there used to be cloth and brandy and cowrie shells, now the carpenters built tightly spaced platforms to put 256 African captives. The carpenters built two five-foot shelves to serve as toilets off the sides of the ship. When the diligence set sail, the sailors kept the slave below deck and they watched them closely. Shipboard revolts were most common in sight of land. In fact, just a little while after they left, Captain tried to convince his fellow slaves that they should revolt. But they hesitated. They were bound in leg irons in the hold. He grew so wild with anger and fear that he bit himself, and he bit the man chained next to him. The crew heard shouts from below. The sailors then subdued him. They took the rebel up deck, and they beat him. With the Africans looking on, the ship's captain had him strung up with a rope around his chest, hanging off the yard arm. Then they shot him many times and dumped his body into the Atlantic. Robert Durand wrote in his journal, this would teach a lesson to all the others. During the course of the passage, the sailors on the diligent forced the slaves to dance on deck in shackles so that their muscles wouldn't atrophy. The crew included a professional accordion player just for this purpose. Before they got to land, the captive's treatment got better so that they would be ready for sale. They were given more food. They were given palm oil to rub on their skin. The diligent made it to Martinique in only 66 days. They had lost four crew members and nine slaves to disease. But more slaves died because of the bloody flux when Durand stored them in a warehouse. He was hoping, unsuccessfully, he was hoping for a higher price. For the return to France, the carpenters cleaned and rebuilt the interior hold of the diligent. 
Captain Marie now bought 251 barrels of sugar, 23 bales of cotton, and 13 barrels of roku. Roku was a plant that helped get white cloth ready to be dyed with other colors. The diligent then sailed back to Nantes in France. It had finished its run, but chances are strong that the goods didn't stop there. 75% of sugar and 80% of coffee no sooner touched French shores than it was re-exported. Often it was sent north toward the Baltic, where it could be traded for iron or timber or grain from the plains of Poland and the Ukraine. Now, the triangular trade could take other routes. It could run between Europe, North America, and the Caribbean, for example. In North America, until 1763, the French laid claim to New France. New France sprawled southwest from eastern Canada down the St. Lawrence River Valley through the Great Lakes region and down the Mississippi Valley down to New Orleans. New Orleans had been named after Louis XIV's nephew back in 1718. In one version of the triangular trade, New France provided the French Caribbean islands with supplies like timber, dried fish, salted beef, and flour. The Caribbean would then ship sugar to France, and then France sent manufactured goods back to the New World. Now, any map of New France makes French control look far stronger than it really was. This was Native American territory. New France might be described, one historian put it this way, as a loose chain of isolated establishments separated from one another by wide expanses of water and wilderness. Even by 1763, when France lost Canada to the British, the French never had more than about 65,000 inhabitants there. Their survival really depended on creating alliances and trade networks with the Amerindian peoples who lived in the same area. The French crown tried to encourage emigration to New France starting in the 17th century, but they didn't have much success. Few French immigrants went there in comparison, say, to the English-speaking North American colonies, which surpassed a population of 1.5 million by the middle of the century. For French peasants or potential migrants, Canada didn't have much appeal. Its winters were legendary. The writer and soldier, Baron de Lahontan, claimed that to make it through a Canadian winter, a man needed a body of brass, eyes of glass, and blood made of brandy. Most French immigrants farmed the land, but the most valuable commodities came from the fisheries off Newfoundland and from furs that were gotten inland in exchange with the Algonquin and Iroquois peoples. In his novel, Candide, Voltaire famously dismissed Canada as a few acres of snow. But this territory produced 80% of the hides and fur exported from North America. And the slaves on the Caribbean islands ate its salted beef, dried cod, and grain, uh, all coming from North America. So France's economy was fueled by this whole worldwide system of trade, and it took off in the 1730s and 1740s. Over the century, starting in 1700, foreign trade grew four times. Trade within Europe was still a crucial source of wealth for France, but colonial trade multiplied 10 to 15 times over. France's colonies and global trade then provided great riches to France in the 18th century. This point is absolutely crucial for understanding social changes in France on the eve of the revolution. But a second point is important as well. It cost the French state way too much to defend its colonies and participate in this whole global economic system. Great Britain, France's rival, profited even more from the colonial trade. And it was intent on expanding its empire at the expense of France. France and England, over the last two centuries, since the fall of Napoleon, have mostly been allies. But between 1689 and 1815, they engaged in seven major wars. They were fighting over dominance of Europe's commercial and colonial networks. In the 18th century, warfare became distinctly global. Starting in 1756, in the Seven Years' War, this war is also called the French and Indian War. In the Seven Years' War, France and Britain fought each other in India, in the Caribbean, on the west coast of Africa, on the plains of Canada, and also in the Atlantic Ocean. This war involved all the major continental powers. The French, allied with Austria and Russia, were also fighting against Prussia and the German state of Hanover on the continent. The French simply could not afford to fight on this kind of scale and neither could they win. So in 1763, when Britain won, France gave away, gave to Britain all the territory east of the Mississippi, except for two small islands off Newfoundland. 
and west of the Mississippi, they had to surrender to the Spanish the territory of Louisiana and New Orleans. New France was gone. It was deeply humiliating for France to be stripped of this colony. The French also had 1.5 billion livres of debt from the war, and they were left with resentment toward England. That anger would encourage the French only 15 years later to join the American colonists in the Revolutionary War against England. Competition over empire was expensive for the French state, and it also provoked questioning from the Enlightenment. Enlightenment authors tried to make sense of France's new commercial expansion, but they also criticized it. For example, in the 1770s and 1780s, the Abbe Reynal wrote a best-selling book, 10 volumes actually, an exploration of the impact of European colonization and commerce on the history of the world. He called his book, A Philosophical and Political History of European Colonies and Commerce in the East and West Indies. The book went through 20 editions and maybe 50 pirate editions. It was condemned by the monarchy, but it was the book of the late Enlightenment. Reynal and his anonymous co-authors engaged their readers by telling them tales of exotic lands, but they also asked big questions. They worried that colonization had increased the despotism of kings. Reynal used the example of the Spanish Empire to condemn human cruelty and the tyrannical power of kings. He wrote, I am writing history, and I do so with my eyes almost always full of tears. He asked penetrating questions. Was it possible for the French state to grow rich and engage in commerce and even colonization without practicing human cruelty? And how should France adapt its political system to encourage trade but not increase despotism? These questions led to a second powerful issue. What about slavery? Reynal condemned the cold calculus of the slave trade. He called for an end to slavery. Like virtually all European abolitionists at this time, he believed that European civilization was superior. So he proposed that emancipation of the slaves should be gradual. They shouldn't get instantaneous freedom. Freed Africans must learn from the Europeans, he believed. While we are restoring these unhappy liber beings to liberty, we must be careful to subject them to our laws and manners. That's what he wrote. Many authors asked the same questions as Reynal. Commerce had become modern and global, but how could the French monarchy and French society adapt to this new commercial dynamic? And what principles should govern France's colonial and commercial expansion? By the eve of the revolution, France had a small abolitionist movement. In 1788, they imitated the British and founded a club, the Society of the Friends of Blacks. It lobbied for the abolition of slavery and the end of the slave trade. No one knew that in both France and Saint-Domingue, revolution would break out. But most of the founders of this society became revolutionaries, and they were ready to raise the issue of rights and slavery when they got the chance. If one steps back from the world of France's lucrative participation in the growing economy on the eve of the revolution, the growing global economy, just before the revolution, several points stand out. France's involvement in this race for empire, their participation in global trade definitely contributed to French wealth. But there were huge costs and human suffering above all in the system of slavery. And during the revolution, slaves in Saint-Domingue would rebel. It would be the largest slave revolt in history and it would bring about the abolition of slavery. The global system also contributed to causes of the revolution back in France. By 1789, this new wealth had contributed to destabilizing France's old system of privilege. And because nobles were not supposed to get their hands dirty with commerce, non-nobles benefited the most from this wealth. And at the same time, even though it generated wealth, global trade weakened the French state. In the last decades of the old regime, Military competition over empire cost the French state too much money. This competition exposed the weaknesses of the French state, and it also made France angry with Britain. As the next lecture will show, because France wanted to get back at Great Britain, Louis XVI would ally with the American colonists against England. The expense of participating for France, the expense of participating in the American Revolution would be the last straw. It tipped the crown into bankruptcy, 
and created a constitutional crisis in France. It opened the door to revolution. Lecture 5, American Revolution and the Economic Crisis. In 1787, the French king went broke. France couldn't get a loan to save its life. And the king's ministers couldn't convince the French to change their unfair and inefficient tax system right in the middle of the economic downturn. By 1788, Louis XVI couldn't run the state. He faced a dire political and financial crisis. He didn't know what to do, so he opened the door to discuss sharing power with French elites. No one could have predicted the revolution that happened. In this lecture, we'll look first at France's participation in the American Revolution. This decision had strong economic and political consequences for France. And then we'll look at the financial and political crisis that broke the absolutist monarchy. Now, as a young monarch in the 1770s, Louis XVI had two main geopolitical goals. First, he wanted to preserve diplomatic stability in Europe without getting too drawn into the plottings and strategies of Austria. France was reluctantly allied with Austria. And second, Louis wanted to get back at Great Britain. Remember that Britain had humiliated France in the Seven Years' War. Britain had taken away France's North American colonies. The opportunity for revenge against the British came from a surprising place, the rebellious American colonies. At first, the American revolutionaries didn't have too much luck convincing France to support their cause. They only managed to get the French to send some contraband aid of gunpowder, arms, and provisions to the rebel colonies. Louis XVI and his foreign minister, Vergen, weren't sure they should do more. But later on, Vergen said, the embarrassment of the British crown in America was simply an opportunity so golden that it could not possibly be squandered. But in 1776, the Americans had not really proven their military prowess, and France knew just how expensive it was to fight Britain. Enter Ben Franklin. Over the next 13 months, he engaged in a dance of diplomacy with Vergen and the other French ministers. But even more important, he won over the hearts of the Parisians. Franklin was 70 years old. Paris already knew him as an Enlightenment philosophe. They knew him as the experimental scientist who could draw lightning right down out of the heavens. They nicknamed him the Electrical Ambassador. He was popular in Paris because he seemed to represent the simplicity, the morality of the New World, mixed together with the power of enlightenment reason and science. Franklin knew that the French saw America as the land of authenticity and natural innocence and freedom. So even though he was a learned man, he carefully cultivated his image as a simple farmer, a man who was close to nature. The French thought of him as a Quaker. No aristocratic wigs for Franklin. He wore a fur hat with his straggly hair hanging out. You know, about the, from earlier images of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Franklin had kind of a stocky build, and he wore this loose-fitting brown farmer jacket. He really stood out among the silk and lace at court. He seemed more authentic than this frou-frou, rococo world at court. He seemed as if he embodied natural equality. His very person questioned the nature of privilege. One chronicler at court wrote, Everything in him announced the simplicity and innocence of primitive morals. People gathered around as he passed and asked, who is this old farmer who has such a noble air? At the height of his popularity, Franklin's face appeared everywhere on snuff boxes, clocks, dishes and vases, handkerchiefs, inkwells. He was mobbed every time he went out his front door. The king was apparently irritated by Franklin's fame. There was one princess at court who was especially enamored of Franklin, so Louis XVI gave her a chamber pot with his face on the bottom, Franklin's face on the bottom. Franklin also moved in the Enlightenment world of salons, academies, and Masonic lodges. According to one story, when he and Voltaire were both attending the French Academy of Sciences, the other members urged them to greet one another. There was an awkward moment, and then the two men embraced à la Française, kissing each other on both cheeks, and the crowd burst into cheers. Now, many historians argue 
that Franklin's public persona was more important than his diplomatic skills at court. He influenced the climate of public opinion. He made it more possible politically for the French government to choose to side with the Americans. But it would take more than popularity and more than diplomacy for Franklin to convince the French king to enter the war on America's side. What convinced the French to ally with the Americans against the British? Late in 1777, the Americans soundly defeated the British at Saratoga. Franklin heard the news from an excited visitor from America. I have great news. General Burgoyne and his whole army are prisoners of war. The French then got the confidence that the Americans might really be able to break away from England. By then, the French also had more confidence in their own navy that they had been rebuilding since the Seven Years' War. The foreign minister, Vergen, thought they should join the American rebels and bring down the British imperial rival of France. Maybe France could even snatch away some of England's prized colonies in the West Indies. In 1778, France promised to offer military aid to the American revolutionaries. And in return, the Americans offered the French most favored nation status in trade with the 13 colonies. Over the next few years, the French aid helped the Americans defeat the British. Already, some French volunteers, like the Marquis de Lafayette, had set sail to offer their services to George Washington. And the formal French alliance gave something to the Americans that they sorely needed, sea power. The French proved to be good at distracting the British. The French Navy fainted at invading Britain. And when the French Navy threatened the British West Indies and the Caribbean, the British felt compelled to take troops away from North America and send them down to the West Indies. The French didn't send many army troops to America, but they did play a key role in the American victory over Cornwallis and the British at Yorktown in 1781. And the French aid in supplies and munitions was crucial. The French, for example, sent about nine-tenths of the gunpowder used against the English. But to return to France, what impact did the American Revolution have back on France? The American Revolution's biggest immediate impact on France was financial. War is expensive. Participation in the American Revolution cost France between 1 and 1.3 billion livres, or French pounds. All through the Revolution, Jacques Necker, the French finance minister, did all kinds of expert maneuvers to borrow more and more money. He made himself popular with the French people. He financed the war with loans. He didn't raise taxes. He even made himself more popular by publishing a fake budget. He declared that France was comfortably in the black. One fellow minister said about the budget, it's about as true as it is modest. The French were already deep in debt from earlier wars, especially the Seven Years' War. Participating in the American Revolution literally pushed the French over the edge. It precipitated French royal bankruptcy within just a few years. It's harder to measure the ideological or political influence of the American Revolution on French minds. The French were already aficionados of the Enlightenment, and without a doubt, they were intrigued by the American example. French newspapers kept reporting on the war. Books on America appeared hot off the presses. Some Enlightenment authors, like the Abbé de Renal from the last lecture, they praised the American Revolution. Not all books favored the Americans, but the debate still heated up. Here's one of my favorite titles, The Discovery of America, For and Against. You decide. Across France, some people gleefully celebrated the American cause. In Marseille, for example, 13 citizens formed a club which promised to hold 13 banquets each year in honor of the 13 breakaway colonies. And in 1784, just after the peace, the Literary Academy of Toulouse sponsored an essay contest on the significance of the American Revolution. One French priest and Freemason wrote that the new United States, quote, is the festival of equality. These people are still in the happy time when distinctions of birth and rank are ignored. Think about what his words suggest. When the French looked at the American case, they thought about themselves. They thought about France about France's system of privilege and inequality, about the tyranny, the tyranny and despotism, to use their words, the tyranny and despotism of kings. 
French and other Europeans thought America was unique. It was a distant place, far across the sea, a new land that wasn't weighed down by centuries of privilege and a towering prince of kings on their very own soil. But even if America was fundamentally other and unique, it did show Enlightenment ideas in action, and the French were paying attention. Let me stop and sum up. Without a doubt, French participation in the American Revolution paved the way for the French case. The French had already been primed by the Enlightenment. Now the American Revolution encouraged them even more to question their own society and politics. But it was the French debt from aiding the Americans that mattered the most. By pushing the French crown closer and closer to the brink of bankruptcy, it contributed to provoking a political crisis and a political opening. There's a great irony here. Since the days of Louis XIV in the late 17th century, France had been the model of absolutist monarchy across Europe. And now the French king had helped a fledgling republic launch itself in the name of liberty. And in the process, this absolutist monarchy, enemy of republicanism, helped to bring about its own downfall. It helped to bring about its replacement with a republic on French soil. The Comte de Ségur, a French aristocrat who served in the American Revolution, he later commented, we stepped out gaily on a carpet of flowers, little imagining the abyss underneath. But we've got to get to the abyss. As we pursue the short-term causes of the revolution, let's turn now to examine the economic situation in France. In the aftermath of the American Revolution, France had two main economic problems, debt and economic downturn. France faced a crushing state debt and a severe crisis in the economy at large in the late 1780s. First, the debt. No exact figure exists for the royal debt. One thing was clear, though. Every year, France's debt grew. In the peacetime year of 1786, for example, it grew by 112 million livres. Each year, France had to expend half its revenue just paying the interest on existing loans. And because France looked more and more like a bad credit risk, the cost of borrowing also got higher. When the French king borrowed money, he paid 6% interest or more than 6% for long-term loans. Rival states like Great Britain and the Netherlands, they could get loans much more cheaply at lower rates, like around 3%. In 1783, France had a new finance minister. He was a witty and optimistic red-haired man by the name of Calon. He knew he had two choices. He could either try to increase taxes or he could try to borrow more. Taxation in France on the eve of the revolution had three core characteristics. One, it was unevenly distributed across the population. Also, it was collected very inefficiently. And it was virtually impossible to reform because various privileged groups hung on to their right. They defended their right to various exemptions. Not surprisingly, Calon, first he tried to borrow more. In fact, he cultivated public spending and conspicuous consumption at court so the French crown would look like it was in good shape. This was the equivalent strategy of, say, wearing a nice suit or a fine dress if you go to the bank to get a loan. If you look rich, the logic goes, people will lend you more money. Calon, he liked luxury himself. He wore silk coats with lace sleeves made by one of the finest clothiers in Paris. He loved to eat fine delicacies like truffles from Perigord, young partridges, fresh crayfish, and that unexpected specialty, macaroni and cheese, from Naples. According to rumors, he once sent his mistress a box of candies, each one wrapped in a 300 livre note. At court, this policy of conspicuous consumption fit right into the aristocratic culture of Versailles. Nobles liked the new tone after Necker's austerity during the American War. But let me give you one example. Hedgehog hairdos were in fashion in this era. They were meant to balance out low-cut necklines and those basket hoop skirts. A noblewoman would wear a mountain of hair above her head, maybe teased two or, feet, two or more feet high. Her hair might be decorated with elaborate props, like a basket of fruit, a zoo, or a flotilla of ships. And here's my personal favorite of all the hedgehog hairdos. On her head, one female courtier had a scene with a duck pond, with a windmill which turned, a miller riding off to market, and back in the mill, a monk is seducing his wife. This hairdo combines anti-clerical bite, with the height of fashion. 
On a more serious note, Kaolan spent extensively on various projects. He poured money into urban building and development. He subsidized private industries. He pumped up the Royal Navy and constructed a new shipyard at the port city of Cherbourg in Brittany. Now, Kaolan's policy of conspicuous consumption was a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it worked, at least for a little while, in the short term, it helped him to borrow 653 million livres in three and a half years. On the other hand, Calon's policies were expensive, and some state expenditures severely undercut the creditworthiness of the French state. He accidentally set off a speculative frenzy and, lots, and lost a lot of government money when he reestablished the French East Indies Company, for example. And above all, in the minds of many French people, Calon's spending became tied to resentment of the high-flown lifestyle at court. Calon's strategy stirred up anti-aristocratic and anti-court feelings. And who represented luxury more than anyone else? Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette did have spendthrift tendencies. Already, back in the 1770s, her own mother, the savvy Maria Theresa, the Empress of Austria, she wrote to her daughter and warned her to watch out. She said to Marie Antoinette to steer clear of lavish spending on fancy jewels and towering hairdos, quote, with so many feathers and ribbons. A queen can only degrade herself by this sort of heedless extravagance in difficult times. But by 1787, Marie Antoinette had been given the nickname Madame Deficit, and rumors circulated that she had ordered the workmen at Versailles to pave an entire room with diamonds. What's crucial to understand here in the late 1780s is the conjuncture, the coming together of different strands, economic and cultural. The state's debt crisis dovetailed with escalating public criticism of privilege, luxury, and high living among the nobility. And what's more, this whole problem of the French debt was made worse by troubles in the economy as a whole. So here's the next big key point. France experienced an economic downturn in the mid and late 1780s. Earlier in the course, we discussed that the French economy had already been, had actually been expanding in the 18th century, especially in the commercial realm and especially in colonial trade. Some of these sectors, like the trade in slaves, sugar, and silver, they remained strong right up to the revolution. But there were two huge sectors of the economy that faced crisis in the late 1780s agriculture, and industry, including especially textile production. What happened to French industry, to the production of cloth in the cities and countryside? In 1786, the French ministers, Vergen and Calonne, decided to make a commercial treaty with England that would lead to more open trade policy between the French and the British. In general, this was the time period in European history when economic thinkers were beginning to de develop liberal economic theories favoring free trade, known as laissez-faire. These theories challenged the older protectionist system that was called mercantilism. Just 10 years earlier, Adam Smith had published The Wealth of Nations. This Scottish economist and philosopher argued against tariffs, against duties and price controls that nations used to manage their economies in the mercantilist system. According to Smith, wealth would grow, it would increase, if markets were allowed to respond more freely to demand. Lots of French Enlightenment thinkers also praised freer trade. And both France and Britain were experimenting with putting these economic theories into practice. So France decided to open up trade with Britain. But the timing of this free trade treaty, the Eden Treaty, was terrible for France. It so happened that England was just beginning to benefit from the early Industrial Revolution. That meant that Britain was able to produce cloth much more cheaply than France could. British goods, including products coming from British India, just flooded the French market. French industries went into shock. Merchant houses closed down. Unemployment shot up, especially in northern France. In the zone stretching across the north from Champagne to Normandy, half to two-thirds of industrial workers were unemployed. If textile workers were hit the hardest, other arenas like glass and earthenware production also spiraled downward into crisis. Jean-Marie Rallon, future revolutionary, summed up the situation this way. We have just concluded a commercial treaty with the English, which may well enrich our grandchildren. 
but has deprived 500,000 workers of bread and ruined 10,000 commercial houses. To make matters worse, this industrial crisis occurred at the exact same moment as a series of bad harvests across France. In 1785, flood and drought decimated crops in different parts of France. In 1786, the harvest was dismal. 1787 was slightly better, but 1788 would be deadly. These poor harvests trapped the French peasants who lived close to the edge. It also made it hard for the weavers and dyers who had just lost their jobs. Bread prices in cities skyrocketed. Across the north, grain riots broke out, scattershot. This crisis in industry and agriculture had serious implications. Without a doubt, economic despair among the people made them angry and fueled criticism of the court. But it was not just a question of the mood of the people. Elites got more and more reluctant to lend money to the state at this tight economic moment. They didn't want to invest in the shaky crown. Just when the king most needed to borrow money at home and abroad, he couldn't. And the fluctuations and downturn of the economy also narrowed down other options for the king and his ministers. Crucially, it made it virtually impossible for the king to reform taxes. But Louis and Calonne had no choice because France was flat out broke. The economic downturn and the debt both made trouble for the king. Now, Calonne couldn't get any more loans, so he decided to try to stir up elite support for a program of financial reform. He hoped to enlist the backing of the privileged classes of France, so he called an assembly of notables to meet in February 1787. An assembly of notables could act as a kind of advisory board to the crown. No such assembly had been called since 1626, but Calonne was hoping to give some national legitimacy to his reforms by discussing them with this advisory group. The 144 notables were high-ranking people, magistrates, bishops, cabinet members, and other noble men. Only two were commoners. Calonne proposed a set of reforms. At the heart of his program was a single land tax. It would fall on all land alike, no matter who owned it. Even the clergy would owe land tax in his plan. So would nobles. This kind of universal land tax operated very well in Great Britain. And Calonne also called for a stamp tax on various commercial transactions. Tax land, tax commerce. His proposals alienated two powerful and wealthy groups. Big landowners such as nobles and church leaders hated his land tax, and successful merchants hated the stamp tax. Calonne had dared to challenge privilege. Even though he had handpicked the members of the Assembly of Notables, they rejected his ideas out of hand. They were stunned by the size of the deficit. Many of them had believed Necker when he put out a positive report on the budget in 1781. No way could the deficit have grown this much. The Notables were even more surprised by his proposals about tax reform. One Notable commented, Monsieur de Calonne wishes France to bleed to death. He is merely asking us whether to make the incision on the feet or the jugular vein. Now this is France, the land of cooking. Satirical images circulated of Calonne as a monkey disguised as a chef wearing a chef's hat. He has a butcher knife and he's facing a gaggle of geese representing the notables and the geese are about to be cooked. In the caption, Calonne says, my dear creatures, I have assembled you all here to deliberate on the sauce in which you will be served. Calonne had 100% backing of the king but lots of members of the royal family actually organized against the king at court, including his cousin, the Duc d'Orléans, his brother, the Comte de Provence, and especially his wife, Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette and her faction sent out circulars opposing her own husband's reforms. This led to the usual jokes about the king's inability to content his wife or control his wife. A pamphlet appeared soon afterwards called The Rights of the People. It threatened ominously, France may choose another master. The pamphlet said Louis was too weak, and Marie Antoinette was squandering the nation's fortunes. And another pamphlet commented that France would be in much better shape if only the king could choose his ministers of state with the same expertise and care that the queen chose her ministers of fashion. Marie Antoinette was not the only court figure who was reviled. Some nobles attacked Calonne as a court favorite rather than a real true nobleman. 
And Calonne was soon fired out on his ear. He was even hounded out of France. The elite groups in France were dead set against paying more taxes. They didn't want to surrender their privileges. And now that everyone knew just how bad the debt was, Louis' chances of getting a loan, even a short-term loan, had completely disappeared. Many elites began to demand that King Louis XVI do something that no king had done since 1614, call an estates general to ask the people of France for their opinion of what to do. Back in medieval times, the estates general had met as a representative body. It had deputies from each of the three estates or orders of France. If it had continued to meet, maybe it could have become a French version of the British Parliament. But over the 17th century, as French kings got more powerful and more absolutist, they stopped calling this body that could impose their own rule. In 1787, when the Assembly of Notables and many nobles pressured Louis XVI and his ministers to call the Estates General, they saw an opening, they saw the opportunity to assert aristocratic power. Maybe they could become like the peers and gentry of England and share power with the king. Louis XVI could claim to be absolutist. And by long tradition, by the divine right of kings, his power came straight from God. But Louis could no longer run the state. His situation was desperate due to the combination of expensive wars, inefficient taxes, crushing royal debt, and the refusal of the elites to cooperate with taxes. In 1788, he agreed, okay, I'll summon the Estates General the next spring. Although knew, no one knew it at the time, with that act, he opened the door to revolution. The next lecture will look at the growing political crisis and then turn to the revolution when the Estates General first met in 1789. In the short term, the king's bankruptcy, the plummeting economy, the widespread resistance to tax reform brought about that political crisis. But the origins of the revolution, as I've tried to show over the last few lectures, in fact, they lay much deeper. Its origins lay in the expensive system of warfare and international competition over trade and empire. Its origins also lay in the Enlightenment, with its new public sphere of lively debate and the bold ideas of the philosophes. And finally, the roots of revolution also lay in the whole social system of privilege. That system of hierarchy had once seemed completely natural, but Enlightenment ideas and the uneven distribution of new wealth had called into question the very premises of old regime society and state. And now France stood on the edge of cataclysmic change. Lecture 6. The Political Awakening of 1789. At the end of the last lecture, we left France on the edge of disaster. The king was bankrupt and desperate, his flabby back up against the wall. Louis XVI saw only one way out. In 1788, he agreed to call the Estates General this assembly of elected deputies would offer him the opinions of the people of France. Maybe this move would enable him to solve this impossible economic crisis. It had been 175 years since the last time any king had agreed to call on the States General. And a lot had changed in those 175 years. The Enlightenment had introduced all kinds of discussion, debate about the nature of political power and rights. And the Enlightenment and the growing wealth of France together had led to a questioning about the traditional system of social hierarchy and privilege. So when Louis XVI agreed to call the Estates General, he opened the door to sharing power. He stirred up a huge political discussion. Who would have political power? How could France reform its abuses in finances, in politics, and in society? These questions were on everyone's minds early in 1789 as France got ready for the first meeting of the Estates General. That spring, all across France, people gathered to elect deputies to attend this assembly and to represent the three estates, the first estate, the clergy, the second estate, the nobility, and the third estate, everyone else. According to old traditions, people in each estate would meet in village assemblies and guild halls, monasteries, and noble meeting houses. 
and they would draw up grievance lists for the deputies to take with them to Versailles. In effect, by calling the Estates General, the king was saying to the people of France, tell me what's wrong with this country. What an opportunity for Frenchmen who weren't happy, and what a Pandora's box for the king. One historian said about the calling of the Estates General that it was, quote, the most ambitious exercise in political consultation in French history so far, indeed in world history so far. So in the winter and spring of 1789, France was abuzz with political discussion. In Paris, the liveliest place of political debate was the Palais Royal. This was an arcade. It was an outdoor shopping mall and meeting place that belonged to the cousin of the king, Philippe, the Duc d'Orléans. D'Orléans would soon become very wrapped up in revolutionary politics. In the next few years, he actually abandoned his title as Duke and renamed himself Philippe Égalité, Philip Equality. Eventually, as a left-wing deputy, he even voted for the death of his cousin, the king. But for now, in 1788-89, he acted as a kind of political impresario of public opinion. In his Palais Royal, right in the heart of Paris, a person could find cafes, gaming houses, brothels, high-class shops, also a wax museum. There was also an outdoor exhibit area, sometimes even a circus. But above all, the Palais Royal had print shops and publishing houses. They produced a flood of pamphlets, newspapers, and broadsheets on politics. In 1789, Parisians rushed to the Palais Royal to read or to hear the latest news, the latest political gossip, the word on the street. The Enlightenment, as a movement, had already shown the power of the printed word. Remember that by 1789, almost half of men and almost a third of women could read. In Paris, the literacy rates were much higher, of course. And by 1788, royal censorship had collapsed. In the last six months of 1788, more than 1,500 pamphlets on politics appeared. And almost 2,700 new pamphlets flooded the market in just four months between January and April of 1789. That winter, the king's closest noble relatives, they were called the princes of the blood, they sent him a letter warning him about the dangers of all this public debate. Quote, who can say where this recklessness will stop? Sire, the state is in peril. Your person is respected, but a revolution is being prepared in the principles of government. Every author sets himself up as a legislator. So what was in all these political pamphlets? No one was calling for a republic, not yet. But the princes of blood were right when they warned the king that the issues of royal power, privilege, and inequality were in the hot seat. There was one obscure priest named Abbe Siez who wrote a pamphlet that especially captured France's imagination. In January of 1789, he published What is the Third Estate? Everything, answered Siez. The Third Estate is, quote, everything, but in everything that is shackled and oppressed. The third estate is like a strong and robust man with one arm still in chains. Siez brilliantly defended the commoners of France as the core of the French nation, as the most active, the most useful part of society. For Siez, it was not hierarchy, but commerce and exchange that formed the most fundamental bonds of society. He agreed with these words from the municipal officers of Nantes. The third estate cultivates the fields, sustains and directs manufactures, nourishes and vivifies the kingdom. It is time that a great people count for something. Siez built on the Enlightenment emphasis on utility and useful citizens. He dismissed nobles as useless. They were consumers who didn't really produce anything. They were foreigners, that's his word, foreigners to the body politic, idle foreigners who could not speak for France. As Siez built his powerful argument, he focused attention on the concept of the nation as sovereign. Sovereignty wasn't located in the body of the king, but in the many bodies of individual French citizens. In this new nation, individuals, according to Siez, should be represented by deputies and governed by a legitimate rule of law. His argument boldly challenged the king. Just two years earlier, when he was speaking about tax reform, the king had announced, it is legal because I will it. 
But when Siez laid out his attack on privilege and his daring model of sovereignty that rested in the nation, he crystallized political opinion. He also spoke directly to a specific political question that was being debated. How would representative politics and voting work in the Estates General? This was a hot political question. The king had agreed that the third estate could elect twice as many deputies as each of the other two estates. But what about voting in the assembly? Many leaders of the third estate, including Siez, claimed loudly that each single deputy should have his own vote, one man, one vote. But according to tradition that had last been followed in 1614, every estate would meet separately and decide on its collective opinion. Then the three estates would join together, and each entire estate would have one vote out of three total votes. In this voting scenario, that meant that the first two privileged estates, the clergy and the nobility, could always outvote the commoners. The third estate had more deputies, but the privileged orders would automatically have a two-thirds majority. This older system of voting by estate, by order, grew out of the traditional way of imagining society. Society was imagined as a hierarchy of groups, of corporate bodies held together by the king. But now Siez and other Enlightenment thinkers had begun to imagine society as being based on individuals, built out of individuals, not corporate bodies. Not everyone agreed with Siez. But his ideas about individual political voice and national sovereignty became foundational principles of the French Revolution. Meanwhile, all across France, people were talking politics as they got ready for the Estates General. In the Third Estate, in the weeks leading up to the Estates General, any man over the age of 25 who paid taxes could take part in drawing up the grievance lists. He could also vote for electors as long as he wasn't an actor, a servant, or a bankrupt man. In the countryside, villagers met in parish assemblies. In cities, artisans met in their guild halls to choose electors. In turn, the electors met and chose the deputies. In the first two estates, nobles, priests, and bishops voted directly for their deputies. Monasteries and even convents also each had a vote. Interestingly, although women, by and large, had little chance to vote in the spring of 1789, Convents were seen as corporate bodies of the first estate. That meant that nuns could take part in this electoral agitation, and they also drew up grievance lists that spring. There were about 60,000 grievance lists drawn up. They were called cahiers de doléances. What did they have to say? All three estates agreed that the days of the absolutist monarchy were over. Everyone praised the king, but they expected a new form of constitutional monarchy. Everyone also agreed that the Estates General should keep on meeting regularly. The nobles and the clergymen said they would even be willing to pay a little bit more in taxes. But in exchange, they wanted political voice in a representative body, something like the Estates General. Now, the nobles in the Second Estate, they didn't all agree about one crucial question. Should they surrender some of their share of privilege? Some of the more liberal nobles were willing to give up some privilege, but they faced opposition. One liberal nobleman even found himself challenged to a duel by an angry, more conservative colleague. And most nobles saw the meeting of the Estates General as an opening. This was an opportunity. Maybe they could get back some of their old aristocratic political power that they had gradually lost to absolutist monarchs over the last 150, 200 years. Most of them didn't want to reform the seigneurial system. That gave them dues. It gave them power over their peasants. For example, one of them, the Baron de Lupé, he ranted about the world gone topsy-turvy. Quote, the mingling of the classes has always led to the fall of empires. And what about grievance lists from the Third Estate? Well, they had a very different point of view. Remember that the commoners wrote their grievance lists during the spring of 1789 it was right after the disastrous harvest of 1788, and famine was looming on the horizon. The grievance lists poured out their attacks on three issues most of all, the heavy seigneurial dues, the tithe collected by the church, and the unfair system of royal taxes. 
And for their part, the middle classes demanded equal access to careers according to a person's talent rather than their birth. Peasant grievant lists berated the Lord's monopoly on hunting and fishing. They demanded full access to common lands. They complained about the seigneurial justice courts. They raged against the doves and rabbits of the Lord's. These doves and rabbits decimated peasant crops. And the collectors of the salt tax drew anger. One list called them those bloodsuckers of the nation who quaff the tears of the poor from their goblets of gold. Peasants and city dwellers called for all kinds of reforms, anything that crossed their minds. Train more midwives, build primary schools for boys and girls, mandate a common system of weights and measures, invent a more fair and unified justice system, tear down the custom toll gates around Paris, and the list went on and on. Now, the members of the Third Estate also didn't all agree. Some merchants wanted to free up commerce. On the other hand, the guilds often wanted the opposite thing. They insisted on monopolies that would protect their trades. For example, in, a, in one cahier that was written by female artisans, the flower sellers of Paris begged to reestablish their guild and its traditional monopoly. Quote, Today, when everyone can sell flowers and make bouquets, our modest profits no longer give us the means to survive. The grievance lists discussed all kinds of things, but they had three main points in common. They opposed noble privilege, they attacked the wealth of the church, and they called for a more egalitarian tax system. Privilege was definitely on the rack. But the monarchy was not. These grievance lists, these cahiers, address the king with deference and respect, like a benevolent father. But they expected him to be ready to reform France from the top to the bottom. France was ready for change. What happened when the Estates General finally met? Out at Versailles, workers, architects, and pageant masters had taken an old warehouse that was full of opera props they turned it into a glorious hall for the meeting of the Estates General. This giant hall was fitted out in grandeur to emphasize the king's power. The walls were covered with white silk, and there were paintings there of 13 centuries worth of French kings. Great kings like Clovis and Charlemagne and Louis XIV. Those kings could look down on the proceedings of the Estates General. They could remind the French of the glories of the monarchy. On the 5th of May, 1789, opening day of the Estates General, Louis XVI took his place on a throne under a glorious gold canopy. Behind him, there was a purple velvet backdrop that was studded with golden fleur-de-lis, the lily symbol of the monarchy. Near him sat Queen Marie Antoinette, the high-ranking princes and princesses of the blood, and also the most honored dukes and peers. There were 2,000 spectators crammed into the balconies, and thousands more people waited outside, hoping to get in or just be close to this world historical event. On the main floor, the clergy sat to the right of the king, and the nobles sat on his left. Much farther back sat the third estate, the commoner deputies. They were farther from the king, and they were separated off by a railing. The hierarchy and privilege of the old regime in all its splendor was on full display. The bishops of the first estate wore elegant robes. The parish priests were dressed more somberly in their dark cassocks. The nobles wore brightly colored satin suits and plumed hats. And the commoner deputies, the last ones to enter the hall, they had been told to dress only in black. That was the dignified color of lawyers and professional men. And in fact, most deputies of the third estate were lawyers, officials, or men of property. And they were already annoyed at the pageantry of privilege. Some of them defiantly ignored this dress code, and they dressed themselves up in bright colors. It was just a little sign of rebellious moments to come. On that first day of the Estates General, the Marquise de la Tour du Pin happened to be in the meeting hall. She was with other ladies of the court. She wrote this about Louis XVI. The good prince was not dignified in his appearance. He stood badly and walked with a waddle. And this is what she had to say about the queen. 
It was plain from the way she used her fan that she was very agitated. On that very first day, Necker gave a speech. He had been reappointed as the Minister of Finances. So everyone's expectations ran high. But his speech was, was tedious. It was packed with technical details about the royal budget. In fact, he got so tired reading his own long speech on the budget that he had to give it to an assistant to finish reading it for him. In the end, this speech lasted for more than three hours. And the Marquise de la Tour du Pin wrote down in her diary that she had only the knees of the women behind her to support her back. She wrote, the speech seemed never ending. I don't think I have ever been so weary in my life. She was not the only one who was disappointed. Everyone realized that Louis XVI and his minister, Jacques Necker, had no clear plan to solve the financial problems of France. They had no clear program for guiding any kind of political reform. Yes, you know, the king was good at spectacular pageantry. But what about practical ideas? The absolutist monarchy had begun to seem like a hollow shell. And the very next day, the deputies immediately deadlocked over the very first procedure. The king said that each estate, each order, should meet separately and verify its membership, estate by estate. The first two estates, the nobles and the clergy, they were happy to comply. This procedure would set a precedent of voting by estate. That would secure the dominance of the two privileged orders. But the third estate refused. They insisted that the entire assembly should verify its membership collectively with all the states together. That procedure would mean voting by head, with every deputy having one vote. This sounds like a procedural technicality that's not important, but actually a great deal was at stake. Who represented the nation? Who expressed the desires and the will of the people of France? And how could they voice that will in the Estates General? For several weeks, not much happened. One noble deputy wrote home to his wife, our estates general does nothing. We spend the whole day in useless chatter and shouting. Louis XVI had withdrawn from the scene. His oldest son and his heir, the seven-year-old Louis-Joseph Xavier Francois, had tuberculosis. He was dying, and in fact, he passed away in June. Days passed, and the deadlock deepened. The leaders of the first two estates grew more and more unwilling to compromise. In their letters home, deputies from the third estate, from the provinces, first recorded how impressed they were, even awed, to stand in the presence of the highest nobles of the land. The deference of centuries did not die in a day. But these old feelings of awe and deference mixed in complicated ways with envy and bitterness. One deputy from the third recorded that he was amazed to hear one nobleman claim that aristocrats quote, were in fact members of a different race with a different blood. That commoner suddenly found himself blurting out, I am every bit as noble as you are. Hereditary nobility is a political monstrosity. No one there had experience with representative national politics. It was just the beginning of a long political apprenticeship. The first two estates held their meetings behind closed doors, but the third estate opened their balconies to spectators. And political news traveled fast to Paris. There was no single politician who dominated, but some groups, some leaders emerged. Certainly the Abbé Sies, and there was a delegation from Brittany that had lots of radicals. They set up a club and invited members to join in their strategy sessions. And one of their followers was a serious man from the north named Maximilien de Robespierre. He was not yet a leader, but that's a name to remember. There was one flamboyant figure who rose to prominence, Honoré Gabriel Riquetti, le Comte de Mirabeau. You can tell from his name, Mirabeau came from noble background. He had actually been elected to represent the third estate from the town of Aix in the south of France. Physically, Mirabeau was a mountain of a man. He was tall and broad-chested. He had a wild mane of hair. He had a big, wide face that was studded with scars from smallpox. And he spoke with a booming voice. And Mirabeau knew how to use his daunting looks and his commanding height. He said, it is hard to know the full power of my ugliness, but no one dares to interrupt me. When he was a young man, Mirabeau had distinguished himself above all by his scandalous adventures and by his profligate spending. 
He had endless fights with his father. And in fact, you know, his own father had thrown him into jail several times. He used royal letters of imprisonment to lock up his own son. After Mirabeau seduced the wife of a high-ranking judge, and he actually ran off with this woman, he faced incarceration for three whole years. Mirabeau started to write Enlightenment treatises. He denounced paternal despotism and the arbitrary injustice of the prison system. As a candidate in X, he famously growled, if I am a mad dog, despotism and privilege will die of my bite. And in May 1789, he joked that he had no pride in his noble title and would gladly give it away to anyone who'd take it. In June, men like Mirabeau and Siez and the delegates from Brittany nudged their fellow deputies towards a plan. First, they convinced some parish priests who were the poorest deputies in the first estate, they convinced them to abandon their assembly and come join the third estate. Then on June 17th, after several days of intense debate, the commoners voted to declare that their assembly represented the nation of France. The king's failure to lead made the third estate bolder. They were looking for a name for their new assembly. Siez proposed the known and verifiable representatives. Mirabeau said, how about the representatives of the French people? But people thought that was too radical. They dismissed it. Or here's another attempt, my favorite one. The legitimate assembly of the representatives of the larger part of the French nation acting in the absence of the smaller part. Accurate, but unwieldy. Finally, exhaustion set in, and one little-known deputy from central France had a simple idea, the National Assembly. Done. When he heard the news, Louis XVI dismissed these actions, this proclamation of a National Assembly to represent all of France. Louis said, it's just a phrase. But it was much, much more than a phrase. In fact, it was a revolutionary act, an act which laid the foundation for France's upcoming experiment in representative democracy. The new National Assembly claimed to represent the nation, to speak for the nation. They claimed sovereignty, the political right to govern. In a radical move, they took sovereignty from the king and they transferred it to the National Assembly. To cement this claim and give it weight, they took up Mirabeau's suggestion. They agreed that they would take on the burden of the national debt and the collection of taxes. The deputies would then be responsible for reforming the nation and solving its crisis. The commoners had thrown down the gauntlet with their bold move. What would happen next? Three days later, on June 20th, the commoner deputies of the National Assembly went to their usual meeting hall, but they found that they were locked out. They were afraid that a royal coup was taking place against their new assembly. So they went to meet at a nearby indoor tennis court. I love it that one of the foundational political acts of France, this nation of not very athletic people, takes place in a tennis court. They were swept up in fervor, and the assembly banded together and took an oath to God and nation, never to disband until they had written a new constitution for France. The neoclassical painter and revolutionary Jacques-Louis David made a famous sketch of the scene of the tennis court oath for a future painting. His sketch captured the emotional power of the moment. Men from different walks of life turn to embrace one another, and others are taking the oath with their arms uplifted. It's a wave of fraternity, optimism, bravado, and the deputies vow to build a new France. In that same session, the deputies proclaimed, Vive le roi, long live the king, long live the king and the nation. No one had yet asked the delicate question, what's the relationship of this new national assembly with the centuries-old absolutist monarchy? The deputies imagined that their constitution would somehow allow them to conduct politics with the crown. But no one knew exactly how, least of all the king. Several days later, on June 23rd, Louis gathered all the deputies together in a session. He refused to recognize the National Assembly or to consider any changes to privilege, tithes, or seigneurial dues. But he recognized that there was a financial crisis and a political crisis. So he agreed that he would set up some kind of system for listening to the highest noble elites. But meanwhile, he also began massing royal troops around Versailles. 
The commoner deputies were stunned. One member of the National Assembly grumbled, he wants, about the, about the king, he wants, quote, to draw up the Constitution by himself. In their state of shock, the commoners nonetheless fought back. They refused to leave the hall. When the master of ceremonies asked them to clear out, Mirabeau leapt to his feet and bellowed, We are here by the will of the people. We will not leave except at the point of bayonets. Over the next few days, more and more clergymen and then 47 liberal nobles left the meeting of their own separate estates. They went over to join the National Assembly. The liberal nobles were led by the king's cousin, Philippe, the Duc d'Orléans. Finally, on June 27, the king gave in. He told the rest of the clergy and nobles to go join the Third Estate in the new National Assembly. And that night, Paris was ablaze with fireworks. The people in the streets celebrated that day's victory at the National Assembly. But under the surface, doubts were lurking. It seemed like Louis had surrendered, but nobody knew for sure. He had also called 30,000 troops to assemble out at Versailles. And every day of late June and early July, that summer of 1789, the cost of bread rose higher and higher. In other parts of France, like Lyon, France's second biggest city, bread riots had already broken out. At all the custom gates of Paris, troops had to accompany the convoys of grain and flour to protect them as they entered the hungry city of Paris. What would the king do next? Would he smash the National Assembly? And what would the people of Paris do next? In the next lecture, we will turn to the crucial event that transformed this revolution from promise to reality, the storming of the Bastille. Lecture 7, July 14th, Storming the Bastille. In the heart of a poor neighborhood at the eastern edge of Paris, there was a massive fortress prison, the Bastille. It had eight huge towers and thick walls 80 feet high. On the 14th of July, 1789, Hundreds of ordinary Parisians, mostly men, but a few women as well, they poured over the drawbridge of the Bastille looking for gunpowder, and they changed the course of French history. On that day, they made the French Revolution a reality. I promise that we will soon storm the Bastille, but first, let me tell you what happened on July 15th, the very day after the assault on the Bastille. Paris was still barricading against a possible attack by the royal army. And a man named Palois, a contractor, brought 800 men to the Bastille. They began to demolish it, to take it apart stone by stone, even though they didn't have any permission to do that yet. Over the next few months, they took apart the stones and chains. They fashioned them into what they called relics of freedom, all kinds of relics. They carved up the stones into tiny physical pieces of the new revolution. They made miniature stone-carved models of the Bastille. And out of the iron chains, they made ink pots, snuff boxes, paperweights, keychains. But now these were symbols of liberty rather than the chains of tyranny. Individuals bought them, but Palois also distributed them across France to towns and cities. Soon, every sizable town and lots of little villages had a stone slab from the original Bastille. Maybe they embedded it in the altar of their church. And so powerful was the Bastille as a symbol of liberty that General Lafayette, that French nobleman who had just fought in the American Revolution, he sent a key from the Bastille to George Washington. You can still go see it at Mount Vernon today. So the Bastille itself was the true site of the outbreak of revolution. It became an icon of liberty, popular heroism, and popular sovereignty. In France today, Bastille Day, July 14th, is the national holiday. How and why did the Bastille take on this symbolism and this significance? What happened in Paris that day that seemed to lay the foundations of the revolution, the foundations of liberty and the new politics? First, let's look at the Bastille itself. It had been built as a fortress back in the 14th century 
and had been transformed into a prison. By 1789, it had come to stand for the arbitrary and unjust actions of the king. It stood for injustice. The injustice not just of the criminal system, but of the monarchy itself. It stood for despotism and tyranny. Many people had been imprisoned there. And writers who had been thrown into the Bastille, they helped to create legends and myths about this fortress of atrocity. One commentator wrote, if I could choose between the death penalty and six months in the Bastille, I would say without hesitation, take me to the place of execution. According to accounts, you entered this living tomb and faced your cold, dark cell filled with rats. You stepped on the bones of former inmates. But what made it especially horrific, especially capable of capturing the popular imagination? First of all, it was a political prison a state prison for the king's own enemies. The king could throw ordinary people into jail without a trial. Political enemies of the king might be grain rioters, religious opponents, spies, and of course, a whole series of writers. Voltaire, the most famous philosopher of 18th century France, he was imprisoned in the Bastille twice. And of course, you know, he wrote about it. The Bastille represented censorship, no freedom of the press to speak one's mind. In fact, they also locked up the books themselves. They put dangerous books into the Bastille. 18 works by Voltaire, for example. Also, Rousseau's Social Contract, Diderot's Encyclopedia. And another thing, everything about this prison was draped in secrecy, like so many political maneuverings of the crown. Prisoners entered in carriages with the curtains drawn. The guards were supposed to face the other way so that they never knew the occupant's true identity. Jailers, allegedly, were forbidden to even talk with the inmates. Maybe even the reason for the arrest was a secret. One pamphleteer wrote, An arrest warrant is issued against me. What crime have I committed? What am I accused of? Who has denounced me? Are there witnesses? I know nothing of all this. I am carried to the Bastille. There was no just rule of law, no fair recourse to trial, only secrecy. Now, one prisoner embodied this dreadful secrecy of the Bastille, most of all, the mythic prisoner, the man in the iron mask. This unknown figure was possibly an illegitimate brother and rival to Louis XIV. He had been imprisoned in 1698. He died five years later and became a skeleton still locked inside his mask of iron. Of course, those of you who have seen the movie know that the mysterious man in the mask was Leonardo DiCaprio. Writers made the stories of the Bastille personal and very human. My favorite prisoner was a man named Latude. He was a soldier who was accused of trying to poison Louis XV's mistress, Madame de Pompadour. He had been thrown into the Bastille back in 1749, and he was held there and in other prisons for about 35 years. He escaped three times. Once, after he made a rope ladder out of bits of shirts, bed linen, and pieces of firewood. One time, he got all the way to Amsterdam. He told the story that he was recaptured there and hauled back to the Bastille, wearing a humiliating leather harness. And back in his cell, he said that he saved his sanity by making friends with the rats. He gave them little bits of his own food, and he gave them names like Butterfly and Swallow. Stories like Latude's pitted the humanity and tenderness of prisoners against the massive, harsh presence of the oppressive pre-revolutionary state looming over Paris like the Bastille. The Bastille was a representation of the absolutist monarchy as unjust. Now, in fact, the Bastille was actually not so bad as it had been earlier. The worst dungeons and the most horrendous chains down in the basement weren't even used anymore. Prisoners could actually pay for food and furnishings. And ironically, the richest prisoners in the Bastille ate better than the hungry Parisians who would storm the prison. In July 1789, the Bastille had only a few prisoners. Most of them had been moved somewhere else. For example, take the Marquis de Sade, the famous pornographer, sadism is named after him. He had been transferred out of the Bastille less than two weeks earlier he was taken to an insane, insane asylum for trying to start a disturbance. He had hacked the bottom out of his chamber pot and he used it as a megaphone. 
he yelled to the whole neighborhood, the prisoners are being massacred, the prisoners are being massacred. In July of 1789, there were actually only seven prisoners in the Bastille. Four forgers, one old nobleman accused by his family of incest, one man who had tried to assassinate the king, and one deranged Irishman who thought he was either Julius Caesar or Jesus Christ. He wasn't sure which one, but he knew his initials were JC. But what mattered later on was what the Bastille stood for, the many evils of the old regime, tyranny and despotism, no rule of law, no freedom of the press, no right to a fair trial, only the whims and arbitrariness of the king, only secretive power politics. And this prison stood right in the heart of one of the poorest neighborhoods in Paris. Let's turn back now to the course of events in 1789. Why this attack now? What spurs the men and women of the streets of Paris into action? We need to get a sense of the politics of hope, hunger, and fear that gripped Paris that summer of 1789. Remember that in June, the deputies of the Third Estate had turned the Estates General into a national assembly. The king, Louis XVI, had reluctantly agreed to recognize the national assembly at the end of June. To lots of observers, things seem to have calmed down. The British visitor, Arthur Young, chose this moment to head back to England across the channel. He thought the action was done. He observed, the revolution is now complete. But actually, national politics were suspended in a deadlock. The king had recognized the National Assembly, but he was also massing troops on the outskirts of Paris, some 30,000 men. Many of them were foreign mercenaries. It was very suspicious. It was not entirely clear what would happen. Would the absolutist king share power with the new legislative assembly? Would he let them write a new constitution? Or would he crush this discussion of politics and smash this attempt to overhaul the state of France? In fact, Louis XVI was an indecisive man. He did not have a plan. The answer, the deciding factor, would come from the streets of Paris, from the stormers of the Bastille. Ordinary Parisians watched these high-level politics with hope for social reforms, maybe for a more fair tax system and for a solution to France's problems. But what mattered most to them was the price of bread. They were hungry. The 1788 harvest had been dismal. In 1788, the weather became a cruel player in history. Early drought racked much of the land. Sudden hailstorms happened midsummer. Then late in the summer, devastatingly heavy rainfall. Bread prices began to rise week by week in the winter and spring of 1789. By July, the price of a four pound loaf, which a woman needed to feed her family, its price had doubled. And the flour and bread were of horrendous quality. One journalist wrote, the bread is black, gritty and sour. Flour is of the vilest quality, yellow in color and foul smelling, clotting hard masses that could only be broken up by repeated blows of an ax. The spring of 1789 had seen scattered grain riots in the provinces and one major riot in Paris. Fear of hunger haunted the people of France as they drew up their lists of grievances for the Estates General in the spring of 1789. In April of 1789, a pamphlet had appeared with a great title, What No One Has Said Yet. This pamphlet proclaimed that the price of bread should be the first issue of the Estates General. It quoted a man who asked, are they concerned with us, monsieur? Are they thinking of lowering the price of bread? We haven't eaten anything for two days. Rumors circulated, rumors about an aristocratic plot to hoard grain. This is when the false rumor first arose that Marie Antoinette had said, if they have no bread, let them eat cake. Other rumors spread like wildfire. Allegedly, a magistrate in a nearby city said, if all the girls were to die, there would be enough bread. The politics of hunger lay at the pit of Parisian stomachs as the people watched the political negotiation and stagnation out at Versailles. Now the people of Paris knew that they had one hope beyond the National Assembly, one hero, one protector who could keep down the price of bread. 
That man was the king's finance minister, the Swiss banker named Jacques Necker. He may not sound like he'd be a popular hero, but he was seen as the people's protector in government. He was seen as the one who could supply grain to Paris. People also thought that he was the champion of the National Assembly. Without his presence, people feared that the National Assembly would be sent out to the provinces or just disbanded by the king. Then on July 11th, three days before the storming of the Bastille, the king fired Necker, maybe because this minister wanted to negotiate with the National Assembly. When rumor of the firing of Necker spread by word of mouth from Versailles to Paris, people poured into the streets. They headed for the Palais Royal, the political hotspot of Paris, that arcade that belonged to the king's cousin right in the heart of the city. A crowd of 5,000 took up Necker's bust from the Wax Museum and began to parade, chanting his name. In the Palais Royal, the next day, different speakers drew big crowds, and the biggest crowd of all surrounded Camille Desmoulins, a skinny young man with long stringy curls. Desmoulins was trained as a lawyer, but he spoke with a stammer. As a lawyer, he hadn't had much luck. Now he leapt onto a table outside a popular cafe. His stammer fell away. He plucked a green sprig from a tree as an emblem of hope and liberty. He flourished the pistol in the air, and he gave a rousing speech against the king for a firing necker. To arms, to arms, I call on my brothers to seek liberty. He fired up the crowd to look for weapons and ammunition. Remember that troops were surrounding Paris. About 5,000 of them were actually camped out inside Paris on the field where the Eiffel Tower stands today. Who knew what the king would do with those troops? In the streets, the revolutionary mood of expectation and hope for reform was giving way to the politics of hunger and fear. When the crowds did storm the fortress, they would be looking for gunpowder to defend Paris. But they knew that much more was at stake than the price of bread or the simple defense of the city. At stake was the whole hope of reform politics, in the phrase of the day, the politics of liberty. Now it's time to storm the Bastille. The crowds only grew in numbers from July 12th, 13th, 14th. They roamed the streets looking for both grain and arms, weapons to protect Paris with the new citizens' militia. Wild rumors circulated that the troops would occupy Paris, or rumors that the military governor of the Bastille had been directed to point the cannons onto the neighborhood, onto the very houses that were built up against the walls of the prison. And the most fantastic rumor of all, that the deputies of the National Assembly had already been locked into the dungeons of the Bastille. People in the streets on the 12th and 13th ransacked one monastery in search of bread. They freed inmates from several prisons. And on the morning of July 14th, they invaded the armory at the Veterans Hospital and captured a dozen cannon and 40,000 guns to supply Paris's citizen militia that had just been formed. But strangely enough, they found no gunpowder. Word had it that the gunpowder had been moved in the night to the impregnable fortress prison, the Bastille, draped in its evil mystique. The cry went up, a la Bastille, to the Bastille. The prison was under the command of Delaunay, the military governor of the Bastille. To guard that fortress, he had 32 Swiss soldiers and 82 pensioners, veteran soldiers. Many of them felt sympathy with the people of the neighborhood. On the towers and ramparts, there were 12 light cannon and 15 bigger cannons firing eight pound shot. Another three heavy cannons loomed in the inner courtyard, but it seems that only one cannon shot would be fired from inside the Bastille that day. On the 14th of July, in hopes of maintaining the peace, the political leaders of Paris, the electors, they sent a delegation to meet with Delaunay. In French fashion, they sat down to lunch. But the negotiations went nowhere. And meanwhile, the crowds outside the prison were growing. The biggest group were artisans, artisans of all kinds, cabinet makers, locksmiths, shoemakers, also some small merchants, especially wine sellers. Then there were day laborers and former soldiers. They were armed with pikes, knives, and axes. Some of them had muskets. The houses and shops of the neighborhood were built right up against the walls of the Bastille. When the impatient crowd started pressing against the walls, several men climbed up onto the roof of a perfume shop that was built up against the outer rampart 
climbed onto the wall, and jumped into the outer courtyard. They hacked through the pulleys of the drawbridge to the outer courtyard. The drawbridge crashed down, killing one member of the crowd. A single cannon shot and a volley of musket fire rang out. No one knew just why it had been fired, but the crowd was sure that Delaunay had commanded it. They yelled out, treachery! This infuriated the attackers, who surged over the drawbridge, and they began to exchange fire with the defenders. The attackers were underarmed, so they brought in wagons of straw and set them on fire in hopes of creating a smokescreen for their attack. They wanted to storm the inner gates. The defenders clearly had the advantage with their weapons. What turned the course of events in favor of the Parisians? Around three in the afternoon, one militiaman who owned a laundry, he convinced about 70 members of the French Guard, that's the royal troops, he convinced them to join the people's forces and to haul five cannons to the scene. They soon saw that cannon shots fired against the massive walls would make no impact, so they pointed them at the gates of the inner courtyard. And now it was clear that a more serious battle would follow, that the defenders would have to inflict heavy casualties to defend the Bastille. Here's an important point. It was also clear that royal troops were not entirely on the king's side. Delaunay knew that. He threatened to detonate the gunpowder and blow up the whole Bastille in the neighborhood. But his own soldiers, the veterans, they convinced him otherwise. They didn't want to decimate their neighbors. And they were also afraid of the lynch mob mentality of the attackers. They pressured the governor into capitulating. After Delaunay surrendered at about five o'clock, the leaders of the attack tried to march him to the city hall in the middle of a horde of angry, taunting citizens. He finally cried out, let me die, and he kicked one rioter between the legs. The crowd was now out of the control of its leaders. It leapt upon Delaunay. They stabbed him and shot him to death. Then they offered the offended rioter the task and the thrill of cutting off his head. According to legend, this man began his gory task but he couldn't quite finish it with his pocket knife, so he paused to drink a mixture of brandy and gunpowder so that he would have the courage, literally the fire in his belly, to complete this grisly job. The Bastille had fallen. The unthinkable had happened. Only one defender had been killed, three had been wounded, but almost 100 attackers had been killed and 73 wounded. Later on, 954 individuals, including just one woman, would be given the prized title Conqueror of the Bastille. The night of the fall of the Bastille, the king had been out hunting all day. His valet brought him a nightcap and told him news about the uprising. The king apparently said, was there a rebellion? The valet answered, no, sire, it is a revolution. Everyone knew that the fall of the Bastille changed everything. The valet knew. Palois, our contractor who began to take apart the prison the very next day, he knew. The king's brothers knew. Already one of his brothers and the first wary nobleman fled France. But what had happened? What was the significance of the fall of the Bastille? Why did everyone know that something momentous had occurred? This event made it crystal clear that Paris was solidly behind the revolution and that some of the royal troops supported it as well. The storming of the Bastille set a pattern repeated again and again throughout the French Revolution of Paris pushing the revolution forward, people in the streets radicalizing the revolution, pushing it to the left. As Kaunitz, the Austrian ambassador said, from now on, the city of Paris has assumed the role of king in France. It can, if it pleases, send an army of 40 to 50,000 citizens to surround the assembly and dictate laws to it. Paris may have led, but already the revolution was nationwide. Other urban revolts and peasant uprisings swept France in late July. I will talk about peasant revolts in the next lecture, but let me just say a word here on the urban revolts taking place in other cities. News spread across France, the news of Necker's dismissal and the storming of the Bastille. In town after hungry town, riots and demonstrations broke out. In Caen, in Strasbourg, in Grenoble, in Bordeaux, the four corners of the kingdom. In most towns, merchants and professional men, middle class men who had long been excluded from politics, now they seized power. They set up permanent committees to run the cities. 
soon they would establish more democratic elected municipalities. They also began to call up local militias made up of citizen volunteers. These militia would soon become known as the National Guard. For the young men of France to serve in the Guard, or later to serve in the Revolutionary Army, would be a way to participate in politics, to learn about citizenship and revolutionary ideas. To be a volunteer National Guardsman was to be a true French citizen. Back in Paris, the new city government, called the Commune of Paris, chose a mayor. They also found a man to lead their new citizen militia. They chose an aristocrat, a general who already knew something about revolution, Marie-Joseph Gilbert Dumotier, the Marquis de Lafayette. He came from an old aristocratic family in the south of France. He had fought in the American Revolution in the 1780s. And in France, he supported liberal causes, and he had been elected a deputy to the Estates General. Now Lafayette commanded the Paris National Guard. He represented military prowess and leadership. He stood for the politics of reform and hope. Many of the high aristocrats watched this new politics across France with growing alarm. The king's brother and some leading nobles decided to flee from France. The storming of the Bastille had sparked off the very beginning of emigration, a pattern that would only increase and grow in the years to come. The fall of the Bastille had another impact on high politics out at Versailles. The fall of the Bastille cemented the position of the National Assembly. It forced the king to go forward with the revolutionary project. At first he dithered, but then he promised that he would work with the assembly. The deputies cheered the king and went wild with relief. Some were so overcome with emotion that they actually fainted. By the 16th of July, the king withdrew his troops since their loyalty seemed uncertain. He reappointed Necker. Finally, on July 17th, he went to Paris in a procession. He was accompanied by guards, beggars, and fishwives. Lafayette rode out in front of him, his sword held aloft. In Paris, Louis XVI then stood on a balcony at the city hall. He mumbled a few words under a banner, proclaiming him the father of the free French, the king of a free people. He donned the blue, white, and red emblem made of ribbons, the revolutionary cockade. In fact, his loyalty to the revolution was uncertain. In effect, the storming of the Bastille had cleared space for the National Assembly to try to put into effect reforms that would reverse everything that the prison stood for. The despotic power and arbitrary injustice of the king, the inequality and the system of privileges across the land. Within four weeks, the assembly had begun to dismantle the system of feudal dues and privileges. Within six weeks, the deputies had written the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen to establish equality before the law. The storming of the Bastille and the early revolution gripped the attention of observers across Europe and the Americas. For the Americans, these events in France seemed to validate their own revolution. It seemed to give it global significance and even more validity. The British, too, they welcomed this event. It looked like the French would imitate the English form of government. The ambassador from Great Britain in Paris wrote home, from this moment, we may consider France as a free country and the king a very limited monarch. Other European observers could not take their eyes off France. Friedrich Schleiermacher, the future theologian, wrote to his father, I love the revolution. And one minor official in Holstein declared that the sun shining, quote, on the ruins of the Bastille has dispersed the clouds of prejudice and announced the return of the age of gold. But in France, the revolution was far from over. Matters were hardly settled. In late July, Palois and his workers began to take apart the stones of the Bastille. They began to conduct the first tours of its dungeons. And at the same time, the countryside erupted in revolt. Peasants, the peasants launched a revolution of their own. Lecture 8, Peasant Revolt and the Abolition of Feudalism. On the night of the 4th of August, 1789, something remarkable happened at the new National Assembly. First one, then two, noblemen stood up and called on their fellow members of the first two estates to give away their privileges. 
they declared that they renounced their right to feudal dues from their peasants. And the deputies attacked the harsh injustices of peasant life. One nobleman demanded, why are peasants humiliated like, quote, draft animals tied to the plow? One after another, aristocrats and clergymen took part in a stunning cascade of generosity. They surrendered their tithes, their hunting rights, and the seigneurial dues that the peasants owed them. One more conservative aristocrat passed a note to the deputy who was presiding. They are not in their right minds. Adjourn the session. But he didn't, and the session continued all night long. At dawn, feudalism was crumbling. By the time the evening was over, they had promised to dismantle basic elements of old regime privilege. One historian called this the night the old regime died. The laws that emerged from the night of August 4th became known as the abolition of feudalism. The 4th of August marked a turning point. This was the night that it became clear that the French Revolution was not just about sharing political power. It would be about changing society from top to bottom. It would be about rooting out privilege and pursuing the elusive dream of equality. Why did the night of August 4th happen? Why did the National Assembly begin to dismantle privilege? This lecture will examine the events surrounding the abolition of feudalism to understand how the revolution took such a radical social turn from the very beginning. There's something important that I haven't told you yet. When the deputies stood up one by one in this torrent of generosity, they were also gripped by fear. Because back home, in lots of parts of France, the countryside was on fire with peasant revolts. Peasants stormed their lord's chateaus. They dragged out lists of seigneurial dues. They tore down coats of arms and set them on fire in the courtyards. Now the peasants enter the story of the French Revolution in a big way. In late July and early August, France experienced a series of spiraling riots by peasants against their lords. This huge outburst of peasant violence, this wave of rural panic, was called the Great Fear. When the Parisian workers stormed the Bastille, they cemented the power of the National Assembly. Now, right afterwards, peasant revolts pushed the French Revolution onward, to the left beyond what anyone had expected. The Great Fear lasted from the 20th of July to the 6th of August. And it followed, it actually followed a series of riots and anti-aristocratic protests in the nervous spring of 1789. Remember that the peasants were already politicized by writing grievance lists that spring. They'd already been thinking about reforms and troubles. They'd been following news of the events in Paris, including the fall of the Bastille. Let's take a look at the panic that spread across the countryside. This panic mixed up revolutionary politics with the fear of hunger and bandits and the anger at aristocrats. What were the peasants afraid of? First, hunger, famine, famine caused by an aristocratic plot. Everyone thought that the seigneurs, the merchants, and the tax collectors were hoarding grain in this famine year. They would hoard it until the price went up. And this fear was made even worse by news about Necker being fired, because Necker was seen as the champion of getting grain for the people. And a second point, the fear of famine was mixed with terror about brigands who were said to be roaming the countryside. In ordinary times, about 10% of the rural population was on the road, looking for food, begging, looking for a handout. The peasants helped them out when they could. But now, people seem to see more bandits, more vagabonds than ever before. One man in Normandy complained about paupers flooding the area every night. We cannot lie down without fear. Their numbers are considerable. In that hungry summer of 1789, people thought the brigands were part of an aristocratic plot. They thought that the aristocrats were paying the brigands to steal grain before the peasants could bring in their own harvest. Local administrators across northern France begged, send us troops to guard the fields. The farmers are in a terrible state of fear. Then there were also rumors of foreign invasion that spread in some areas. Maybe British soldiers were invading in the western provinces or Austrians from up north. And news of the emigration of the king's brother and cousins only made this fear worse. 
Maybe the Comte d'Artois, the brother of the king. Maybe he was in Spain or maybe in Turin. But he might come back to France leading an army to overthrow the new National Assembly. Now, this rumor takes us to an important point. This fear of brigands and hoarding and aristocratic plots was totally tied up with revolutionary politics. The peasants had just drawn up their grievance lists. They counted on the new National Assembly to help them out, to protect their food supply. There was a link in the popular mindset between the food supply and the new politics, just the way there had been in Paris. The peasants had all heard about the uprisings in Paris, and uncertainty was everywhere. Quote, there is a general rumor today that the National Assembly will not meet, that the king will send the army to break it apart. All these fears added up to panic. The panic grew from rumors and vague pieces of news. In fact, it's worth pausing to think about how news and rumor traveled in late 18th century France. News could move at about five to six miles an hour. That was the speed of the carriages that carried the mail. They brought newspapers from Paris, letters from deputies in Paris. In theory, it was only the horses of the king that could gallop on the post roads. So that meant that only in exceptional circumstances would news travel more quickly. From Paris, a postal carriage took about 10 hours to reach Chartres with its cathedral, three days to get to Dijon in the heart of Burgundy, six days to reach Bordeaux down on the Atlantic coast, and more than a week to travel all the way to Marseille. And what about news for the villages? Of course, the postal carriage didn't really go there, so it took much longer for news to spread into the little towns, little villages. And there was a lot of room for the news to, to change shape on its way from the larger cities out into the countryside. The peasants got their news by more uncertain means. Mostly they got it from rumor that was transmitted orally across the countryside. Most people couldn't read, and even if they could read, it might not matter because two-thirds of the people in France didn't speak French yet in 1789. They spoke Occitan or Flemish or Breton or a dialect of Catalan or German. Newspapers from Paris didn't do them any good. Sometimes news was brought by a traveling peddler or by someone who went to market day in town. and Maybe they happened to hear a newspaper that was read out loud, or maybe they heard talk at the local tavern. Now, in this political moment, People are anxious for news. They're hungry for news. They're willing to believe anything. It's important to imagine this as a jittery moment. This is a time when rumors about brigands often get mixed up with the politics of resentment, the politics of hunger and anger at the lords. It was rumor that again and again touched off the anti seigneurial revolts. Peasants stormed into the lords' homes in search of food and drink. They looted the chateaus, tossing furniture through the windows, tearing down the weather vanes with their coats of arms. They dug out documents which listed the Lord's feudal rights. They burnt these documents. What else could they do? Trash the Lord's pew in the church with his heraldry on it. Tear down the dovecotes and maybe roast the Lord's pigeons. Go to the monastery and find the cognac in the cellar. Ferret out the documents with tithes listed across the centuries. Sometimes they even captured the Lord and put him under what they called popular arrest. In the late old regime, there was one local marquis who had infuriated his peasants. He seized the common land and he chased his peasants out of the forests. He didn't let them trap rabbits there. He didn't let them gather wood or even pick mushrooms. On the 27th of July, 1789, the locals there, the peasants erupted in anger. They burnt his chateau and demanded that he sign a document renouncing his dues. To tease him, they pushed him near the flames and cinched his hair. Overall, not very many targeted victims met their death in the great fear. The peasants didn't hesitate to scare or humiliate the nobles and clergymen who had ruled over their lives. 800 peasants from 12 villages ransacked the abbey of saint sulpice They built a scaffold and threatened to hang the monks, but then they let them escape, terrified, into the woods. The deputies in the National Assembly heard this news. One Marquis, the Marquis de Ferrière, he wrote home to his wife in Western France and said, hide all the money in the wine cellar. He told her to fill the moat and escape to Poitiers, the big city. She had more sense than he did. She noted that if she filled in the moat, the peasants would be alarmed. And she said she couldn't go running off. She had to stay there and bring in the harvest. Sometimes the rioters engaged in a little bit of humor. 
one group of 300 peasants from the lands of Madame the Marquise de Logonet broke into her chateau and they stole the titles, the deeds of her seigneurie. They destroyed her dovecoats. Then they gave her a receipt for the theft, signed The Nation. The great fear grew out of a local impulse to protect the community from outsiders. This conservative desire to guard the community had roots deep in the past, but now it combined with much more radical elements. It combined with the radical social message of the revolution. For the great fear gave voice to a widespread outcry of resentment against feudalism's injustice. But this was mixed with an edge of vengeance, of anger at the Lords. Let's go back to Versailles now and look at the National Assembly on the night of the 4th of August. Remember that the Assembly continued to meet with all three estates together. The Assembly now had the job of writing the Constitution. While all this agitation is happening out in the countryside, fear grips members of the Assembly. Letters from home, newspaper accounts, rumors of what is happening back home. These things circulate news among the deputies. Some of the deputies met and they began to plan an event to take place in the National Assembly. They thought that maybe if some of the liberal nobles renounced their privileges, then maybe they'd be able to calm down this unrest in the countryside. The deputies were hoping to make some modest changes to the seigneurial system, but they had no idea what would actually happen once they got started. On the night of the 4th of August, a Viscount, the brother-in-law of Lafayette, he started the evening off. He had a scripted proposal. Then there was a duke who followed him. He had a planned set of denunciations of feudalism. And after that, all scripts were abandoned. These proposals electrified the assembly. The assembly was already in this tense mood of fear about peasant revolt. And all night, the nobles participated in a chain reaction of spontaneous generosity. They tried to outdo each other in pro-peasant declarations. For example, one gentleman from Brittany commented that the peasantry, quote, were forced to spend whole nights beating the swamps to prevent bullfrogs from disturbing the slumber of voluptuous seigneurs. One nobleman argued that they should do away with the whole system of serfdom in Franche-Comté. Franche-Comté was an epicenter of peasant oppression. This nobleman said they should draw inspiration from what he called English America. They should get rid of all the remnants of feudalism. His words apparently inspired what they called noble enthusiasm. The elites poured out cascades of self-sacrifice. They even got competitive. One deputy called it a combat of generosity. When the Bishop of Chartres proposed that the nobles' hunting rights be abolished, the Duke of Châtelet leapt to his feet. He countered the church's tithe should be done away with. The Duke declared, so he takes away our hunting, I'm going to take away his tithes. One parish priest grabbed the podium, and he declared that the clergy's pastoral fees should be abolished. At least 55 specific individuals made suggestions that were recorded, but probably hundreds more deputies actually took part in this outpouring of appeals for reform. In the assembly, two-thirds of the noble deputies came from the old aristocracy. They didn't want to give up their privileges, or they were more reluctant to give up their privileges than newer nobles were. But some of them, a few of them took part. Some of them regretted it later on. As the revolutionary Condorcet said, allegedly, the French nobility is committing suicide. Historians have worked hard to try to figure out the psychology of this moment. Some historians argue that the actions came from fear. Other scholars say the reforms came from generosity. The events undoubtedly came out of some kind of collective dynamic, some complicated mix of motives. Without a doubt, the news about the peasant uprisings was hanging over the evening. But this fear was mixed with impulsive generosity. It was mixed with idealism. The mood was reinforced by a group dynamic, a kind of one-upsmanship, a dynamic of fraternity. It was unpredictable. One deputy exclaimed, Great and memorable night. We wept. We hugged one another. What a nation. What a glory. What an honor to be French. Another deputy from up north in Flanders, he wrote a letter home telling his wife to give an extra celebratory pot of beer to all the laborers and peasants to celebrate the 4th of August. 
And another deputy, Gontere, he shared his sense of elation. We are a nation of brothers. The king is our father, and France is our mother. Now notice the ex- how he's expressing fraternity in that metaphor. It's important to understand how emotions stand at the heart of the revolutionary dynamic at this moment and at many other moments. The assembly spent the next week codifying these abolitions of feudalism. Lots of times they toned them down because many deputies later regretted their generosity and they lobbied to weaken the most dramatic reforms. Article 1 of the decree of the 4th to 11th of August proudly proclaimed, the National Assembly completely destroys the feudal regime. This phrase exaggerates, but they did make major changes. First, the decree abolished the right to certain annual feudal dues. Lords could no longer collect fees for using the wine press or the communal bread ovens, for example. The decrees also got rid of the old seigneurial justice courts. They did away with the Lord's dovecoats, his hunting privileges. They got rid of the leftovers of serfdom in France. They got rid of all forms of unpaid labor that peasants owed their Lords. The church and its privileges had also been attacked. So the abolition of the tithe was passed in principle. A committee was set up to figure out the details, and that took a few more years. Also, the assembly attempted to set up rules for a state bureaucracy that would be based on merit and equality rather than birth or privilege. They were very much inspired by Enlightenment ideology. So drawing inspiration from the Enlightenment, the decrees abolished the old regime's sale of bureaucratic offices. Remember, that was a system where the person who bought the office would gain nobility, or maybe his children would. The National Assembly also decreed that any commoner could enter the officer ranks of the army, a commoner could hold a high position in the church, and all government offices were open to non-nobles. If you take everything together, the night of August 4th brought about a massive attack on privilege. This first stage of the revolution is anti-hierarchical, anti-aristocratic, it's egalitarian. But despite the radical actions, that night of August 4th had limits in its major social reforms. It's kind of interesting to notice what some of the suggestions were that the deputies made that they didn't agree to do yet. Three suggestions were set aside, but I want to point them out. What were those three? Alexandre de la Meff suggested that complete religious freedom be granted to all Protestants, a religious minority in France. La Rochefoucauld called for abolishing slavery in the colonies. And one unknown deputy demanded the abolition of the nobility. All three of these major issues, religious toleration, the abolition of slavery, and the elimination of the nobility as a noble status, all three of those would be debated and later enacted during the revolution. Now we need to turn to one more big topic. How did France react to the aftermath of the 4th of August? The king was disgusted. Not surprisingly, he was very reluctant to agree to the reforms of August 4th. In late July and August, Louis XVI had been depressed. He hadn't tried to communicate very much with the National Assembly. He hadn't tried to provide leadership. On the morning of August 5th, when he heard about the Assembly taking apart and dismantling the system of feudalism and privilege, he wrote down privately, I shall never consent to the despoiling of my clergy and my nobility. For several months, he refused to agree to the decrees of August 4th to August 11th. In fact, it would take another popular uprising from the streets of Paris to force him to comply. And what about inside the assembly? How about reactions there? The events of the 4th of August cultivated a kind of good mood in the assembly, a mood of generosity and optimism. But... It also sparked off the serious beginning of a right-wing party in France because various nobles and clergy resented the turn that the revolution was taking. A new political group formed. They were known as the Monarchiens. You might hear in their name that they aligned themselves with the king, with the monarchy, the Monarchiens. Like Louis, they didn't like the August decrees. They opposed them. The main leaders of the Monarchiens were members of the clergy and the nobility. They were upset, they were nervous about the abolition of feudalism. 
one nobleman complained, we are now no more than first peasants on the land. And one clergyman said, I love this, they treat us as though we came from another planet. The Monarchien thought that if they strengthened the king and the high elites, it would strengthen France. In September, for example, they, they tried without success to give the king absolute veto power over any new laws. They also tried to set up a bicameral legislature like the American Congress or the English Parliament. That didn't work either. Their colleagues on the left refused to agree with this idea. They were wary of creating a new legislative privileged class in an upper legislature. In the assembly, the night of August 4th radicalized the revolution. It raised the stakes of the revolution, but it also deepened these factions inside the assembly. And what about reactions across France outside the assembly? The peasants' struggle, their uprisings, and this whole abolition of feudalism really caught the attention of the cities. People in the countryside were paying attention as well. The great fear and the night of August 4th showed how central the social question of equality would be for the revolution. There were prints that circulated around France that celebrated the victory of the peasant, the victory of the third estate over the privileged estates. These prints were caricatures. They often showed the three estates in two different configurations. The first image was called before August 4th. In that image, a tired peasant carried on his back two members of the first two estates, usually a, a fairly large priest and a fancy nobleman who was dressed in a silk coat. Then in the second image, the clergy and the noblemen, now they carry the peasant on their backs. And the peasant usually waved a rabbit because now the Lord was not the only one who had the right to hunt wherever he wanted. August 4th had another impact. It touched off a court of generosity, especially among the middle-class citizens of France. It began a kind of cult of national charity. It was the first step in a long practice of sacrificing oneself for the good of the nation. For example, in September 1789, wives of artists, including the wives of Jacques-Louis David and Fraganard, they came to the bar of the National Assembly bringing their jewels as a patriotic contribution for the national debt. And that fall at the Café Procope, the customers one day passed around a bucket and they, they tore the silver buckles from their shoes and threw them in the bucket. They actually made a chain of silver that they donated to the nation to pay for the national debt. Imagine that. This example touched off a kind of provincial craze of stripping one's shoes of silver buckles to participate in this national generosity. It began to seem at this moment unfrench and aristocratic. Aristocratic had become a bad word by the end of 1789. To be too rich or too flashy was unfrench and aristocratic. And what about reactions in rural France? Well, when news of the decrees made its way across France, peasants, of course, everywhere, they celebrated. They ran to the dovecoats, they tore them open to let out the pigeons, they start shooting the birds that have just been freed. One school teacher who lived on the lands of the Prince of Conti, he was the cousin of the king, the teacher recorded happily that the locals went out hunting, quote, just as the prince used to do. We hunted all day. I brought home 18 pounds of meat. And a little further south, the Marquise de Clequy complained that the local peasants, quote, they helped themselves to our fine fish in the private noble fish pond. And they went off singing, long live the nation, long live the National Assembly. Everywhere in the coming year, nobles and clergy complained that the old deference was gone. But for the peasants, after these early celebrations, reality set in. The feudal regime hadn't been entirely abolished. Peasants were actually supposed to pay compensation for the right to stop paying dues. The peasants, of course, pretended they didn't understand. They boycotted these dues. They refused to pay the tithe, even though the harvest of 1789 luckily was much better than it had been in 1788. I think it makes sense to see a kind of dialogue, a negotiation taking place in these early years of the revolution, a negotiation between peasants and lords, between citizens and legislators, Everyone was trying to figure out what the new France would look like. This negotiation took place both in legal realms and in violent ways as well. And over the next few years, the peasants, occasionally they attacked the remainders of the seigneurial regime. 
They put pressure on the legislators to finish their job, to finish dismantling the seigneurial system. By July of 1793, you notice it's four years later, seigneurial dues had finally been entirely abolished without any compensation, without any payment for the lords. So the night of August 4th began a crucial shift away from old regime seigneurialism to a new mode of landlord-tenant relations that would be based just on rent. This system, with peasants as renters and smallholders, that became the dominant modern mode of landholding in France. In this case here, the revolution had a lasting social impact. The tithe had also been done away with provisionally. It was finally eliminated altogether in 1791 when the state began to pay salaries of priests as part of a major reorganization that they did, a major reorganization of the Catholic Church. Although it would take a few years for the full implications of the night of August 4th to play out, it was clear that it marked a turning point, a crucial turning point. Let me conclude by highlighting just a few elements. The great fear and the abolition of feudalism show us one more time a central dynamic of the revolution. Popular activism and lawmaking interacted. That happened in Paris when people stormed the Bastille and convinced the king that he'd better not try to disband the assembly. Now the peasants took their turn. They pushed the revolution forward and the lawmakers played their part. Peasant revolts had happened often in European history. Less than 20 years old earlier, there was a, a much bigger revolt, the Pugachev revolt, that exploded across southern Russia. But it couldn't bring about substantive social changes. The great fear, the peasant uprisings of 1789, had an impact because there were lawmakers at that very moment who were willing to remake France. They were writing new laws. They were drafting a new constitution. The French Revolution repeatedly drew tremendous creative energy for change from this dynamic, the explosive interaction between the popular classes and the lawmakers. The night of August 4th also shows us how the political revolution, the political revolution was a social revolution from 1789 on. The peasants' attack on privilege cut to the heart of the social structure. This point leads us to a useful comparison with the American Revolution. The French Revolution, again and again, was much more contentious, much more socially radical than the American Revolution. The Americans didn't have an embedded system of privilege to combat. But in the French case, this issue, the system of privilege, made it a social revolution from the outset if they were going to get anything done. The abolition of feudalism on the 4th of August, 1789, was just one of the major foundational events that took place that month of August. The next lecture will turn to the second one, every bit as important. Because later that month, the National Assembly drew up the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. This was the foundational document of the Constitution of the New French Nation. The Declaration of the Rights of Man rooted sovereignty in the people. It rooted political power in the people and declared universal rights for all citizens of France. But it left open a big question. Who would be a citizen? Who would be included in those new universal rights? Lecture 9. The Declaration of the Rights of Man. Three and a half years into the French Revolution, a group of revolutionary women gathered at their political club to award congratulations to a group of children. In unison, the children proudly recited what they had memorized so well, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. This 17 article declaration was the foundational document of the French Revolution. It announced the equality of all men before the law. It listed crucial rights it proclaimed the sovereignty of the nation. It now appeared everywhere in France, like a sacred text. It showed up on municipal buildings and churches and schools, in the halls of the legislature. What was this Declaration of Rights? And why was it so important? 
Why was it so sacred to the French? This lecture will look at the origins and significance of the Declaration. We'll examine American influences and explore some of the implications by looking at debates over religious liberty in France. But first of all, we have to set the context and think about the, the newness, the very radicalism of proclaiming universal rights. Let's imagine first the deputies in the National Assembly in late August 1789. Just six weeks earlier, the Bastille, that great emblem of despotism and injustice, the Bastille had fallen. And only three weeks earlier, when the country was on fire with peasant uprisings, the deputies had begun to dismantle feudalism and get rid of privilege. And now they're trying to write France's first ever constitution. They want to establish a constitutional monarchy. But before they do anything else, they felt they had to declare universal rights. Why? Well, to answer this question, we need to think first about the lack of rights in old regime Europe. The word rights in the old regime meant particular rights, particular rights that people held because they belonged to a certain social group. They held rights to something. Of course there were no universal rights. It just mattered what group you were in. For example, the clergy of the first estate had the particular right to be exempt from royal taxes. And for historic reasons, the town of Bordeaux, the peasants of Brittany, they had the particular right to pay less taxes than the peasants in central France, for example. We can get more examples from recent lectures. Catholics could worship openly, but Protestants didn't have that right. Jews could have their places of worship, but they didn't even have the right to own land or become master artisans and join guilds. They lived in those few places that allowed them to stay there and engage in a limited group of occupations. They could participate in commerce, become peddlers, they could lend money or manage land. Peasants in the Franche-Comté in the eastern part of France had no right to move away. They couldn't leave their land to their sons. And the enslaved Africans in the Caribbean, they had virtually no rights at all. No one in France had freedom of speech or the right to publish freely. And no one had an automatic right to a fair trial before a court of law. In fact, the justice system often used torture to extract confessions. Some kinds of torture were abolished right before the revolution in 1788, but the full abolition of torture would only occur in 1789 after they wrote the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. And there was nothing special or unusual about France. No country in Europe recognized universal rights. It's true that England had its 1689 Bill of Rights that asserted particular rights for freeborn Englishmen, especially property-owning men. But even in England, Rights were sharply curtailed for Catholics, Jews, and dissenting Protestants. So where do the French get this shocking idea of declaring universal rights for everyone? Enlightenment philosophers talked a great deal about rights. And already, back in the 17th century, some thinkers had theorized the universal characteristics of natural law and natural rights. Then the Enlightenment gave the issue of rights tangible form. Voltaire, for example, he'd pushed the notion of Protestants' rights and rights to justice in general when he took up the Kala affair and took on his fight against the unfairness of the French justice system. The Enlightenment had also asked that question whether it made sense to think about society as made up of these disparate groups, each with different sets of rights and privileges. The Enlightenment raised the idea of thinking of society as individuals, each individual bearing natural rights. But it would be the American example that truly brought the notion of rights to the front of people's minds. Between 1776 and 1783, French booksellers published nine translations of the American Declaration of Independence and five translations of state constitutions and bills of rights. The French were especially impressed by Virginia's Declaration of Rights that had been written by George Mason in 1776. This declaration not only pronounced universal rights, it also listed individual specific rights. The American Declaration of Independence also proclaimed universal rights, but it didn't really say exactly what they were. 
And in the summer of 1789, when the French Revolution broke out, the Americans were busy writing a more particular Bill of Rights as the first 10 amendments to the Constitution that would be ratified by 1791. Now, many of the French idealized the American colonists. The Americans seemed to be inventing society and crafting government from scratch. As one future revolutionary put it in 1786, the Americans had taken Enlightenment theory out of the books and were putting it into practice. In the summer of 1789, this debate about rights was wrapped up with a controversy in the National Assembly about how to restructure political power in France. There were two separate schools of thought. The debate pitted the monarchiens, the monarchists, against the patriots. The more conservative monarchiens believed that the assembly should reform France, but they shouldn't revolutionize it. They wanted to set up a bicameral legislature that would help to keep a strong king who would have absolute power to veto laws. In contrast, the left-leaning patriots imagined a much more radical path, something more like what the Americans seem to have done. They wanted to start from scratch to make a new social pact, maybe a pact like the one in Rousseau's social contract. They wanted a unicameral legislature because they didn't want to have their own version of an elitist House of Lords and a House of Commoners. Now, the key man for the patriots in the National Assembly was the Marquis de Lafayette. He was the French hero of the American Revolution. And now he was the head of the new National Guard of Paris. And he was a major leader of reform politics. In the National Assembly, it would be Lafayette who introduced the idea of starting the Constitution with a Declaration of Rights. He'd actually already written a draft declaration back in January, before the revolution even began. Now, in July, he was reworking that draft with Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson was in Paris as the American minister to France. Earlier, he had been lobbying his American colleagues and telling them they should add a Bill of Rights as amendments to the Constitution. The French Constitutional Committee admired Jefferson. They'd invited him to aid in their deliberations, but he didn't agree to do it. But his presence was still influential. He often met with the revolutionaries behind the scenes. On the evening of the 26th of August, that would be the very day that the assembly agreed on a Declaration of Rights. That evening, he held a six-hour dinner party with leaders from the Patriot and Monarchian factions. He hoped to mediate their ongoing battle about whether the king should have a veto and whether France for its legislature should have one or two chambers. The factions couldn't actually quite agree, but Jefferson later recorded how impressed he was by the tenor of the debate. He depicted himself happily as, quote, a silent witness to a coolness and candor of argument unusual in the conflicts of political opinion. And for a long time, Jefferson would maintain his respect for the French. It's very important to see 1789 as a moment of tremendous international excitement and optimism. A veritable transnational dialogue was happening about the possibilities of Enlightenment politics and about the promise of rights ideology. People from various parts of the Atlantic world participated. On the day that Lafayette presented his draft, for example, Thomas Jefferson reported the news excitedly to Tom Paine. Paine was an Englishman who participated in both the American and the French revolutions. And besides Lafayette, there were some other uh, French veterans of the American Revolution who also took part in the debate. Lafayette's fellow officer, the Duc de Montmorency, urged the French, quote, to follow the example of the United States. They have given a great example to the new hemisphere. Let us give one to the universe. The Monarchiens were opposed to this enthusiastic de declaring of rights they emphasize the differences between France and the United States. Lali Tolondal, who was a leader of the Monarchiens, he reminded the deputies that the United States was different. It was, in his words, an infant people, announcing its birth to the universe, a colonial people breaking its bonds from a distant government. In France, he said it was different. France was an ancient and immense people, as he put it. For 1,400 years, it had possessed its own form of government. He also warned that if they declared rights, it might encourage the people to make subversive demands or even rise up in violence. 
remember that the debate over rights was taking place in the months of July and August 1789, chaotic months, the time when the Parisians captured the Bastille and when peasants had stormed the chateaus of their lords. Another monarchien pointed out that the U.S. could hardly be a model for France because that country was already made up only of, quote, property holders, farmers, and equal citizens. And another deputy commented, quote, they have no trace of feudalism in the land they cultivate. Now, these deputies, they exaggerated American equality. They totally ignored the institution of slavery and the treatment of Indians in the new United States. But they were right that the French faced an entirely different social and political set of circumstances. In the debate, the patriots eventually won out. By the 26th of August, 1789, the French deputies had agreed on a preliminary draft of what would become the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. It would then become part of the Constitution of 1791. In a nutshell, Enlightenment ideas, American examples, and the opening of the French Revolution had created the context for this declaration. The French would end up revising that declaration when they wrote another constitution in 1793 and yet another constitution in 1795. Napoleon took it out of his constitution in 1800. And then in the early 19th century, when the French kings came back, they didn't put the declaration back in. But almost all of France's Republican constitutions since then began by declaring rights. The issue took on particular power after World War II because of the Nazi occupation, and especially because of the collaboration by the French Vichy government. In 1946 and 1958, the French constitutions endorsed the 1789 Declaration, and they added even more rights. So what, what was in the 1789 Declaration of Rights? The very title, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, with the words man and citizen, it suggests two key purposes. The word man emphasized universalism. French men, like all mankind, had certain rights straight from nature, natural rights. The word citizen really referred to politics. French men would now be citizens participating in government rather than just subjects of an absolutist king. By the way, in ordinary speech, French men and women changed their forms of address to capture this new emphasis on equality. Citizen and citizeness replaced the words monsieur and madame because monsieur and madame meant my lord and my lady. The American Declaration of Independence had defined inalienable rights as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But the French Declaration defined natural rights as liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. Resisting oppression was in the front of their minds. In fact, the more radical 1793 declaration proclaimed that insurrection is, quote, the most sacred of rights and the most indispensable of duties, duties. They only say it once, but I'm saying it twice. When the government violates the rights of the people. When they mandated the legal protection of various civil liberties in 1789, the French clearly were thinking of specific forms of old regime oppression. They were thinking of censorship, unfair taxes, and the king's ability to imprison people without a trial. The French Declaration listed freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom from arbitrary arrest, quote, every man being presumed innocent until judged guilty. Like the August 4th abolition of feudalism, this declaration attacked the old, old regime system of privilege. It promised, quote, equal access to public offices and employments, and it mandated egalitarian taxation. To sum up, it mandated equality before the law. Now, the most hotly debated article had to do with religious freedom. Many deputies, especially the clergy, were nervous about establishing religious toleration. They were afraid that that move might undermine the religious and political power of Catholicism in France. One parish priest wrote home, he said, we fought over 15 hours to prevent open religious practice for all faiths. Ultimately, in the end, the assembly agreed to grant religious freedom, but it was kind of ambiguous about it. Article 10 read, 
no one should be disturbed for his opinions, even in religion, provided that their manifestation does not trouble public order as established by law. I also want to mention that some deputies called for listing more rights, especially certain social rights, like the right to subsistence and the right to education. These were traditionally duties of the church. They wanted to transfer them to the state. And in 1793, when the revolution got more radical, the new version of the Declaration explicitly included these two rights to food and education. It stated, society owes subsistence to its poor citizens. It's also important to emphasize that the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen did much more than legally protect rights. Like the American Declaration of Independence, it proclaimed the nation's right to rule itself. But the French weren't actually trying to break away from a distant king the way the Americans had been. The French were trying, at this point in the revolution anyway, they were trying to figure out how to share power with the king. So it's striking that the Declaration of the right, of Rights of Man did not mention the king at all. Instead, it claimed that sovereignty, the right to rule, the right to govern, that sovereignty rested in the nation. The Declaration laid out the right of citizens to participate in making law. In fact, the Declaration said that the explicit purpose of government was to guard and preserve rights. This point contrasts with the American Bill of Rights. The American Bill of Rights doesn't lay out the foundation for government. It actually was written to protect individuals from an overly powerful government. There are lots of reasons for the different attitudes towards state and government in modern France and modern America. But if you look back at this revolutionary era, you can see already origins of France's greater acceptance of a stronger centralized state. Now, in 1789, this declaration shocked European kings and nobles. They were aghast at its claim to national sovereignty and equal rights. You know, it was one thing for faraway Americans to act like this. But how, how could this kind of challenge to the status quo and the power structures, how could that be possible in one of the oldest and most powerful monarchies of Europe? One of the main significances of the rights of man was its explicitly universalist language. It claimed that nature guaranteed universal rights. It seemed to include everyone. But in fact, the document really left open a big question of who would actually get rights. At first, it seemed to apply just to free white men with property, men who paid enough taxes and were defined by law as active citizens. But what about all the other groups of people in France? What about poor men? What about women? What about religious minorities, either Protestants or Jews? What about free people of color on the French islands off in the Caribbean? What about slaves? And what about actors and executioners? These last two groups, actors and executioners, were considered morally suspect. That was because actors took on false personas and executioners made their living by killing other human beings. The revolutionaries would debate the rights of all these groups. Historians have disagreed about just how radical the Declaration of the Rights of Man really was. Some argue that it was inherently exclusionary. In that viewpoint, the rights of man were imagined from the very beginning as limited, and they were especially curtailed by gender and race. But other historians say that declaring rights created a kind of logic, an inner logic, that made it virtually inevitable that rights would be given to more and more people when it became socially and politically possible to do that. During the Revolution, men without property would win full rights and the vote by 1792. Women would get key civil rights, like the right to divorce and equal inheritance, but they wouldn't gain full political rights. In fact, it wasn't until 1944 that they got the right to vote. And during the revolution, some free men of color won political rights and civil rights, only to lose them a few months later and then get them back again. French slaves would, would win freedom. They would convince the French revolutionaries to abolish slavery, but only because the slaves themselves rose up in a massive revolution of their own. In short, the story of implementing or winning universal rights was, was rocky. It was hard fought. The Declaration of Rights was an idealistic document, but it definitely didn't instantaneously bring about everything that it seemed to promise. 
Now let's take a closer look at how the Declaration raised the issue of rights for religious minorities. France was a predominantly Catholic country. The crown drew its strength from its alliance with Catholicism. Like virtually every country in Europe in this time period, the French state limited freedom of worship, and it put limits on the civil status of religious minorities. In the population, France had a population of about 28 million at this time. There were about 40,000 Jews and somewhere between a million and 800,000 Protestants. Protestants were not allowed to worship in public. They couldn't appoint clergy or hold public offices. They couldn't become teachers. For their part, Jews could publicly profess their faith, but they faced all kinds of limits on their civil and political rights. As I mentioned earlier, they couldn't practice certain occupations. They couldn't own land. And the crown levied particular taxes on the Jews. When the revolutionaries declared rights, they called these practices of religious intoleration into question. On Christmas Eve, 1789, the National Assembly met, they worked hard, they voted overwhelmingly to extend rights to all Protestants. Protestants had been second-class citizens during the old regime, but now several points worked in their favor. The Enlightenment had emphasized toleration. Figures like Voltaire had paved the way for granting rights to Protestants. And actually, two years before the Revolution in 1787, Louis XVI gave some rights to Protestants. And now, with the Revolution, Protestants seemed, they seemed less suspect. The National Assembly included 24 Protestant deputies. Many of them were already actively proving their loyalty to the new nation. And also the Jacobins. The Jacobins was a new political group that was organizing on the left. They organized effectively on behalf of the Protestants. The Protestants seemed as worthy as anyone of rights. Mirabeau said sarcastically that the Protestants might be damned in the next world, but they were doing just fine in this one. Also, very important, the National Assembly had begun to separate the legitimacy of the state from Catholicism. The king, remember, the king drew his legitimacy straight from God, a Catholic God. But now the National Assembly claimed that its sovereignty, its right to rule, came from the nation as a whole. So granting rights to Protestants became more possible once the state no longer drew such strength and such legitimacy from religion. But the case of the Jews was a lot more controversial. There weren't many Jews in France, only about 40,000 of them. Most of them were poor Ashkenazi Jews who lived in the Northeast. Down in the Southwest, lived about, there were about 6,000 Sephardic Jews. Their families had mostly fled Portugal and Spain after the expulsions way back in the 1490s. Some of these Jews were very successful merchants. They also had more communal rights and more self-government than the poor Ashkenazi Jews up in the Northeast. It would take two more years for these different groups of Jews all to win the rights of citizenship. All of them were seen as foreigners in France, as a nation apart. Even some Enlightenment philosophers shared that very widespread point of view. Take Voltaire, for example. He had lobbied very powerfully for the rights of Protestants, but he was deeply anti-Semitic. He had written, Jews are all of them born with raging fanaticism in their hearts, just as the Bretons and the Germans are born with blonde hair. At the beginning of the National Assembly, the deputies who argued against Jews' rights emphasized two points. They warned that if they granted rights to Jews, it might unleash popular violence against them, especially against the Ashkenazi Jews in northeastern France. And in 1789, some Christian peasants in Alsace had in fact attacked Jews during the Great Fear. One deputy dramatically predicted that if they gave Jews citizenship, they would be signing their death warrant. Above all, opponents of the Jews' rights claimed that they were dangerously different. For example, the Bishop of Nancy called them a tribe whose religions, customs, and morality differ essentially from those of all other people. He said their allegiance to their homeland and their religious customs would make it impossible for them to fulfill the duties and occupations of true citizens. When the Jews from different regions petitioned the National Assembly to be recognized as citizens, they tried to counter all these negative images of Jewish immorality or Jewish foreignness. They emphasized their contributions to civic virtue and the moral foundations of their beliefs. 
They used revolutionary language. They said everything is changing. The lot of the Jews must change at the same time. The deputies who were in favor of Jewish emancipation pointed out that society wasn't imagined anymore as different legal groups, each one different before the law. They emphasized that France was breaking down this system of different social divisions and privileges, that France was creating a nation of individuals. One deputy, Clermont Tonnerre, famously argued, we must refuse everything to the Jews as a nation and accord everything to the Jews as an individual, as, as individuals. He meant that as individuals, Jews would gain the rights of citizenship, but they would lose their collective claims as a social group to particular rights, such as the right to self-rule for Sephardic communities in the Southwest. The strongest supporter of Jewish emancipation in the assembly was a Catholic priest, Henri, Henri Grégoire. He played on the heartstrings of the deputies. He told the history of the persecution of the Jews in wrenching detail. He said, you cannot force anyone to follow a religion which his heart will not accept. To love one's religion, it is not necessary to hate or persecute those who do not share it. He also hoped emancipation would make Jews more French, more like everyone else. The emancipation of all French Jews was finally decreed in September 1791. This was a strikingly modern move. It caught the attention of Jews in Western and Central Europe and in the Russian Empire as well. But emancipation came with certain limitations and opened up many questions. Jewish men gained the full rights of citizenship to participate in national politics. Some Jews, especially from Bordeaux, became major revolutionary leaders. But at the same time, Jews lost separate communal autonomy and control over their own local civil affairs. Emancipation also opened up the huge question of how and how much Jews should assimilate to the broader French culture. In addition, the laws put certain economic regulations on the Jews that actually reinforced certain anti-Semitic perceptions of Jews as greedy and corrupt. These regulations also brought about some financial losses for the Jews in northeastern France. The emancipation of the Jews leads us to think about the significance of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. Founding sovereignty of the new nation on the principle of universal rights was a huge force for change in revolutionary France. It set a high, powerful standard for the young revolution. But putting rights into effect ran up hard against traditional forces, against old prejudices and old social practices. But altogether, the events of the summer of 1789 had still been remarkable. Think about everything the French had already done by August of 1789. They had attacked privilege and hierarchy. They had declared equality before the law. They had changed the location of power in France. The king was still widely respected. He was recognized as king. But sovereignty, true sovereignty, now lay in the nation. And for his part, the king didn't really want to support the revolution. For the moment, he refused to recognize either the August 4th abolition of feudalism or the August 26th declaration of the rights of man and citizen. The next lecture will ask how the French convinced him to change his mind. Lecture 10. Paris commands its king. During the French Revolution, no one ever knew what was going to happen next. In October of 1789, a totally unexpected event took place, a huge demonstration called the October Days. In this incident, the people of Paris took matters into their own hands they took a message to their king, queen, and assembly out at Versailles. The October days would change the dynamic of the revolution. You need first to set the mood in Paris that fall. Then we'll march out to Versailles and meet up with Louis and Marie Antoinette. In September and October 1789, Parisians were nervous. The king didn't seem to want to back the revolution. He clearly was reluctant to agree to the all-important August laws that August 4th decree that had abolished feudalism, and also the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. Everyone knew that the king meant well. People still held him in high regard. He was king, after all. But maybe the aristocrats or some evil ministers were tricking him. 
the idea began to circulate in Paris that it would be much better if Louis moved to Paris and lived among his people. It had been seven decades since any French king had lived inside the walls of the city. One pamphlet asked, does a good father distance himself from his family or a good shepherd live far from his flock? Oh, Louis, prince so often fooled with such pure intentions, assure us of your love. Come live among us. Meanwhile, by mid-September, in the National Assembly, the Monarchia and the Patriots had finally agreed that there would be just one unicameral legislature. And the deputies gave the king a suspensive veto. That is, he could suspend and delay new legislation by waiting to sign it. He could delay the deputies' new laws by up to four years. When the king was dragging his feet about agreeing to this new political arrangement, the people dreamt up new nicknames for the king and queen. They called them Monsieur and Madame Vito. And the mood in Paris, it got darker when people heard that the king had once again called troops to assemble in Versailles, just like in July. Was this new Flanders regiment out at Versailles going to stage a coup against the National Assembly? And the Parisians were worried about something else. For some unclear reason, the price of bread had only gone down a little, and now it was going up again, even though the harvest of 1789 had been much better than 1788. In mid-September, Thomas Jefferson was about to go back to the U.S. In his letter, his last letter, he commented, Paris is in danger of hourly insurrection for the want of bread. The patience of the people is worn threadbare. Fear of hoarding gripped the populace. Newspapers and pamphlets poured off the presses. Many asked the same question. One pamphlet title put it very well. When shall we have bread? In 1789, since censorship had been lifted, pamphlets appeared by the dozens, and there were 140 new newspapers just in Paris alone. Now, in this group of new journalists, some of them stood out for their radicalism. Just a few weeks earlier, the feistiest one of all, Jean-Paul Marat, had begun to publish his newspaper, The Friend of the People. Marat had been a frustrated scientist in the old regime. But now he had found his calling. He would be the watchdog of the radical revolution. And in September 1789, he was just developing his vitriolic style. He dressed to match the part. He wore filthy clothes. He had a yellow bandana that he soaked in vinegar, and he used it to hold back his wild mop of hair. He had a skin disease that pitted his skin with these yucky, pussy sores. Now Marat, the friend of the people, he accused the commune, the municipal government of Paris, he said they were plotting with Necker and the flour millers to hoard grain and force the prices up and up. When the commune ordered him to revoke this accusation, he laughed in their faces. I am the eye of the people, and you are at the most its little finger. Other newspapers joined in these accusations about hoarding. One of them, called the Revolutions of Paris, denounced hoarders as a new system of aristocracy. Or maybe it was the king's evil ministers who were to blame. No one worried more about the price of bread than the wives and mothers of Paris. Getting food for their families had always been women's work in France. Now they stood in line at the bakeries, and they, they talked about the prices. During the old regime, at times of fear or times of famine, women again and again had taken to the streets. They had led the flower wars of 1775, when tens of thousands of rioters all across northern France demanded grain from merchants and municipal officers. In the huge food market in the middle of Paris, it was women who dominated the selling and also the buying. Market women sold butter, eggs, fish, and vegetables to the population. These market women of Paris were called poissards, fishwives. They also had a political role to play. By old tradition, they had a special bond with the king and queen. Every 25th of August, St. Louis Day, they marched out to Versailles to offer homage to the king on behalf of the people of France. And each time a French queen gave birth, the market women visited her. They brought her flowers and the compliments of the people. In 1781, when Marie Antoinette gave birth to her first son, the fishwives came to Versailles. They sang her praises. She threw them a banquet. By old tradition, the market women of Paris could whisper the needs of the people into the ear of the king. In Paris that September, there was a new National Guard under the command of Lafayette. It had the job of policing the carts of grain and keeping the peace. 
the National Guard also had to defend Paris from attack. What if, for example, those suspicious royal troops out of Versailles decided to attack the city? Like the journalists, like the market women, the guardsmen were on the alert. They watched the goings on. By now, the guard numbered about 30,000 men. 4,800 of these were paid regulars who had been in the King's Army or in the Swiss Guard. The others were volunteers from all across Paris who served a day or two every two, three, or four weeks. Lafayette, the commander of the National Guard, was just 32 years old, but he knew how to instill discipline and patriotism in this group. He drilled them. He found ways to build the esprit de corps of the Guard. Lafayette actually helped design new uniforms for the Guard. They would wear white vests with white leggings, topped with royal blue coats with white lapels and big red collars. These outfits actually cost quite a lot. Each guardsman had to buy his own. So that meant that many members of the guard came from the middle class. But some poorer men patched together uniforms out of clothes from secondhand stores so they could join the guard also. The guard also wore black hats with a tricolor cockade of blue, white, and red. By 1789, the cockade had become the symbol of the revolutionary nation. It appeared everywhere across France, on sashes, on hats, on canes, on watch fobs. On the morning of October 2nd, the people of Paris woke up and heard rumors of a terrible incident out at Versailles. The patriotic press was furious as they described these events. Just the night before, the Royal Bodyguard and the Flanders Regiment had had a raucous banquet a veritable orgy out at the Palace of Versailles. The troops had sung royalist songs, and rumor had it that Louis and Marie Antoinette had been walking around among the troops, and the troops had been praising them. The troops were fired up by music and wine. They had toasted the king, but not the new nation. And maybe worst of all, the troops had trampled on the tricolor cockade. Instead, they donned the white cockade of the French royal family, or they put on the black cockade of Austria, the land of Marie Antoinette. Their actions poured scorn on the revolution. Were they plotting to stage a coup? Anger swept the populace. Journalists fanned the flames. Then, on the morning of October 5th, thousands of women assembled in the streets of Paris. They were armed with brooms and kitchen tools. They went to the city hall and found some pikes. Somehow, they also got a hold of two cannon but they had no ammunition. The women cried out, the men have been cowards. We will take things into our own hands. They said, we need bread. They drafted one man to lead them out to Versailles. Stanislas Maillard was a national guardsman who had been a stormer of the Bastille. The group of six to 8,000 women marched 12 miles out to Versailles. These women came from different social classes, but market women were in the front and it was October in northern France, so you won't be surprised to hear that it was raining. By about 3 o'clock, the women got to Versailles. Some of them swarmed right into the National Assembly. They had on soaking wet clothes and muddy boots, but they sat right down next to the fancily dressed deputies. The mass of Mirabeau allegedly invited one of the prettiest women to come sit on his lap. The deputies were trying to conduct business as usual, but the women shouted down their speeches with cries for bread. The women, some of them took turns sitting in the chair of the president. They imitated the deputies. They pretended to give speeches. They hung their wet clothes on the benches. At one point, some of the women and a few of the men took some wine and meat from the deputies' refreshment stall. They made themselves a little picnic. Some people in the crowd threatened the deputies. They especially singled out some of the monarchiens and clergymen because the marchers knew who the conservatives were. One priest was shocked by these insults. He reported that he locked himself in his room, quote, plunged in sorrow, he said. Another one claimed that he had to fight off a crowd with his umbrella and even knock down four men to make an escape. Now, no deputies were hurt, none were killed, but they were, they were taken aback. One deputy wrote home that these events were even more astonishing than what had happened in July. Let me pause and point out that this was not an ordinary bread riot. The price of bread was in the front of the women's minds. But they were also tuned in to current politics. They knew the king was dragging his feet. They knew the assembly couldn't get the king to agree to the revolutionary decrees. Politics and the economic situation made for a volatile mix. Meanwhile, 
The king was out hunting. He was called back. He debated whether to flee farther from Paris. He was indecisive. He paced the room and muttered to himself, a fugitive king, a fugitive king. Marie Antoinette, she wanted to go. But his ministers convinced the king that his flight would leave open the possibility for his cousin, Philippe, the Duc d'Orléans, to grab the throne. Finally, at about seven that evening, Louis met with a small group of women. According to reports, one 17-year-old girl breathed the word bread and fell into a faint at his feet. King Louis promised the women that he would supply Paris with grain. The delegation returned to the courtyard to their friends, crying, Long live the king! Tomorrow we will have bread! But not everyone in the crowd was so completely convinced. Most people decided to spend the night at Versailles. Meanwhile, the king huddled in another meeting with his advisors. And around, at around 10 that night, he told the National Assembly that he would agree to the August decrees, the abolition of feudalism and the Declaration of the Rights of Man of Citizen. Back in Paris that day, about 20,000 troops of the National Guard had met at the city hall. Lafayette faced a hard decision. His troops wanted to march out to Versailles, but he was afraid to leave Paris open to attack from the royal troops. Finally, he agreed to accompany the militia and go out to the royal palace. A motley crew of civilians followed the National Guard, carrying muskets, pikes, and sticks. It was almost midnight when they finally got to Versailles. Lafayette began to try to convince the king that he had to move to Paris, where Lafayette could protect him and the king could serve his people. But the king made no more decisions that night. Early the next morning, the crowd made its way into the courtyard of Versailles. To this day, no one knows exactly what happened, but it seems that a royal guardsman from inside the palace fired a shot, killing a teenage boy. The crowd became outraged. Now they were led by men, they swarmed into the palace and killed two royal soldiers. Queen Marie Antoinette had a bedchamber near the wings of the palace. Now she fled towards the central part of the palace to reach the king's bedroom. Did the crowd really want to do her harm, or were they just shouting for bread? We'll never know the answer, but it's not surprising that she fled in terror and that she arrived breathless at the king's bedchamber. In the middle of all this uproar, Lafayette made his way back into the palace. He managed to get his National Guardsmen to restore order, and he made his way to the king's rooms. Now Lafayette appeared on the king's balcony. With him was the king, also the queen, and their children. Louis addressed the crowd in the courtyard below. He promised to go to Paris. The love of my good and faithful subjects is most precious to me. The crowd cheered wildly. Lafayette wanted to allay popular anger against the king's guards. So he took off his own tricolor badge from his uniform and gave it to a royal guardsman. Then down in the courtyard, the royal guards began to put on the tricolor badges that the national guardsmen from Paris gave them. Lafayette wanted to calm the people, so he urged Marie Antoinette to appear by herself on the balcony. The queen didn't want to. She said, what, alone on the balcony? Haven't you heard and seen the gestures that have been made against me? Yes, madame, go ahead. Lafayette now appeared again on the balcony alone with Marie Antoinette. A loud murmur went up from the crowd. The mood was uncertain. Lafayette made a gesture of reverence and gallantry. He bowed deeply and kissed the queen's hand. Maybe because of his intuitive action, or maybe because of the queen's calm manner, the people began to shout, Long live the queen! Long live the queen! One nobleman there reported that when the queen stepped back into the chamber, she took up her son in her arms and covered him with kisses and tears. Everyone else began to weep as well. Ever after that, Marie Antoinette hated Lafayette for having subjected her to such a terrible moment. But Lafayette was trying to mediate between the different forces of the revolution, the king, the deputies, the national guards, the royal guards, the journalists, and last but not least, the hungry and politicized people of Paris. Lafayette emerged from the October days as the king's protector, as the peacekeeper of Paris, 
as a major mediating force of the early revolution. Then, that afternoon, a remarkable procession back to Paris took place. Tens of thousands of women, men, and National Guards formed a long column. Several of the men carried the heads of several royal bodyguards on pikes. The National Guardsmen marched ahead of 60 cartloads of grain from the palace. And in the middle of the crowd, there was the royal carriage carrying Louis, Marie Antoinette, and their children. Lafayette rode alongside. The royal bodyguards, the courtiers, and a hundred deputies followed. Then still more citizens and more National Guardsmen. Some members of the crowd had loaves of bread stuck on top of their pikes. The crowd chanted, we are bringing back the baker, the baker's wife, and the baker's boy. It was still raining, but the mood was triumphant. The marchers were filled with hope. Once again, the crowd from the streets of Paris had changed the course of the revolution. What difference did this event make? For one thing, it demonstrated that the power of the revolution lay in this dynamic back and forth between the streets of Paris and the National Assembly. Popular activism and popular violence were always part of the equation. Ordinary Parisians, and this time women above all, they forced the king to quit stalling. They made him agree to the all-important August decrees. Reluctantly, he also agreed to the plans for a single chamber legislature and a suspensive veto for him. Within days, the National Assembly decided to move to Paris also. That meant that now both the king and the assembly were under the watchful eyes of the people of Paris. But the October days also gave the king a new opening. The people gave him the benefit of the doubt. He was filling his role as a father figure who would bring bread to Paris, the people. On October 7th, Marie Antoinette wrote a letter to the Austrian ambassador. She reassured him that all was going well. Don't worry, she wrote. I talk to the people, militiamen, market women. All of them extend their hands to me, and I give them mine. I've personally been very well received. And in fact, Parisians seemed thrilled to have the king and queen in Paris. The market women were especially happy in their loyalty to the king. But the ordinary women of Paris also had a newfound confidence in their ability to take to the streets and bring about political change they became a force to be reckoned with in the months and the years to come. No doubt, Louis XVI could have done more with the goodwill that was offered to him by the Parisians at this moment. The French still loved their king. But what wasn't clear is that the king loved the revolution. How could he? Day by day, it chipped away at his power, it chipped away at his sacred status. Mid-October, he secretly wrote a letter to his cousin, Charles IV, the king of Spain. He asked Charles to save this letter. Here Louis voiced his, quote, his solemn protest against all those acts contrary to royal authority that have been extorted from me by intimidation since the 15th of July of this year. From this point forward, Louis played a double game. On the outside, he appeared to support the revolution. He went along with his reduced constitutional role. But behind the scenes, he pursued a different set of goals aimed at undercutting the revolution. Although Louis said he would preserve the traditional authority of the crown, he didn't actually take much action. He and Marie Antoinette withdrew into the 16th century royal palace of the Tuileries right in the heart of Paris. They hardly ever went out. Of course, they didn't throw all those balls. They didn't have parties and concerts like they had had at Versailles. Marie Antoinette gave up her boxes at the theater. And the population of Paris thought this distance was a mark of coldness and arrogance. Louis no longer went hunting. He made few public appearances. A more decisive king might have seized on the moment of goodwill to take charge of the revolution, but not Louis. He would play almost no role in the assembly's moves to reform France from top to bottom. The October days also had made it much easier for the people of Paris to influence debates in the National Assembly. Now the deputies met in an old riding stable next to the Tuileries Palace, right in the heart of the city. Parisian observers, especially journalists and women, filled the balconies above the deputies. And every day, ordinary citizens marched into the Assembly to voice their opinions. Delegations came from the Paris Commune, the local government. They came from neighborhood associations and political clubs. And there were all kinds of groups that showed up, 
adult illegitimate children lobbying for inheritance rights, revolutionary soldiers who wanted a pay raise, working women of Paris who demanded a limit on the price of sugar. And a few times during the coming decade, the working people of Paris would storm the legislature in anger with pikes in their hands to demand that the deputies do their bidding. It mattered for the revolution that the legislature and the king now conducted business in the middle of the liveliest and most opinionated city in France. For the legislature, the October days and the move to Paris also deepened the divisions between left and right. The very words left and right, as we use them now, come directly from this moment in the revolution. Already, at the meeting hall out at Versailles, people had noticed that the more radical deputies tended to sit on the left and the conservative ones on the right. On the right, after the October days, the conservatives, the group called the Monarchiens, they were devastated, they were depressed. Their power was substantially reduced. 11 of them left the assembly right away and 37 more deputies left in the next two months. The Patriot deputies were happy. One wrote home, one can hope that the aristocracy has been so overwhelmed that it will never rise again. But the strongest group to emerge were the moderates. They often carried the day. The patriots saw that they needed to organize, and Paris would give them new opportunities. Sometime in late November or early December, the leaders of the left rented the library of a Dominican monastery. They formed a new club. They named themselves the Society of the Friends of the Constitution. But soon they had a new nickname based on the place where they met. The French called the Dominican monks Jacobins. The right-wing press had a field day. They made jokes about these leftist anti-clerical deputies meeting in the Jacobin monks library. But the Jacobins, the political group, adopted the name and it stuck. The Jacobin club broadened its membership way beyond the deputies in the National Assembly. Any pro-revolutionary man could join if he was willing and able to pay the annual membership fees of 24 livres. Soon the club had hundreds, hundreds of members, journalists, men of letters, merchants, bankers, liberal noblemen, and priests. Every night, the Jacobin club met to hear speeches and to plan strategy for the next day's session at the National Assembly. It was a male club, but the galleries were full of women of the people. They kept a vigilant eye on the proceedings, and occasionally they asked for permission to speak. Both men and women from the streets of Paris regularly sent delegations to the Jacobin Club, just like they did to the National Assembly. The journalist Desmoulins reported, in the bosom of the Jacobin Club are poured out the grievances of the oppressed. They come to it from every side. The Jacobin Club soon developed a reputation of being the voice of the people. And they also soon developed a network of clubs all across France. The Jacobins weren't the only political club in Paris. The monarchists formed one of their own. And in fact, by 1791, Paris had 50 political clubs, all talking politics, writing petitions, and, and that was just Paris. The Women's March to Versailles mattered. Over a hundred years earlier, the mighty King Louis XIV had moved the court from Paris out to Versailles. Now Lafayette, the National Guard, and the ragtag people of Paris brought the reluctant king, queen, and assembly back to Paris, straight into the vortex of street politics. Without a doubt, the October days changed the dynamic of the revolution. It made it more radical. It empowered Paris. It also marked the last big uprising of 1789, that amazing year, the year that the French now called Year One of Liberty. In the next lecture, we will see how all France becomes wrapped up in politics, for the revolution or against the revolution. We'll watch deputies and citizens set about transforming local politics from the ground up. Lecture 11, Political Apprenticeship in Democracy. In 1790, in the tiny village of Fresse in the southwest of France, 
the 86-year-old baron wasn't happy. He couldn't believe this transformation of his peasants and of the French people everywhere. He'd lost hope. He wrote, I have cherished and I still cherish the people of Fres. But what a sudden change has taken place among them. The former vassals believe themselves to be more powerful than kings. No doubt the baron was exaggerating the new power of his peasants. And he was angry that they refused to pay even the dues that they still owed him. But what had happened in France to make the ordinary citizens feel more powerful than kings, as the baron so dramatically put it? As the deputies worked on their new constitution, they began to introduce other changes, fast and furious. They set out to overhaul religion, taxes, education, marriage, love, family life, language, justice system. Nothing would be left untouched. First question, how do you take a cobbled together kingdom of diverse provinces and wrench it into a unified nation of individual citizens? You redraw the political map, you remake political geography, that should also let you redistribute political power. Second question, how do you invent citizenship and uproot the ancient political power of lords, priests, and royal officials? How do you guarantee that sovereignty, the right to rule, truly rests in the individual citizens of the nation. You decide who the citizens are, and you put everything up for the vote. Let the people decide. Third point for this lecture. These drastic actions of the revolutionaries began to divide France. For some citizens, the new politics produced great excitement and enthusiasm. Political society sprang up everywhere. One exuberant citizen in 1790 said, I am drunk on revolution. But this rapid change also stirred up opposition and it produced deep divisions in France because some people lost out. One woman lamented, the state of public affairs has done us such a wrong. My husband's estate is lost. She was actually packing her bags to flee to the territory that became Ohio or OEO as the French would say. To start with, Let's reconstruct France. As the deputies set out to reform France, several principles guided their work. First, they wanted to disperse and decentralize the power of the central state. Instead, power should rest in the hands of citizens, voting citizens. And second, while they were working to give political voice to citizens all over the place, the deputies also wanted to build a unified France. They wanted to do away with provincial differences. They were inspired by the Enlightenment. They hoped they could make the workings of the state, politics, and the justice system all more rational, more efficient, more scientific. In a nutshell, more modern. Let's take a moment to think about what elements governed the relationship between the state and its regions, the provinces, before the revolution. The key characteristics of the old regime held sway, privilege, tradition, hierarchy, diversity. The different provinces of France each had unique histories, languages, and peoples. Everyone knew that Normans were tight-fisted, Alsatians were blonde, and Provençals liked to kick up their heels and enjoy the sunshine. The provinces paid different amounts of taxes. Civil law codes varied wildly from place to place. As Voltaire said, a man riding across France changes law codes more often than he changes horses. Also, the provinces and their internal areas were governed from above by royal officials who had been appointed, not elected. Some of these officials had bought their bureaucratic offices or they'd inherited them. Now, in the name of merit and greater equality, the decree of August 4th had already done away with buying or inheriting offices. The revolutionaries set out to make the new system rational and unified, and they wanted to give power to the citizens. The first thing they did was to redraw the administrative map. There were 30 odd provinces of France. Some of them were huge and rambling, and some of them were small. Now there would be 83 departments. Each one would be roughly the same size and small enough that a citizen could reach the capital of a department in one day's journey. Brittany, for example, now became five departments. The deputies wanted to follow the scientific bent of the Enlightenment, so they named each department after rivers, mountain ranges, or other natural features. Marquis de Crequy complained, 
They renamed my province after a stream. The revolutionaries did their best to welcome the new system of departments. In one town, during a revolutionary festival, 83 women danced in the procession. Each one was dressed up as a new department. And as administrative units, the departments endure to this very day. But the provinces also persisted. They weren't government units anymore, but they were profound sources of regional and linguistic identity. In a survey about making French into the national language, one respondent offered this poetic objection. To destroy the Catalan language, it would be necessary to destroy the sun, the cool of evening, the type of food, the quality of water, in the end, the whole person. Alongside the new structures, old regional identities lived on. The deputies tried to carry out new logical principles of decentralization, efficiency, and local power. So every department was in turn made up of districts, the districts made up of cantons, the cantons of even smaller communes. These 44,000 communes became the core unit of local power. They should act together to make up the new nation of citizens. Redrawing the map, forging national unity, and building a new power structure, they all sounded good. But they also generated controversy. Competition broke out. Towns vied to become the capitals of districts or departments. A lot was at stake for towns. Where would the new law courts be? Where would the new justices of peace be? The schools and colleges. And the biggest prize of all, where would the administrative capital of the department lie? Will the epic of regeneration for France also be the epic of destruction for this unhappy town? Those words come from the mayor of Villeneuve-le-Roi. It was about to lose the bayage court that it had had since the 12th century. Over a thousand towns sent delegations or petitions to the National Assembly to make their claims to become the seat of a law court or the district administration. They emphasized their central locations or their vibrant markets. They said they had well-trained local lawyers. Some even emphasized their ability to collect taxes. The leaders of Bourgueil, for example, proudly pointed out that they exported 12,000 tubs of butter every week to the province of Poitou. So Bourgueil must be more worthy to be district seat than the lazy town of Langeais further up the Loire River. I vote for Bourgueil with its light and flowery red wine. Local rivalries could be bitter. Marseille was shocked and humiliated when it wasn't chosen as capital for the department. Centrally located, Aix-en-Provence beat them out. To restructure France, the revolutionaries did much more than draw lines on paper. They meant to create a real frame for instituting egalitarian laws across France. Equal taxes, for example. Many people in Brittany emerged angry from this reform because in the newly uniform and egalitarian system, Brittany actually lost the tax advantage that their province had had since the 15th century. When they crafted the new political geography, the deputies also threw out the window this old and unbelievably complicated hodgepodge of royal law courts, ecclesiastical jurisdictions, and administrative units. Royal officials and judges lost their jobs and scrambled to reinvent themselves as fast as they could. Some of them ran for office and got new positions in the new national justice system where judges were elected. These judges were meant to be part of other reforms that aimed to increase access and fairness. The assembly rewrote the penal code. It got rid of the most degrading and inhumane punishments, including torture. Also, they instituted trial by jury for criminal cases. Here, the deputies got their inspiration from their British neighbors. They also set up elected justices of the peace, and these men quickly became local mediators. They offered cheaper and more accessible justice than the old seigneurial courts. Everyone had always hated those seigneurial courts anyway. One grievance list from 1789 called them vampires who suck the last drop of blood from cadavers. And they had been abolished on August 4th. The deputies were optimistic about these reforms. One deputy was excited about the new unity. There is no longer a diversity of nations in the kingdom. There are only the French. Now think about that quote. More was involved here than administrative and judicial structures or even the spatial imagination and regional power. 
The revolutionaries wanted to create a new psychology and new attachments. They didn't say it in so many words, but they were essentially inventing modern nationalism when they rebuilt the state and its power dynamics. Crucially, the deputies were trying to balance national unity by spreading power out. At the heart of reconstructing France stood the principle of local power and voting. The revolutionaries wanted to replace the king's bureaucracy with new men who had been elected by qualified citizens. So what positions would be open for election? The list is amazingly long. Mayors, town council members, local officials, the commanders of National Guard units, all kinds of judges, public prosecutors, department leaders, of course, legislative deputies. Eventually, by 1791, also the officers of the volunteer battalions in the National Army would be elected. The French got so crazy about elections that they decided that even priests and bishops would be put up for the vote. This is an absolutely amazing practice to introduce into a hierarchical religion like Catholicism. In October 1789, the assembly also debated the question which men would get the vote. They didn't really agree. The right wing and moderate deputies had a strong majority. They argued that the vote should only go to men who paid a certain level of taxes. At the time, pretty much everyone believed that only property holders had a stake in politics, a true stake in the nation. Great Britain had complicated property tax or guild requirements for people who wanted to qualify for the vote. And most of the American colonies, now the new states of the US, had similar requirements for voting. There were some radical French deputies who pushed for universal manhood suffrage. And they pointed, without success, to the universalist language of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. Robespierre, who was an emerging leader on the left, he argued passionately, a man is by definition a citizen. No one can take away this right, which is inseparable from his existence here on earth. Henri Grégoire, the priest, remember him, he had supported the rights of the Jews. He agreed with Robespierre. To be a citizen, a man needed only, according to Grégoire, sound judgment and a patriotic heart. In the end, the National Assembly decided to make a distinction between active and passive citizens. Active citizens included all those Frenchmen who paid each year direct taxes equivalent to three days wages. Those men could vote. A man had to pay slightly higher taxes to run for local office and much, much higher taxes to become a national deputy. Camille Desmoulins, the fiery speaker of the July Revolution, he had become a patriot journalist. In his newspaper, he demanded, but what is this much repeated word active citizen supposed to mean? The active citizens are the ones who took the Bastille. They are the ones who cultivate the land. He and others on the left were even more incensed about the tax requirements to run for high office. They loudly pointed out that Jean-Jacques Rousseau, that brilliant enlightenment political theorist, Jean-Jacques Rousseau would not have been able to run for office as a deputy in the new France. This was outrageous and impossible. This system of active and passive citizens excluded all women and about 40% of adult men from the vote. Interestingly, because of tax structures, peasants were more likely to get the vote than were city dwellers. Then, by 1792, the French eliminated qualifications for voting and for running for office. They extended the franchise to all adult men over 21, unless they were servants, vagabonds, or slaves in the colonies. Now, how did elections actually take place? To tell you the truth, it was a clunky hybrid system. It combined elements of traditional communal assemblies with the more modern concept of individual voting and the secret ballot. At the local level, voting took place in a primary assembly. The voters first chose scrutineers to tally the votes and fill out ballots for illiterate citizens. The assembly verified the list of eligible voters. Active citizens put their secret ballots into an urn or a vase on the table. There weren't any officially declared candidates, but the electoral assemblies quickly became a place for contests between the old elites and the new men. In the province of Champagne, for example, the patriots warned if aristocrats disguised by the mask of good citizenship are selected as administrators, next we will lower our heads under the yoke and return to slavery. 
the rhetoric of the revolution was always dramatic. Now it heightened in intensity because the opposing groups began to accuse each other of participating in cabals and intrigues. Sometimes fist fights broke out in the middle of the primary assemblies. Also, voting took time, and it, it took work to learn how to do it. Voting for communal positions was easiest and most immediate. But if you wanted to participate in cantonal or national elections, you usually had to walk to a different town. Citizens often had to stay for several days because it took multiple ballots to fill a local position or maybe to choose the electors who in turn would elect regional leaders and national leaders. One enthusiastic Jacobin in Verdun said to his fellow club members, what is a day, fellow citizens, when the well-being of the state demands the sacrifice? But because of the time that it took, not everyone who got the vote wanted to use it. As one man put it, he didn't have four days to participate in voting. Turnout was highest early in the revolution. In 1790, over half of eligible voters took part. In the countryside, participation reached 80 or 90 percent. But because of the difficulties of voting, turnout soon declined and became very uneven in different parts of France. Over the course of the revolution, one million or more men were elected to public offices. Overall, the system of electoral politics gave unprecedented opportunities to new men. Sometimes older elites won elected offices, but more and more leadership positions went to new men, to merchants and businessmen, doctors, lawyers, well-off peasants, and new landowners. And then when the revolution got more radical, artisans and small shopkeepers swept into office. It was a stunning transfer of power. Whatever its limits, whatever its floundering, the French Revolution introduced a nationwide political apprenticeship in democracy. Let's look at another crucial part of this political apprenticeship, the development of political clubs all across France. These clubs were wildly popular. Enthusiastic citizens founded them in tiny communes and in big cities. Many of them became affiliated with the Jacobin Club of Paris. The Jacobins created a national network of 450 societies by 1791. By 1792, there were about 1,500. But this was not a top-down organization coming from Paris. Jacobinism was not a political machine. Instead, it was a politically passionate communications network. It was invented both in Paris and out in the provinces. Typically, some members of the local bourgeoisie founded a political club, and maybe later, they got affiliation with the Paris Jacobins. Some towns had multiple political societies. Women formed their own clubs in at least 60 towns. Teenagers also claimed that their hearts were, in the words of one of them, burning with the sacred fire of liberty. They initiated their own societies and embraced political causes. In Cherbourg, for example, a club of boys aged 12 to 14, they swore not to serve as altar boys for what they called aristocratic priests. In Beauvais, the Young Patriotic Club called for the abolition of slavery, while youth groups across France drilled to prepare for serving in the National Guard or later on the revolutionary armies. Political clubs met in churches, in monasteries, in granaries, taverns, theaters, Masonic lodges, wherever they could find the space. Usually, they first just set up a rostrum for speakers, and then over time, they decorated their meeting hall with busts or portraits of Rousseau, Voltaire, maybe Louis XVI, maybe a map of the departments of France. And very often, they would put up the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. In these political societies, the new citizens of France learned the working of politics. They elected officers. They wrote bylaws. They kept agendas and minutes of meetings. In some cases, they got involved in local electioneering. No one knew quite how to do democratic politics in the early 1790s, but the French citizens were trying to figure it out. They gave speeches endlessly and flamboyantly. They organized festivals and fraternal banquets, and they sang the hot new revolutionary song, Ça ira, ça ira, which means more or less, it will work out, it'll be fine. But ça ira sounds so much peppier in French. And if you want to hear Edith Piaf singing a cleaned up version, you can go on YouTube. The clubs corresponded excitedly with the Mother Society in Paris and also with the Revolution Society across the Channel in London. They asked British radicals for advice. 
the Jacobin Club of Lille, for example, wrote to the radicals in London, one has to admit it, gentlemen, in politics as well as in philosophy, you are the masters of the entire earth. The Jacobin Clubs paid attention to the intriguing new United States as well. And when Ben Franklin died in 1790, the provincial clubs commemorated his passing. Some of them declared three days of mourning, quote, in honor of the father of liberty in two worlds. The Jacobin Clubs got more and more engaged in national politics. They deluged the National Assembly with petitions on anything, any issue from the local grain trade to the fate of the aristocracy. And from the very beginning, the club members devoured newspapers. The patriotic press and political societies grew up together in revolutionary France. Often, political societies even timed their meetings for the arrival of the postal carriage because it brought newspapers from Paris. As soon as the post got there, one club member would read aloud the words of patriotic journalists. Illiterate citizens from the town would gather around. Newspapers during the revolution all had strong political affiliations. It was not hard to guess the politics of the rag called the friend of the king. One royalist newspaper, the Acts of the Apostles, it became notorious for heaping abuse on the assembly. It called the deputies the buffoons of the great national theater. It said to them, courage, gentlemen, fill your pockets well, plunder, steal, but do it quickly. The people might well demand an accounting from you. In contrast to that, the Universal Monitor tried to strive for impartiality and present the news of the National Assembly and beyond. But most journalists made their living precisely by voicing political opinions. The Feuille Villageoise, the village news sheet, was especially designed to educate the countryside about revolutionary politics. It reached an audience of maybe 250,000 French men and women. It explained the new laws and published opinion pieces alongside offering agricultural advice. The press, political clubs, and elections, these became the three pillars of democratic revolutionary politics. But they also divided France. As the revolutionaries, both the leaders in Paris and the local actors everywhere, as the revolutionaries got bolder, people began to choose sides for and against the revolution. So what about opposition to the revolution? As early as 1790, there were signs of discontent and division all across France. It got clearer and clearer that revolutionary change meant that some individuals, especially the old regime elites, that these individuals were going to lose power and status. And for some individuals, the revolution had a bad economic impact, and not just at the top of the social scale. For example, once the nobles started to leave France, or once they decided they should become less showy in their outfits, Unemployment hit the luxury trades. Wig makers and lace makers fell on hard times. In the spring of 1790, some deputies organized the Monarchist Club in opposition to the Jacobins. The Jacobins weren't working toward the fall of the king, not yet. They were constructing a constitutional monarchy, but they argued that local citizens should vote and hold office around France. The monarchists agreed there should be a constitutional monarchy, but they had a more authoritarian political philosophy. As one deputy wrote to his constituents back home, the people need to be governed and submitted to a protective authority since they do not have the aptitude to direct it. The monarchists wanted to stop the revolution where it stood. They wanted to maintain the sacredness of the king. They wanted to secure power for elites who would share power with the crown. They didn't trust popular participation in politics, but they still tried to engage people. In the provinces, citizens with conservative views also began to organize their own monarchist clubs. Some of them became very adept at local politics. In Perpignan, they swept the municipal elections in November of 1790. In Limoges, the monarchists enraged their Jacobin opponents by lowering their membership fees and conducting public meetings. In some places, the monarchists distributed food. When one National Guardsman berated one of his friends for accepting this food, his sidekick reassured him. I ate monarchist bread, but it came out patriot poop. Sometimes the face-off between the Jacobins and the monarchist clubs could get ugly. Here's what happened in the town of Aix-en-Provence. Every day, the Chevalier Guillemot stood outside the Café Guillon, also known as the Café of the Nobility. Guillemot wore a royalist white cockade. He strutted around 
taunting the pro-revolutionary patriots when they walked by. The Chevalier and his aristocratic pals had just founded a monarchist club. They recruited fellow noblemen and elites, but they also recruited artisans from the luxury trades, a wig maker, a fencing master, some builders of fancy cabinetry. X was also filled with revolutionary patriots who had already founded two powerful local political clubs. The Patriot Club members had gotten sick and tired of the Chevalier's taunts. So on the morning of the 13th of December, 1790, they formed a long column and marched toward the cafe, the Nobles Cafe, singing Saira, the new revolutionary song. The Chevalier Guillermont was watching them. He stepped outside and fired a pistol shot directly into the crowd. And soon things escalated into a riot. More and more shots rang out and several citizens fell down wounded. The radical club members stormed into the cafe, overturning tables and chairs. Local officers of the Royal Army tried to get their soldiers to make order. But the rank and file soldiers were sympathetic to the revolution. They refused to obey their officers. Then the revolutionary club members seized the Chevalier and also another nobleman, the Marquis de la Roquette. That Marquis was really hated in this town, for he was also organizing against the revolution. And just a few months earlier, his noble carriage had rolled over a mother and her two tiny children, killing them on the spot. The angry crowd took the two noblemen to a lamppost and strung them up by their necks. Finally, the National Guard from Marseille marched in and was able to make peace. But the town remained bitterly divided. That violence that broke out between pro and anti-revolutionaries in X that day was not typical of France this early in the revolution. Much more often, the patriots and conservatives faced off in the press or at the ballot box, or sometimes they engaged in a round of threats, shouts, and fisticuffs. But this incident at X shows how deeply France had begun to fissure into opposing camps. Remaking France was an act of hope, but it was also profoundly divisive. At stake was a traditional way of life, pitted against the hope of some citizens for a new system that distributed power and resources much more widely than ever before. The revolutionary leaders weren't shy men. They had bold ideas. Transform the subjects of a king into the citizens of a nation. Give those citizens new power to choose their leaders. Redraw the map of France and slash away layers of history and tradition. In the heady days of 1789-1790, nothing seemed immune to the reformist zeal of the revolutionaries. Not even the Catholic Church, which stood at the heart of tradition and which underpinned the crown. The next lecture turns to the relationship between religion and the revolution. Lecture 12, Religion and the Early Revolution. When the revolutionaries set out to remake France, inevitably, they turned their eyes to the Catholic Church. This was the wealthiest and most powerful institution other than the monarchy. And Catholic teaching underpinned the various notions of hierarchy that the revolutionaries were attacking in the name of equality. But when they began to reform the church, the revolutionaries were playing with fire. Catholicism was definitely embedded in old regime privilege, but its beliefs also offered people hope and comfort. Its rituals gave meaning and rhythm to their days. The parish church stood at the heart of village communities, and the parish priest was often the most respected man in the village. In this lecture, we will ask how the revolutionaries sought to enlist Catholicism in the revolutionary project. We'll ask how they tried to make a national church. As usual, the revolutionaries moved boldly. And in the process, they accidentally divided the country in half into supporters and opponents of the revolution. At first, the revolutionaries naturally tapped into the spiritual and ritual power of Catholicism. For example, in early July 1790, tens of thousands of Parisians from all classes and backgrounds assembled on the Champ de Mars, the big field where the Eiffel Tower stands today. 
They brought pickaxes and shovels and worked night and day to build a giant outdoor amphitheater for the Festival of Federation. Because in a few days, it would be the one-year anniversary of the fall of the Bastille. The mood was festive. Everyone thought the labor was patriotic. It was a celebratory act. According to images circulating at the time, even the king stopped by and joined in. On July 14, 1790, at the Festival of Federation, a military parade of 50,000 National Guardsmen from all 83 departments made their way across Paris to the Champ de Mars. 300,000 spectators flooded onto the grounds. At the center of the huge arena was a new altar of the nation. Here, the Bishop of Autun celebrated a Catholic Mass. His name was Talleyrand, by the way, and we'll hear more from him later. He had donned blue, white, and red vestments in honor of the patriotic occasion. Sixty chaplains of the National Guard joined him in singing the Mass and blessing the troops. Next, General Lafayette led his National Guardsmen in an oath of loyalty to the nation. King Louis XVI then got up and swore to uphold the Constitution. And Marie Antoinette spontaneously stood and lifted her son up for the thousands of people to see. The crowd broke out into cheers. It was pouring rain, but it seemed impossible to dampen people's spirits that day. Patriots just joked that God must be an aristocrat. French people and foreign visitors all sent home ecstatic reports about the mood of jubilation and fraternity. The Festival of Federation was the greatest ceremony of fraternal unity that France had ever seen. It celebrated a moment of great harmony and optimistic devotion to the revolution. Everyone felt swept up in a wave of limitless possibility. And in a remarkable display of patriotic unity, at similar celebrations all across France that day, people swore the oath of loyalty to the nation at the exact same moment at exactly noon. And people were stunned by the power and magic of this simultaneous act, this simultaneous outpouring of fervor for the new France. Now notice that in this festival, the revolution and Catholicism were working together. Across France and towns everywhere, the provincial festivals of federation also included masses. They often had a te deum, the Catholic hymn of praise and thanks for a moment of particular divine favor. People were sure that the revolution had God's blessing. People engaged in Christian charity alongside the revolutionary dancing and drinking at these festivals. In Saint-Malo, the guard handed out bread for the poor. In Aix and in Macon, parish priests sang masses for the souls of the patriots who had died while they were attacking the Bastille. In a jubilant patriotic moment, one Jacobin club adopted an orphan baby boy. They baptized him Marc Bonaventure Liberté. His name combined revolutionary ideology, the ideology of liberty, with the holiness of the saints. In 1790, everyone expected religion and revolution to work together. Why wouldn't they? Catholicism acted as the fundamental cultural glue of France. Almost everyone in France was Catholic. The beliefs and rituals of the church sacralized the monarchy. Catholicism was woven into the fabric of daily life. In Paris alone, there were the steeples of more than 50 churches that you could see on the horizon. There were 100 monasteries inside the city limits of Paris. When the bells of the churches, the convents, or the chapels rang out to mark the hours of the day, ordinary Parisians recognized each unique tone and timbre of the bells. Villagers named their bells after saints, virtues, or local heroes. People took great pride in their bells, their communities, their parish church. Catholic bells chimed the hours of the day, and Catholic feast days marked the changing of the seasons. Through the sacraments, the mass, and frequent holy days, the parish priest guided his parishioners through the sacred rhythms of everyday life, and he helped them with their ties to the divine. In most villages, the parish priest stood at the very core of the community. He blessed the crucial turning points of life, birth, marriage, and death. And then he recorded them in the parish register because he represented both church and state. Lots of times, the parish priest was the only villager who could read. From his pulpit, he announced official news about taxes or poor relief. He represented any kind of contact with the outside world. He might offer advice, he might mediate between village factions, or even practice medicine. One parish priest reported in 1789 that he was a jack of all trades. 
I was an apostle, judge, surgeon, and doctor. But over the course of the 18th century, a few things about religion had changed. It's very hard to measure, measure religious belief, but historians have traced a decline in religious practice in late old regime France, especially in the cities and especially among the urban elites and middle classes. Most people still practice their faith, but some seemed a little less zealous, a little less devoted. Fewer people became priests, monks, or nuns as the century went on. Fewer people in the cities took Easter communion. The sale of devotional manuals and works of theology fell off. Wills showed a decline in religious language. The Enlightenment undoubtedly contributed to this pattern among the urban middle classes. And nowhere was the Enlightenment as anti-clerical, as deeply anti-clerical as in France. For example, in the middle of the 18th century, a physician named La Maitrie had shocked Europe with a book called Man, a Machine. He denied the existence of the soul. He reduced the human body to its physical functions. Most philosophes weren't atheists. Much more often, the Enlightenment philosophes targeted certain practices and beliefs as superstitious. For example, in the Persian letters, Montesquieu talked about the king as a magician. Then he continued, there is another magician even stronger than he called the Pope. He can make the king believe that three are only one, or else that bread is not bread, or that wine is not wine, and a thousand other things of the same kind. And Enlightenment writers routinely satirized the wealth of the church. The Catholic Church owned somewhere between 6 to 10 percent of the land in France. Bishops, monasteries, convents, and cathedral chapters acted as lords over peasants, just like the nobles. Monks were especially attacked because they seemed to own a lot, eat a lot, drink a lot, but they didn't seem to do a lot. They didn't produce much. Many parish priests shared this view. They criticized the hierarchy and the uneven division of wealth among their superiors in the clergy. For many priests, the revolution seemed to offer hope for creating a more just, a more enlightened church. Before 1789, Enlightenment thinkers had also begun to consider the role of the Catholic Church. They wanted to reimagine it according to their Enlightenment principles of usefulness, worldly happiness, and reason. Maybe the clergy should worry less about saving souls in the afterlife, and maybe they should worry more about improving life here on Earth. To sum up, we need to recognize the complicated position of Catholicism on the eve of the revolution. It played a vital and lively role in ordinary people's lives. Its presence was everywhere. In fact, on some gut level, everyone, even skeptics, took it for granted that Catholicism would always be there. But at the same time, religious practice and belief had begun to erode. And the Enlightenment had called the wealth of the clergy, its power, and its teachings into question. The early revolutionaries didn't, they certainly didn't set out to make revolution against the church. Festivals combining religion and revolutionary symbolism popped up everywhere, asking that God bless the revolution. Priests baptized newborns with the sign of the cross and a tricolor cockade. But when the revolution threw everything up for grabs, it's not surprising that the church also came under scrutiny. Enlightenment anti-clericalism paved the way. And the church was so wrapped up with old regime hierarchy and privilege and also with the monarchy. How could the revolutionaries ever remake society and state without touching Catholicism as well? That would have been impossible. So how did the early revolutionary leaders interact with the Catholic Church? What reforms did they propose? And what did the revolution mean for religion? The, the answers to these questions changed fast during the 1790s. But early on, there are a few key points that stand out. First, the revolutionaries essentially agreed with the Enlightenment view that the church should serve society and be useful. And why should it monopolize such tremendous wealth and privilege? And second, the revolutionaries wanted to make sure that the church would also serve the new politics. Why not nationalize the church hierarchy and make the church subordinate to the state? Why not enlist all the clergy in the patriotic project of building the new nation? Already in 1789, the revolutionaries had undercut the position of the church. It was not so sacrosanct and privileged as it had been before. 
On the night of August 4th, for example, the deputies had abolished the tithe along with seigneurial dues. But the church, it still had considerable wealth. At the end of the year, the National Assembly cast about desperately for a way of dealing with the national debt. A new idea popped up for discussion. Didn't the huge wealth of the church belong to the nation? Shouldn't that wealth work for the public good? The nation could nationalize and sell church lands to pay off the public debt. Strikingly, it was a bishop who laid out the proposal, Talleyrand, that flashy bishop of Autun. He announced, great dangers demand equally drastic remedies. His fellow clergy would soon be denouncing him as a veritable minister of Satan. But Talleyrand was in fact a political survivor. He would emerge as a leading diplomat in the later revolution and also under Napoleon. And he was also expressing the widespread enlightenment notion that the church should work for the public good. The right objected strongly to the nationalization of church lands. Their leader was a feisty priest named Abbe Maury. One observer joked one would have taken him for a grenadier disguised as a seminarian. Maury rolled out heavy firepower against Talleyrand's outrageous proposal. But the left carried the day. Church lands were nationalized and put up for sale. And the land acted as backing for a new national paper money that was called the Assigna. Within a year, auctions of church land began to take place all across France. And over the next 10 years, maybe 6 to 7% of the land in France changed hands. Church lands were renamed national lands. Buying them became an opportunity for well-off peasants. But it was especially bourgeois city dwellers who benefited from the sale of church lands. These sales also increased support for the revolution. Because all the people who bought former church lands, they were essentially also buying into the revolutionary nation. They now pretty much had to support the revolution, because if it failed, their new investment would be at risk. Once the revolutionaries had nationalized church lands, they began to criticize the lifestyle of monks and nuns. Voltaire had asked, a monk, what does he do for a living? Nothing, except bind himself by an unbreakable oath to be a slave and a fool, and to live at other people's expense. Now, monks and nuns, especially the contemplative orders, seemed expensive and they seemed useless. Besides, the nation had just taken away the land that they lived off of. Enlightenment authors had playful, playfully portrayed monasteries and convents as hotbeds of erotic action. And once the revolution broke out and censorship was lifted, anti-clerical writers and image makers had a field day. One pamphleteer gleefully published a police list that had been discovered in the bowels of the Bastille. It listed clergymen who had been caught in the brothels in Paris, and images circulated of shame-faced monks caught in the act. Salacious plays and pamphlets depicted young women who were forced into convents against their will and then subjected to the seductive moves of priests, monks, or mother superiors. In February 1790, the revolutionaries abolished monastic vows, and they urged monks and nuns to return to secular life. In the name of utility, they made an exception for those monks and nuns who taught or who cared for the sick or the poor. When the assembly decided to abolish all monasteries and convents, monks were much quicker to leave their monasteries than nuns were to leave their convents. It would be easier for a single man to make his way and find a job. It would be much harder for a woman, suddenly single and maybe not that young. Some monks didn't like this turn of affairs. One librarian monk in Paris said, we're not leaving our order, our order is leaving us. But others cheerfully proclaimed that they had never wanted to take a vow of celibacy anyway, and now they were ready to kick up their heels. Allegedly, one Capuchin monk said, when he heard the news, he said, excellent, long live Jesus, the king, and the revolution. Next, the assembly conducted a sweeping reorganization of the Catholic Church in France. They wanted to create a national church that would support the nation and be tied to the nation. They tried to enact a new enlightenment vision of church-state relations. In this view, yes, the church could help people with salvation, but above all, it should help society, it should serve society and offer moral glue and guidance here on this earth. And it didn't need those huge sums of wealth and its leaders should not live in ostentatious luxury. 
the assembly passed a major reform that was called the civil constitution of the clergy. Now the state would pay the salaries of all clergymen, and they became civil servants. Now, for many lower-level priests, this new system actually meant a raise. But for bishops, who were all from aristocratic background, it always meant a pay cut. During the debate, Maximilien Robespierre made a more radical proposal. Why shouldn't priests do away with their vows of celibacy and become husbands and fathers? When he said that, loud murmurs of unease rose in the assembly, and the president quickly cut off the debate. But Robespierre foreshadowed a future direction as he often did in the early revolution. A few years later, thousands of French priests got married. And most controversial of all was a decision that active citizens would now elect the clergy. In the new system, the electoral assemblies of every department would choose priests and bishops. This kind of challenge to the authority of the church hierarchy took lots of people aback. It meant that Protestants, Jews, or non-believers would have a say in electing Catholic priests. But the great order Mirabeau argued merrily that religion belonged to everybody, and elections were the order of the day. But here's the real kicker. Here's the fateful decision that divided France. A few months later, the National Assembly required all the clergy in France to take an oath of loyalty. An oath, quote, to the nation, the law, and the king. For many deputies in the National Assembly, this oath made logical sense. After all, other civil servants of the French state, like health officers and deputies, they all took an oath of loyalty. All across France in the winter of 1791, priests faced the agonizing decision of whether or not they should take the oath. Louis XVI, as usual, he dithered a bit. Then he had agreed to the oath and the civil constitution. At first, the Pope said nothing. But by March 1791, he condemned the oath and warned priests against the, quote, insidious voices of this secular sect. His condemnation produced a flurry of retractions of the oath. Lots of times, priests felt torn. For some, it became an impossible dilemma. Should they remain loyal to the revolution in France or to God and the Pope? One parish priest wrote, the uncertainties don't give me a moment's rest day or night. Sleep has fled. After wrestling with their consciences, a little more than half of the parish priests took the oath. But many of them added qualifications. One priest, Father Martinon, wrote 30 pages of qualifications. Often priests agreed to support the nation, but they also proclaimed their spiritual loyalty to a higher power. And only seven bishops took the oath. About half the priests in France took the oath. Those men became known as the constitutional clergy, or jurors. Those who refused the oath came to be called non-jurors, or refractory clergy. Constitutional clergy, men who took the oath, tended to already see themselves as citizen priests, as servants of the people. On the other hand, non-jurors tended to see themselves as servants of God. These men hated the revolutionary reforms. They thought it was ridiculous to elect priests, demand an oath of loyalty, and nationalize church land. They thought those moves trampled on the spiritual and traditional power of the church. When they made this decision, priests tried to get the opinions of their parishioners. And lay people didn't hesitate to voice their opinions. Popular reaction to the oath divided communities, and it divided France. In some areas, citizens saw the oath as an assault on their community and an attack on their traditional religious beliefs. But in other cases, pro-revolutionary citizens believed that the priests who had refused to take the oath were counter-revolutionaries. Popular pressure could be dramatic. It could even be violent. The rector of one parish in the West complained that his parishioners had hurled stones at him when he tried to take the oath, even though he had been their priest for 40 years. In Alsace, Another oath-taking priest complained that his parishioners no longer respected him. They no longer sent their kids to his catechism classes. They saw him as a heretic. But popular opinion could go the other way. At Saint-Sulpice in Paris, when the priest refused to take the oath, parishioners rushed toward the altar in an uproar. Church officials and the National Guard helped the priest escape out the back. 
in the parish of St. Paul, the priest avoided this kind of scene. He just left a note that he couldn't take the vow, and then he slipped out of town in the middle of the night. In many parts of France, women became especially engaged in the politics of the oath. In some towns, women strongly supported the constitutional clergymen. The ladies of saint marcelin for example, outfitted themselves in white dresses with tricolored ribbons, and they took the oath themselves right by the side of the priest. And Elizabeth Lay wrote to the Jacobin Club of Bordeaux and suggested that France sell the non-juring clergy to the King of Morocco. This king buys all the scoundrels of Europe. We couldn't sell better merchandise. But more often, women actually took the lead in demonstrating against the oath and against constitutional priests. French women had a long tradition of demonstrating or rioting to protect the community, and authorities were less likely to arrest women rioters than male rioters. Also, women actually tended to practice their faith at higher rates than men did. Now, the clergy, they became deeply divided on the issue. Nuns who were teachers or nurses were asked to take the oath. Nursing nuns most often refused while teachers agreed. But groups of nuns were also divided. Here's what Mother Sainte Félicité had to say to a young nun, her former novice, when she took the oath. You have prostituted yourself before the demon of liberty and the furies of equality. Oh, unfortunate child, how you make my tears flow. So let me sum up. The oath split, split France in half. The deputies had made a mistake. In half of France, priests agreed to take the oath, and lay people in those areas tended to support the revolution. In the other half, priests refused the oath, and in coming years, these parishioners often also rejected the revolution. In the southeast, in most of the center, and the regions around Paris, the majority of priests became constitutional clergymen. But in the northeast, in the west, and parts of the southwest, and in the southern Massif Central, rates of oath-taking were much, much lower. By suddenly demanding that priests declare for or against the revolution, the oath created a lasting political and religious divide. In fact, here's a striking point about modern France. The regions of low oath-taking and counter-revolutionary sentiment, the west of France, for example, also tended over the next two centuries to vote more conservatively in politics. And in these same regions, the lay people maintained higher levels of religious practice all the way into the 19th and 20th centuries. In parishes with non-juring clergymen, a new priest had to be found. His parishioners often treated the new priest as an outsider, a usurper. A usurper. Outgoing non-juring priests often stirred up their flock against the new constitutional clergymen. In the Vendée, a region in western France, where guerrilla war would later break out against the revolution, there was one parish priest who refused the oath. And he said, whoever replaces me will be an intruder, a thief. Do not give him your trust and do not receive the sacraments from him. Non-juring priests often stayed in the area. At first, the law allowed them to continue to say mass. And sometimes they could even share the church with the constitutional priest. Lots of parishioners weren't sure what to do. Some of them seem to have attended both the non-juring and the constitutional services in 1790-91. But bitterness over the oath and the priest's choices divided many communities. Many non-jurors became local spiritual heroes. They held clandestine masses in fields or barns, even after they were outlawed in 1792. Their former parishioners counted on them to perform the sacraments. And some people thought that a baptism or marriage that had been performed by a constitutional priest would not really be valid. It would not bring grace. On the other side, plenty of constitutional clergymen and laity believed that the revolution was God's work. Some hoped that the new constitutional church could help the revolution, help it move closer to the egalitarian ideals of primitive Christianity. As more than one radical priest pointed out, Citizen Jesus no doubt would have backed the revolution. He would have liked its egalitarian creed and its attack on the wealth and luxury of the high clergy and the rich. The Jacobins and other revolutionaries championed the constitutional clergy. They welcomed the bishops who were newly elected. They welcomed them with fervor and festivity. The constitutional church had high hopes for success in France. Maybe, at least in those areas where priests took the oath and supported the revolution, 
Maybe in those areas, Catholicism and revolutionary ideology could work together. But already in 1791, there were other signs besides the oath of the revolution moving away from Catholicism. In July 1791, a procession wound through the streets of Paris to bring Voltaire's remains to the Pantheon and bury him in the new national mausoleum. That procession and burial had no religious element, no priest, no blessing, no references to a Catholic God. Maybe this secularism was appropriate for honoring such an anti-clerical forerunner to the revolution. But this event gives us a hint of the direction that the revolution would turn. It would turn towards inventing an alternative secular culture. It would turn towards creating a whole set of festivals and beliefs to celebrate revolutionary ideals and the nation without the help of Catholicism at all. The French Revolution was remarkable for touching every aspect of society and politics. In the next lecture, we'll explore how the early revolutionaries began to address the question of slavery and the rights of free people of color in the colonies. Lecture 13, The Revolution and the Colonies. In the fall of 1789, Julien Raymond and Vincent Auger plotted strategy with 30 other men to petition the National Assembly and try to get them to end racist laws. They were rich men. Raymond owned about 100 slaves on a large plantation in the French colony of Saint-Domingue, the territory that is now called Haiti. And Auger was a wealthy merchant and landlord in the same colony. But when the day came to appear before the National Assembly, the two men had to hire a French lawyer to lay out their petition, because Raymond and Auger each had an African grandparent. In Saint-Domingue, they counted as free people of color. They invoked the Declaration of the Rights of Man, to demand full citizenship and political representation. Their white lawyer proclaimed, born citizens and free, they live as foreigners in their own homeland. They find themselves enslaved even in their liberty. The president of the assembly mumbled a few encouraging words and passed the issue off to a committee. But as we'll see, that was not the end of the story. It was inevitable that the revolution in France would stir up questions for the colonies especially the wealthy sugar islands of the Caribbean. In this lecture, we'll begin to address a huge issue. Would the revolution abolish the slave trade or even abolish slavery itself? This question would take five years to answer. And another question, would the French Revolution, with its forceful declaration of the rights of man and citizen, grant full rights to people of color in the colonies? Men like Vincent Auger and Julien Romain worked strongly for this goal. For French abolitionists, the revolution seemed to provide an opening. Everything was up for grabs. Why not slavery as well? In 1788, right before the revolution, French abolitionists had just organized a new society. They imitated their English colleagues. First, they wanted to end the slave trade and then gradually abolish slavery itself. Ending the trade first might be more politically possible than just flat out doing away with the practice of slavery. This new society of the Friends of Blacks had only a few hundred members. It cost a lot to join, and France did not yet have a broad-based abolitionist movement the way they did in England. But the founders and leading members of the Friends of Blacks quickly became revolutionary activists. Some of them we've already met in other roles. The nobleman Mirabeau, that thundering orator of the earliest states general, and Henri Grégoire, the patriot priest who had argued fervently for the rights of the Jews, and General Lafayette, the head of the National Guard, who was secretly sponsoring a slave emancipation experiment in French Guiana. Now, with the calling of the Estates General, the Society of the Friends of Blacks kicked into high gear. They circulated a pamphlet to every single district electing deputies. The Enlightenment philosophe Condorcet had written it. The pamphlet declared, Reducing a man to slavery, buying him, selling him, keeping him in servitude, these are truly crimes, and crimes worse than theft. Condorcet then laid out a program for abolishing the slave trade. 
he proposed gradually freeing the slaves over a period of seven years. He thought that slaves needed time to learn how to handle the responsibility of freedom. He envisioned a whole system of small cultivators who would produce sugarcane or coffee for sale to planter manufacturers. At the beginning, it looked like the Society of the Friends of Blacks might meet with some success. Almost 50 of the 500 district level grievance lists condemned slavery or the slave trade. And when the Estates General opened, the King's finance minister, Necker, even urged the assembly to condemn the harsh treatment of African slaves. They are men like us in their thoughts and above all, in their capacity to suffer. But the Friends of Blacks had a hard time getting anywhere with their program against slavery and the slave trade. They faced massive opposition in 1789. This was because Saint-Domingue and the other colonies brought so much wealth to France. The commercial boom in sugar, coffee, and other colonial goods had given a huge boost to the 18th century French economy. And many leading revolutionaries were from French port cities like Bordeaux and Nantes. They had gotten rich from colonial trade and manufacturing. A member of the Chamber of Commerce in Nantes put it this way, these colonies are France's destiny. Consider the 60 million livres of profit from their exports each year. Our eternal rival Britain smiles at our misfortunes and foresees their own worldwide domination. Supporters of slavery pointed out that disrupting the plantation system could be economically disastrous for France in the global race with Great Britain. And the white planters of Saint-Domingue, they also got organized for the Estates General. It wasn't clear how the colonies would be represented in this traditional French body. But groups of white planters met, they elected deputies, and they drew up their grievance lists in 1789. Of course, they prevented free men of color from even participating, even rich free men of color. Then the planters sent 17 deputies to Paris uninvited. Their presence immediately created a stir. It instantly produced a debate over how the colonies should be represented. How many deputies should they have? The planters argued that the 600,000 slaves of the Caribbean counted as part of the population, so the colonies should have lots of representatives. Interestingly, the American authors of the Constitution had recently debated this exact same question. Famously, they decided to count each slave as three-fifths of a man. In the French case, this issue of representing the colonies and counting the slaves gave the abolitionists their first opening. The abolitionist Mirabeau lashed out in his booming voice against the hypocrisy of counting slaves to decide representation while they were still treating them as property. Either the slaves are men or they are not. If they are men, free them and make them eligible for seats. And if they are not men, have we, in apportioning deputies according to the population of France, counted the number of our horses and mules? This argument was powerful. The National Assembly worked out a compromise. They agreed to admit six deputies from Saint-Domingue and 17 from all the French colonies taken together. In this instance, the abolitionist lobby suffered their first of several defeats during the early years of the revolution. As it turned out, early in the revolution, the Friends of Blacks didn't even manage to get a full debate of the slave trade onto the assembly floor. The lobby in favor of slavery was extremely forceful. It was well organized. And lots of bourgeois revolutionaries had made their money from colonial commerce. As many as 150 deputies even had property in the colonies. White colonists and port merchants formed their own club. It was called the Club Masiak. It aimed at defending the colonial system. This club became a very effective lobbying group that aimed to defend the rights of plant French planters and defend the whole system of slavery. The Club Masiak didn't hesitate to use whatever means they could find to defend their cause, both inside and outside the assembly. For example, at one point, they attacked a new play opening in December at the Comédie Française. The play was called The Slavery of Blacks, or The Lucky Shipwreck. This play had been written by the feisty and eccentric playwright Olympe de Gouge. We'll be meeting her again in the next lecture. In the opening act of the play, a white French couple, Valère and Sophie, are shipwrecked on their way to the New World. Luckily, Zamor, who's a slave, he saves them from drowning. But Zamor is actually running for his life because he accidentally killed the colonial official who was attempting to abuse his wife. In the end, Sophie, the French woman, 
discovers that the governor of the nearby Sugar Island is in fact her father. She manages to convince him to give amnesty to Zamor, the slave. So the play ends happily. But it also has a political message. Zamor declares, why do the Europeans have such an advantage over us, poor slaves? We are humans as they are. Why is there such a difference between their race and ours? Before the play opened, anti-abolitionists published anonymous threats to Olympe de Gouges. They satirically challenged the Friends of Blacks to a duel. And they called on pro-slavery forces to boo the play. On opening night, the theater was tumultuous. The club Masiak sent hecklers who faced off against abolitionists in the pit. The play was barely audible amidst all this noise. According to one newspaper, quote, so heated was the atmosphere that one would have thought that the great cause of slavery and the freedom of blacks was to be decided on the spot. The conservative press trashed the play. The critics ranted, it was written by a woman. It made a black murderer into a hero. The mayor of Paris warned that this incendiary play could provoke an uprising in the colonies. And in three days, the play was shut down, a victory for anti-abolitionist forces. Three years later, when the revolution got more radical, the play reopened to sell out crowds, and it was performed 80 times. In the fall and winter of 1789, white planters also worried about the impact of the revolution on the colonies. Could it possibly stir up slave revolt? It could, and it would, but not yet. We'll look at the biggest slave revolt in history in a later lecture. On the Sugar Islands, the French Revolution opened up another issue. Did the rights guaranteed by the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen apply to free people of color? Unlike slaves, they were citizens after all. In Saint-Domingue, free men of color had tried again and again to participate in political assemblies. Almost everywhere in Saint-Domingue, the whites succeeded in blocking their entry into the assemblies. Sometimes the contest was violent. In one town, the locals accused an older white man of petitioning on behalf of the free people of color. The local magistrates threw him into prison, but a crowd grabbed him and then they lynched him. In another case, a wealthy free man of color was actually tied to a horse and dragged through the streets by angry whites. He just barely escaped with his life. Free people of color began to arm themselves as the issue got hotter and hotter. This core question, the rights of free people of color, it would provoke plenty of debate back in the National Assembly. Didn't the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen apply to free people of color, just as it eventually would to Jews and Protestants? Before we explore this revolutionary debate, let me tell you a bit more about the position of free people of color in the French colonies. Some had only African ancestry, but most were mulatto of mixed African and European descent. Some of them were former slaves who had somehow bought their freedom. Others were the children of white planter fathers and enslaved African mothers. They had been freed by their fathers. The more established free people of color actually came from mixed wheat raised families. These families had lived on the island since the 1600s, long before the plantation system even got going. Now, in Saint-Domingue, there were almost as many free people of color as there were free whites. That was about 25,000 free people of color and about 30,000 whites living alongside 500,000 enslaved Africans. Some people of color had a lot of wealth and power, like Julien Raymond, the richest free people of color were plantation owners, and they owned slaves themselves. In fact, free people of color owned one-third of the plantations and one-quarter of the slaves on Saint-Domingue. But most of them were much poorer. They worked as day laborers, as sailors, maybe they were small-scale farmers or artisans. Now, in the first half of the 18th century, the lines of race in the free population were not tightly drawn. Legal documents hardly ever mentioned race. Free people of color could work as doctors. They could be militia commanders. Free women of color, especially from rich families, they intermarried with white immigrant men who were hoping to make their fortunes. For example, Julien Raymond from the beginning of the lecture, his father was a white immigrant from the Languedoc in France. Back in 1726, he'd married the mixed race daughter of a free family of indigo planters who were way richer than he was. 
But beginning in the 1760s, the white leaders of the colony increasingly instituted laws and practices that discriminated against the free people of color. New laws prevented them from taking up various occupations like practicing law or medicine. They couldn't work for the royal bureaucracy. Another French law demanded that they change their names so that they'd sound more African and less French. On the eve of the revolution, free people of color couldn't ride in carriages, they couldn't own certain kinds of furniture or go to the biggest theater. Women of color couldn't wear the same fancy clothing, jewelry, or hairstyles as white women. Julien Raymond angrily reported that white officials waited for respectable women of color to come out of church after mass. Then the officials would humiliate them by demanding that they strip off any elegant clothing. As Raymond put it, quote, rendering them almost naked in the public square. In addition, the government made a new law that put a higher tax on freeing a slave than had ever existed before. Now, why did Saint-Domingue suddenly establish additional policies of racial discrimination? After the loss of New France in 1763, at the end of the Seven Years' War, the Caribbean islands became the main destination for French immigrants trying to make their fortune. Economic competition increased, and poor white men resented the wealth and stature of some free people of color. And at the same time, ships brought more and more enslaved Africans to Saint-Domingue. And new, allegedly scientific theories of racial difference began to come from the mainland. To the leaders of the colony, they thought that if they drew tighter lines of racial difference and hierarchy, that'd be a good way to keep the social order. But the outbreak of revolution in France quickly showed just how fragile that order actually was. When Mirabeau warned the Saint-Domingue planters in 1789 that they, quote, slept at the foot of Vesuvius, he was predicting the explosive danger of slave revolt. But the revolution widened other gaps in colonial society between rich whites and poor whites, between whites and free people of color. In a nutshell, the revolution heightened the new ideology of equal rights and it also hardened the old colonial traditions of racial hierarchy. Ideas about rights and racial hierarchy were bound to clash. Let me return to the story at the opening of this lecture. Julien Raymond and Vincent Auger, who presented their case before the National Assembly. First, they tried to convince their white colleagues at the Club Massiac to recognize the rights of wealthy free people of color. Raymond and Auger, they didn't want to abolish slavery. In fact, they even tried to convince the white planters and merchants that free planters of color would actually make good allies against a slave revolt. Auger spoke with real passion about the rights of free people of color. Is liberty for all men? I believe so. Must it be given to all men? Again, I believe so. But we can guess what happened. The Club Massiac refused the proposals from Auger and Raymond. Then the free people of color began to organize in Paris. They had a group who were mostly artisans and domestics. They called themselves the Society of American Colonists. By calling themselves Americans, they skirted the racial question of whether they were more African or more European. They presented themselves as new men, as men who were both French and Creole. Creole means born in the new world. These free men of color worked together with the Society of the Friends of Blacks. Since that society was making no headway on abolishing the slave trade, they turned their full attention to the question of rights for free people of color. Henri Grégoire, the revolutionary priest from Alsace, had worked mainly on Jewish rights, but he was also a member of the Friends of Blacks. And now he published a pamphlet. He demanded that the assembly grant five deputies to represent free people of color. Just like he'd exposed anti-Semitism, Gregoire indicted the humiliating treatment of free people of color on the Sugar Islands. And unlike Raymond and Auger, Gregoire didn't hesitate to talk about the question of slavery. He predicted slave revolt. He proclaimed, the cry of liberty resounds in the two worlds. It requires only an Othello, a Padre Jean, to awaken in the souls of the blacks the sentiment of their inalienable rights. Padre Jean had led a slave revolt back in the 17th century. Grégoire also criticized the fact that white male planters engaged in illicit sex with enslaved women and then denied rights to their very own children. 
A fellow pamphleteer also denounced white planters. It called them sexual predators and neglectful fathers. Is it the nature of these lands that each plantation be a harem and that all women of color be mistresses of Monsieur the whites? Most deputies in the National Assembly didn't share Gregoire's radical views, but they recognized that they had to decide whether their foundational ideology of the rights of man applied to the colonies. So the Colonial Committee took up this question. The lawyer, the deputy who led the Colonial Committee, was named Antoine Barnave. Later on, he admitted that slavery was, as he put it, a barbarous regime, but a necessary one. He and his committee emphasized the economic importance of the plantation system for producing riches for France. If France disrupted the internal practices of the French colonies in any way, it might give the edge to Britain in the global competition for wealth. The committee didn't have any abolitionist members. None of them were defenders of either slaves or free people of color. Barnov and his committee, they also worried that the white planter elites of Saint-Domingue might even try to break away from France if the revolutionaries instituted policies that disrupted the traditional hierarchies in the Sugar Islands. But what about that Declaration of the Rights of Man? Didn't it apply in the colonies? After all, they were part of France. Barnov and his committee solved this problem by deciding that the French Constitution did not apply to the colonies. Barnov argued against the universalist principles of the rights of man. He said, the difference in places, mores, climates, and products seems to us to require a difference in laws. The assembly agreed that France should respect colonial property and local customs in the Caribbean. When they exempted the colonies from the Constitution, the assembly also exempted them from the Declaration of Rights. That meant that the assembly also let the colonies themselves decide how to conduct elections. The assembly sidestepped the whole question of race and the rights of free people of color. Soon after this, in 1790, the electoral assemblies in Saint-Domingue deliberately blocked free people of color from participating as citizens. In the Caribbean town of Saint-Marc, the electoral assembly announced flat out that they would never give political power, quote, to a bastard and degenerate race. In the meantime, Vincent Auger had gotten tired of waiting for the revolutionaries to follow up on their own rights ideology and improve the situation for free people of color. He'd gotten tired of the legislative process, and he decided to take more direct action. In July 1790, he went back to Saint-Domingue by way of London and South Carolina. On the way, maybe in the US, he somehow managed to get arms. And when he got back home to Saint-Domingue, he tried to convince the colonial authorities to let free people of color vote. He wrote to the authorities and pointed out parallels to the third estate in France. He demanded, were the nobles and clergy consulted in redressing the 1,001 abuses that existed in France? When that peaceful attempt failed, he began to organize armed resistance in October 1790. He gathered together an army of about 300 free people of color. He deliberately did not recruit any slaves. Auger took on a military identity. In fact, free people of color had a long tradition of serving in the colonial militia in Saint-Domingue. To be in the militia was a mark of honor for them. It legitimized their claim that they had earned citizenship also. Hundreds of them had volunteered to fight in the American Revolution at the side of the French troops. Now Auger created a militia of his own. He and this makeshift army managed to occupy the town of Grand Riviere. But before long, they were outnumbered by royal troops. They had to escape across the Spanish border into the next door colony of Santo Domingo, now known as the Dominican Republic. Early in 1791, Auger and his companions were extradited and hauled back to Cap Francais, the commercial capital of Saint-Domingue. Auger and 23 of his followers were put to death, hanged or broken on the wheel in the main square of Cap Francais. The authorities sentenced another 13 men of color to a lifetime of slavery rowing in the royal galleys. Back in France, many revolutionaries were shocked by Auger's treatment. In fact, this harsh behavior by the colonial authorities toward Auger's resistance made it harder for revolutionary leaders to ignore the issue of rights for free people of color. Jacques-Pierre Brissot was the founder of the Society of the Friends of Blacks. He also ran a newspaper called The French Patriot. 
His paper loudly expressed its support for free people of color. The French Patriot circulated widely among provincial Jacobins. Out in the provinces, Jacobin clubs, initially, they just ignored the issue of the colonies. But by the spring of 1791, some of them began to lobby the National Assembly to, quote, break the chains of the mulattoes. Raymond, meanwhile, he'd stayed in Paris. He kept on pursuing the cause of free people of color. From 1789 on, he published 16 pamphlets on colonial affairs. And he also encouraged his, his fellow freedmen of color to write to the editors of revolutionary newspapers for their cause. Raymond had become a very well-known political figure. One political cartoon depicted him reaching toward the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, but Barnav, in the image, the chair of the National Assembly's Colonial Committee, Barnav is holding Raymond away from the Declaration. Also in this caricature, a black woman and two mixed-race children are kneeling below. They beg their white planter father to speak on their behalf. He responds, alas, I would if I could only make a 42% profit. Jacobin leaders in the National Assembly denounced racial discrimination. They declared that white planters had created what they called an aristocracy of the skin. And finally, in May 1791, the Assembly voted to grant full citizenship rights and the vote to free men of color if they were born of two free parents. This last point, two free parents, that stipulation excluded most free men of color from the vote because many of them were the sons of enslaved mothers, and in some cases, both of their parents had been slaves. This issue was so contentious that in the next year, the deputies would take away that right, suspending it, and then returning it, broadening it to spread to all free people of color. But the new laws on behalf of free people of color actually never took full effect. The royal governor reported that it would be impossible to enforce the decree. Angry white colonists refused to comply. Some of them threatened to secede from France and align their colony with Great Britain. Around this time, the wife of the slave-owning Marquis de Rouvray wrote to a friend. She denounced the stupid and inept deputies, as she called them. She begged the slave owners of the Americas to put an end to this, quote, contagion of liberty. Instead, she consoled herself with great expectations for an excellent crop of sugarcane and coffee. In July 1791, she pointed out in her letter, the cane is magnificent. Within a month, thousands of enslaved people in Saint-Domingue rose up against their masters. They set that lovely sugarcane on fire. They ignited the largest slave revolt in history. That revolt would eventually convince the French revolutionaries to abolish slavery. Revolution by the slaves on Saint-Domingue would also wrench the colony out of the French Empire. It would lead to the founding of the modern nation of Haiti. But those are stories for later lectures. In the next lecture, we'll turn to the question of women's public political activism and their quest for rights in the early revolution. Lecture 14. Women's Rights in the Early Revolution. Mothers, daughters, sisters demand to be constituted into a national assembly. Woman is born free and lives equal to man in rights. These words come from the Declaration of the Rights of Woman and Citizen. It was written by Olympe de Gouges in 1791. She modeled her pamphlet on the official Declaration of the Rights of Man. She urged revolutionary leaders to live up to their foundational ideology of natural rights and popular sovereignty. The French Revolution played a crucial role in the long quest for women's equality. In the old regime, no one really imagined women as a political category. Sure, there were individual women, like a queen or maybe an Enlightenment salonier, who wielded political power. But until the French Revolution, virtually no one in France thought that women as a group should have political voice and power as citizens. Now, in the 1790s, that idea burst onto the scene. Why? How does it come up? Part of the answer lies, of course, in the tremendous power of rights ideology itself to raise the same questions about different groups. Who counts as a citizen? What does universal rights mean? But there's another 
important context for debates on women's rights, and that's women's public activism during the revolution. In the 1790s, all kinds of women participated in revolutionary politics everywhere, in the press, in political clubs, in riots, in the galleries of the assembly, in demonstrations, in festivals. And women also took part in politics inside their households as revolutionary wives and mothers. Lots of the time, women's political acts didn't focus specifically on women's rights, but their very public presence helped to raise the question of just what the revolution would do for women. In this lecture, we'll ask, how did women take part in the public politics of the early revolution? Then we'll look at two key feminists, one man and one woman. We'll see how they framed their demands for women's full political rights. So what were the venues of women's revolutionary activism? Where do we find them in action? Well, for one thing, a new wave of female writers rushed into print. As you know from earlier lectures, the revolution let loose an explosion of publishing. Censorship had ended, and the high pitch of politics and excitement meant that booksellers and street vendors had no trouble selling pamphlets, broadsheets, and newspapers. More than ever before, authors, male authors, female authors, they could earn a living from their pens. And more than ever before, people felt like they had something to say about public affairs, and they felt they had a right to say it. Now, of course, the old regime had female authors, especially novelists. Sometimes they signed their name, sometimes they stayed anonymous. But during the revolution, the number of women in print skyrocketed. What did they write about? Everything. But above all, politics. Here are a few titles of works by women. The Crimes of the Nobility and the Feudal Regime, a play in five acts. The Triumph of Wise Philosophy, or the True Politics of Women. How to Make More Economical Use of Grain from the New Harvest. A Plan for Educating Poor Young Women Under the Protection of the Nation. All these intriguing and varied titles, I could just go on listing, and I can't resist adding just one more optimistic outpouring from one woman. This is what she called her pamphlet. Proposition by a woman citizen for remedying all the calamities overtaking France for reestablishing order in the administration and regaining the trust needed to make harmony reign in the hearts of all the French. If only the revolutionaries had listened to her before they got to the terror. Women wrote about any topic under the sun, but many female authors made explicit demands for rights. They were concerned with all kinds of women's issues, like education, prostitution, poverty. They focused on various family matters, things like divorce, unfair inheritance law, and what they called marital despotism, or men's authority in the household. But most women couldn't write. More often, women voiced their opinions just by taking to the streets. Women marchers, demonstrators, and rioters stride repeatedly into the revolution and into this course. As we saw with the October days, the march out to Versailles, women changed the course of the revolution by bringing the king, the queen, and the assembly back to Paris. Men and women both recognized that women had a special right to speak out about certain issues, especially religion and bread or anything that had to do with food. Now, don't dismiss bread and religion as some set aside women's domain. During the revolution, everyone knew that those two issues cut right to the heart of crucial political questions, the economic survival of the people and the cultural remaking of France. Sometimes these issues, economics and religion, turned some women and their families into die-hard opponents of the revolution. But among revolutionaries, some argued that women's support for the revolution had earned them greater rights. Every week, one left-wing newspaper called The Letters of Mother Duchenne presented the opinions of a fictional working-class woman. She was married to an even noisier Father Duchenne. She used colorful slang and lots of swear words. She praised French women for being, quote, ready to spill their blood for liberty. They can handle the spinning distaff and the sword with equal success. She talked about women's militant role in the October days, the storming of the Bastille and other uprisings. She proclaimed that men in all revolutions wanted women by their sides and, quote, never regarded them as zeros. Women aren't doomed, damn it, to be geese. Most riots and demonstrations led by women didn't focus 
on women's political rights. But women's engagement with other political issues could fuel explicit demands for women's rights. For example, in the spring of 1792, when France was just about to go to war with Austria, Parisian women organized a series of armed marches to the assembly. In one demonstration, the chocolate maker, Pauline Léon, led a delegation of women into the National Assembly. They read a petition that had been signed by 319 women. It demanded the right to bear arms. For men, bearing arms was a critical aspect of their new citizenship. The women's petition said, we wish only to defend ourselves the same as you. You cannot refuse us unless you pretend that the Declaration of Rights doesn't apply to women and that they should let their throats be cut like lambs. They reminded the deputies about the October days, and then they listed their arms of choice, pikes, pistols, and sabers, and muskets for those who are strong enough to use them. And then they added politely, within police regulations. The feisty Pauline Léon was directly engaged in founding political clubs for women. Most Jacobin men's clubs didn't allow women to become official members, but dozens of co-ed fraternal societies were formed and women founded their own political clubs in over 60 towns in France. Some of these clubs were auxiliaries to men's clubs. One group of women made their sidekick origins clear. They called themselves the Society of the Friends of the True Friends of the Constitution, and the True Friends were the men's club. Most women named their clubs a little bit more boldly. My favorite example, the women in the Provençal hill town of Grasse called themselves the Constitutional Amazons. Members came from artisanal or bourgeois backgrounds. In Pau, down in the Pyrenees, a laundress founded a club. In Paris, the most radical women's club was formed by that chocolate maker, Pauline Léon, and also an out-of-work actress named Claire Lacombe. Like their male counterparts, these revolutionary women went through a phase of political apprenticeship. They learned how to run a formal association. They developed agendas and voting policies. They learned to speak from the rostrum. They plotted strategy for their petitions. They engaged in debate, local organizing, and petitioning on all kinds of questions, like what to do about the high price of bread, how to get rid of a counter-revolutionary mayor, or what they thought about the new constitution. Inevitably, the question of women's public role in politics came up for discussion, and the women shared their opinions with revolutionary men. For example, Elisabeth Lafaurie, a 22-year-old mother of four kids, she gave a speech to the Jacobin Men's Club of saint Sever. Her talk was called Discourse on the State of Nothingness in which women are held relative to politics. She argued that the denial of a political voice to women was, in her words, unjust because the total mass of women is subject to laws that they have not been able to refuse or approve. Now men, male revolutionaries, reacted in a variety of ways. Some men definitely resented such a public role for women. About political clubs, one male journalist demanded, why did they give themselves a president? Why hold sessions according to proper procedures? Why keep a register of their deliberations? He called the clubs a plague to the mothers of good families. He urged women to stay home. Otherwise, quote, there will be clubs everywhere, and soon there will be no good housekeeping anywhere. But some other men encouraged the female club members and they also hoped to influence them and teach them. Citizen Sobri told the women of Lyon that they should engage mainly in ceremonies and works of benevolence, as he put it. Like a frustrated fashion designer, he made sketches for appropriate patriotic attire for them to wear. White dresses with red belts and snappy blue jackets topped off with tricolor ribbons and gilt bronze medallions. Citizen Sobri put his finger on one reason why local Jacobins often actually liked the female clubs. They could offer practical help on the local level. Women's political societies often combined charitable activities with politics. For example, they ran workshops to employ poor women. They took up donations to help pay off the national debt or to help with poor relief. And once France went to war in 1792, women's clubs became veritable highs of activity. They made uniforms, they tore cloth into bandages, they orchestrated festive send-offs for young soldiers. When the assembly closed down convents, women's societies stepped in to replace the nuns. They ran the hospitals or cared for the poor. Also, in the local conflicts over the constitutional church, 
Jacobin women's clubs often rallied support for the oath-taking constitutional priests. Women's societies also ran local festivals. But women in general, whether they were in clubs or not, played a key role in the festivals and rituals of the new nation. Some of them later in the revolution even acted the part of goddesses of reason or goddesses of liberty. In the early revolution, they helped carry out the most pervasive political ritual of the early 1790s, planting or dedicating liberty trees. During revolts against the local lords in southern France, peasants had begun to hang revolutionary slogans on trees. Soon these were called liberty trees, and the practice spread across France. By 1792, 60,000 towns and villages had liberty trees. They were symbols of revolutionary allegiance and symbols of optimism. People hung the trees with blue, white, and red ribbons or flags or copies of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. And because mothers and children especially embodied fertility and new growth and hope, they were the ones in charge of taking care of these newly planted trees. One municipal officer in the north, he asked mothers to, quote, make fertile the seed of liberty in their children's hearts. For good luck, French luck, they watered the tree with wine. The official report said, we hope it will live since we gave it a good drink, and we drank quite a lot ourselves too. More seriously, festivals were excellent forums for women and men to stir up the revolutionary spirit, to talk about politics, and educate the young. In speech giving, men predominated, but plenty of women also gave speeches. In festivals and clubs, maybe at the men's society, at the visitors' podium in the National Assembly, they also gave impromptu speeches in the streets and the marketplaces, or maybe they yelled things from the galleries of the Paris Jacobin Club or the Assembly. Sometimes, revolutionary women turned to the question of women's rights. For some of them, their very activism showed that women deserved recognition and rights. For example, one co-ed political society in Paris organized an extensive campaign for women's rights, especially their civil rights within families. A member of this group was a Dutch rabble-rouser named Etta Palmdelders. She led a delegation to the visitors' podium in the assembly to make the case. Women have shared the dangers of the revolution. Why shouldn't they participate in its advantages? Men are free at last, and women are the slaves of a thousand prejudices. Then she lobbied the deputies to legalize divorce, recognize women over 25 as full adults, and set up primary schools across the nation for girls. And last but not least, she urged them to decree, quote, that political liberty and equality of rights be common to both sexes. Let's step back for a moment and look at this swirl of women's activism during the early revolution. A few things stand out. First, the variety of women's political engagement. In most cases, these activists hadn't organized to demand rights for themselves. They were not an organized feminist movement on the level of, say, the American women's suffrage movement. But their activism built on revolutionary ideology, and it raised the question of full political citizenship. There were two French individuals who outlined and published the most forceful arguments in favor of giving women full political rights. One was a man, the mathematician Condorcet. The other was a woman, the writer Olympe de Gouges. Who were they, and what did they have to say? These two people couldn't have been more different. Olympe de Gouges was a self-educated daughter of a butcher, she was a struggling playwright who'd been living on the edges of Enlightenment society. And for his part, Marie-Jean de Carita, Marquis de Condorcet, was a well-known Enlightenment thinker. He had ancient noble blood. We'll start with him. By 1789, this brilliant mathematician and social theorist had written on the influence of the American Revolution in Europe. He was a member of the Society of the Friends of Lax. His wife ran an Enlightenment salon. He joined other liberal nobles. He supported the revolution. He was elected as a deputy in 1791, and Condorcet soon became a prominent force in revolutionary politics. And then in 1790, he shocked readers with his essay. It was called On Giving Women the Right to Citizenship. Condorcet argued that men had natural human rights because they were, quote, feeling beings capable of acquiring moral ideas and of reasoning about these ideas. Since women had the same human characteristics, how could a revolution built on equal rights deny them to half the population? Either everyone had rights or no one did. 
Now, Condorcet knew that he had to address the classic counterarguments about women's particular physiological and emotional characteristics. So he asked, why should pregnancy disqualify women from voting when no one would dream in these days of denying the vote to a man who had gout every winter or a man who caught colds too easily? He threw in a little humor. Maybe pregnancy would prevent women from ever being as brilliant as Voltaire, but they could definitely be as smart as Rousseau. Now, he readily admitted that most women didn't reason in the way that men did, but he claimed that women were fully capable of reason. He said they had great wit, wisdom, and an analytical ability that rivals that of the most subtle dialectician. He thought it was true that women weren't fully ready to become informed voters, but he blamed that problem on their lack of education. It was not an inherent flaw in women's nature. And in fact, when Condorcet became a deputy a year later, he was appointed head of the Educational Committee, and he dedicated himself to the revolutionary project of providing secular, state-run public education for the first time ever in France. In his plan, he wanted to give the same education to girls and boys. He declared, inequality of education is one of the main sources of tyranny. He also assured his readers that women could have political rights and still be good mothers, although maybe they shouldn't be deputies. Condorcet's feminist argument was lucid, it was powerful, it had lively rhetorical flourishes. He grounded his case in the formidable universal rights discourse of the day, and he stayed true to his rationalist aspirations. He systematically named and then argued against the main arguments against female citizenship, women's physiology, her emotional characteristics, her alleged irrationality, her lack of mental capacity, and her domestic duties at home. But even though his arguments were powerful, Condorcet didn't have much luck convincing his fellow male revolutionaries. In fact, as we'll see at the end of the lecture, he didn't even quite manage to fully convince himself. Olympe de Gouges struck an even bolder note than Condorcet did. She wrote a pamphlet in 1791, The Rights of Woman. First, here are a few words on her life. Her real name was Marie Gouze. She came from southern France, and she became a master of inventing herself. Her father was a butcher, but she spread the rumor that she was actually the illegitimate child of a marquis, a nobleman. She was married off against her will at the age of 17. She gave birth to a son, and soon afterwards, her husband died in a flood in their hometown. So then she cooked up a new name for herself, Olympe de Gouges. This name had more flourish, and it sounded aristocratic with the little word de in there. Then at the age of 20, she followed a lover to Paris. She was tall and striking. She had chestnut hair and an Occitan accent. She made her way at the fringes of Enlightenment society. She was seen as somewhat eccentric. De Gouges had, as she said, a craze to write. By 1784, she had written two novellas and about 30 plays. But it took until 1788 for her to get any of these works actually into print. Then the revolution brought its vibrant politics and the explosion in publishing that was tailor-made for the Gouge. She threw herself into the fray. Now, she published with remarkable boldness. She published often, pouring out pamphlets or plays on topic after topic. She wrote against slavery. She wrote in favor of divorce and the rights of illegitimate children. She called for a national theater, and she wanted a theater that performed plays that had been written only by women. She suggested regulating prostitution. She proposed a luxury tax to raise money for the poor. She also went to the galleries of the Assembly and the Jacobin Club, and she plastered the walls all around Paris with posters and manifestos about politics. She supported the constitutional monarchy, and when Louis XVI was put on trial in 1792, she even offered to lead his defense. He didn't take her up on it. Likewise, she dedicated her Declaration of the Rights of Woman to the Queen, but Marie Antoinette never wrote her back. In the fall of 1791, de Gouche published The Rights of Women. Woman, wake up. The alarm bell of reason is heard throughout the universe. Know your rights. This pamphlet was rambling, imaginative, and bold, kind of like Olympe herself. She made the effective rhetorical move of substituting the word woman for the word man in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. And in this society where married women had no legal control over the couple's property, de Gouche called for full property rights for all women. On every level, point by point, she laid out women's right to equality before the law. She proposed their right to freedom of expression and their full political representation. 
Like the male revolutionaries, she took Rousseau's famous idea of the general will. She used it to argue that women should participate in running the nation for the collective good. Article 10 of her Declaration of Rights of Women made the case with vivid language. Woman has the right to mount the scaffold, so she ought equally to have the right to mount the rostrum. In other words, if women could face execution by the law, she should also take part in making the law. Her pronouncement is all the more searing since Degouche herself would be executed during the terror, not because she was a feminist, but because she was a royalist, a supporter of the constitutional monarchy. Olympe de Gouge even declared that women had the right to become public political leaders. They should be allowed to hold any public office, any public employment. At the time, this claim was breathtaking, even outrageous. Condorcet had not been so bold. And a few months later, when the legendary English feminist Mary Wollstonecraft published her Vindication of the Rights of Women, even she did not claim public political leadership for women. Olam de Gouge also talked about family issues at length. She pronounced marriage is the tomb of trust and love. At the time, divorce was illegal, arranged marriage was common, and civil law put women into a subordinate position. De Gouge proposed a voluntary union in which men and women had identical financial and legal powers and they would also have equal access to their communal property. She even stated that children should be able to bear the last name of the mother or the father. De Gouge saw the strong connection between women's civil rights in the household and women's political rights as citizens. In the spring of 1793, the deputies finally took up the issue of women's suffrage. By that point, they'd already done away with property qualifications for men. They had set up universal manhood suffrage for all men except vagabonds or dependent servants. But a very different logic governed the debate on women. Only a handful of deputies argued in their favor. Pierre Guillaumar got up and asserted that it undermined democracy itself to exclude women. If women were excluded because they needed to stay home and run their households, then, he remarked ironically, it might also be necessary to exclude all men whose presence in the workshop is equally essential. But the debate on women voting was not long, and it wasn't intense. Even Condorcet had abandoned his previous position because of political trade-offs. He didn't put up a fight. And another deputy was booed when he tried to defend women's rights. The idea of women's suffrage didn't have a chance. As one deputy commented about women voting, it is beyond me to think that men and women would gain anything good from it. That summer, some of the women's clubs who supported the new constitution also protested that it didn't give them the vote. But they would have to settle for expressing their citizenship in other ways. Now, there were two main reasons why the legislators didn't even seriously consider giving women the vote. First, in this century that was devoted to the Enlightenment principle of reason, women were not considered to be fully rational. People believed, both men and women, believed that men and women had different strengths. Men were thought to be more rational and women more moral. Many revolutionaries thought that women could serve the revolution most effectively if they were a moral force for patriotism inside the household or on the street. They didn't need to be voting citizens. And there was a second reason they didn't give women the vote. In the cultural imagination and in legal practice, women weren't considered to be full individuals. They were always conceptualized as members of families, as dependent beings, dependent on husbands, fathers, or brothers. Although revolutionary leaders didn't grant women full political rights, they did give them unprecedented access to civil rights. Revolutionary lawmakers couldn't wrap their minds around the idea of women as voters or political officials, but they did think that they should be equal to men in other ways. New family laws gave women more independence, power, and rights inside households. Sisters gained equal inheritance with their brothers. Young women won the right to choose their own husbands. Unhappy wives, just like unhappy husbands, got the right to initiate a divorce, an almost unthinkably radical idea in this period. Also, when the French tried for the first time to set up public education, 
they decided that both boys and girls should have equal access to free secular primary schools, and that both lay men and women should be their teachers. And for the longer term, the revolutionary activists had started to show how the language of rights, equality, and sovereignty could be used later on to argue for women's full political rights. 19th century feminists would build on many of these arguments and practices. But it would be a long haul. French women didn't get the vote until 1944. In the next lecture, we'll check in on Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, who were finding it increasingly difficult to be king and queen in the middle of a revolution. Lecture 15, The King's Flight. On the morning of the 21st of June, 1791, the servants in the royal palace had a shock. The king, the queen, and the royal children were missing. So were some servants, including the queen's hairdresser. Rumors had been circulating for months that someone might kidnap the king. Now, maybe counter-revolutionaries, aristocrats, or foreign agents had carried out a plot like this. People in the streets of Paris speculated wildly about the king's fate. Some of them came to the palace to check things out. Within hours, Lafayette and the National Assembly officially declared that Louis had been kidnapped. They sent orders out across France that his abduction must be foiled and the king must be detained. In fact, the night before, the king had fled. His Majesty Louis XVI, the absolutist king of France, by the grace of God, was trying to run away from his kingdom. With his family and a few key servants, the king was now traveling in disguise in a carriage rolling toward the frontier. He was hoping to escape into the Austrian Netherlands, as Belgium was called at the time. He wanted to put an end to this revolutionary business. Sometimes in history, one small event makes a big difference. It becomes a significant turning point. The flight of the king was an event like that. In this lecture, we'll look at the king's flight. We'll see how it profoundly changed the national mood and how it radicalized the revolution. Ever since October 1789, when the market women had forced Louis and Marie Antoinette to come back to Paris, the king had played a double game. On the outside, he went along with the revolution. He followed Lafayette's advice to appear every once in a while in front of the National Assembly. And sometimes, maybe he felt optimistic because of the outpouring of popular support for him. For example, at the Festival of Federation in July 1790, when he took an oath of loyalty to the new constitution. But most of the time, Louis resented his loss of absolutist power and the reform of the church left an especially bitter taste. After he had agreed to the civil constitution of the clergy, he remarked privately, I would rather be king of Metz than king of France at a time like this. And in secret, he strategized with his advisors. They plotted to slow the revolution down. He wanted to regain at least part of his old power. And as for Marie Antoinette, she didn't even pretend to like the revolution. She corresponded secretly with the courts of Europe. She hoped to get them to intervene and interrupt the revolution. But even her brother, her brother was the Austrian emperor, Leopold II. At first, he took no action. Maybe he even liked it that France was weaker because France was an old rival of Austria. Then, on Easter Sunday in 1791, a Parisian crowd surrounded the carriage when the royal family was trying to go to a chateau on the edge of Paris. They were hoping to go to an Easter mass that would be said by a non-juror priest, one who hadn't taken the oath of allegiance to the revolution. Louis was shocked to hear some people hurling insults at him, and the National Guardsmen refused to even open the gate. Finally, after waiting for more than two hours, the royal family finally just gave up on their plans. Marie Antoinette commented bitterly to the Guardsmen, you can see that we're not free. And two days later, she wrote the Austrian ambassador, our position is dreadful. We have to get out of it by next month. The king desires this even more than I. Count Axel von Fersen began to help the royal couple, making detailed plans for escaping their palace. 
Fersen was a dark-haired, handsome Swedish aristocrat. He'd fought in the American Revolution, but apparently his commitment to revolution didn't stick. He was tall and suave. He'd cut a fine figure out at the court of Versailles before the revolution. Over her lifetime, there were rumors and pornographic pamphlets that accused Marie Antoinette of taking many lovers. But only Fersen may have actually been her lover. Historians will never know for sure, but they certainly like to speculate. In any event, the queen and the count, they grew close. He wrote, she is an angel, and I try to console her as best I can. He brought her Swedish calfskin gloves scented with roses. Now, in the spring of 1791, he disguised himself as a commoner, and every night he went to the Tuileries Palace to plan logistics for the royal flight. He helped Marie Antoinette smuggle out her diamonds and makeup. They got out much of her wardrobe and even a few pieces of furniture ahead of time. He oversaw the construction of a special getaway coach. It was fully equipped with leather seats, a well-stocked picnic basket, it had wine racks, and even a leather-covered chamber pot. One revolutionary journalist later joked that it was a miniature Versailles, lacking only a chapel and orchestra. Around midnight, on the night of June 20th, 1791, the king, the queen, their two children, the king's sister, and a few servants assembled in this early modern SUV of a carriage, and they slipped out of Paris. The occupants were traveling in disguise as ordinary citizens. The five-year-old son, the heir to the throne, he wore girls' clothing. But the royal party's disguise wasn't perfect. Three livery men wore bright, showy yellow outfits, and they were riding on top of the royal getaway coach. They were the bodyguards. Along the way, the coach stopped a few times to change horses. Then as the royal family got more relaxed, the king started stepping out and talking with the peasants about the harvest. When one of the guards warned him about this, Louis told him, don't worry, my progress now seems quite safe. Several times, people recognized the king, but no one knew quite what to do about it. Meanwhile, at the border up north near Metz, a royalist general named Bouillet was orchestrating a movement of troops. They were going to meet the king and protect his final escape across the border. These troop movements made the peasants and the townspeople of northern France nervous. What was going on? A conspiracy against the revolution? An invasion by the Austrians? No one knew. In fact, behind the scenes, the Austrian king, Leopold II, had finally agreed that Austrian troops would meet the royal party if, and only if, they actually crossed the border and abandoned the revolution. And as for the king, his own plans weren't quite clear. It seems that he hoped to negotiate with the National Assembly. He wanted to get them to restore his monarchical power and overturn some of the most revolutionary reforms, like the abolition of privilege and the reform of the church. Louis naively believed that people outside of Paris would back him spontaneously when he rolled back the revolution. And if the king had succeeded in escaping, it undoubtedly would have caused a civil war Quite possibly, it would have caused an international war. But Louis never actually managed to leave France. Late that night, in the town of Varennes, about 30 or 40 miles from the border, the coach ground to a halt. It had been stopped by a group of National Guardsmen. Jean-Baptiste Drouet, a stable master, had recognized the king. After all, Louis's face was everywhere, with its big distinctive nose and double chin, it was, on, it was on coins and assignats, the new paper money. Jouet insisted that they check the occupants' passports carefully. They needed to figure out their identity. He, for one, was sure that he stood before the king and queen of France. Jean-Baptiste Sauce was a greengrocer who had become the town manager of Varennes. He went and got a local judge who'd once been to Versailles. When that judge recognized the king, he fell onto one knee and stammered out the words, Ah, your highness. Louis saw that his cover was blown. Yes, I am your king. I have come to live among you, my faithful children, whom I will never abandon. Louis then embraced the municipal officers and told a powerful tale. He claimed that he had fled Paris for his own safety. If I remain in Paris, both I and my family will die. 
He said that Jacobin fanatics had seized the capital. Louis promised that he never meant to leave the country. He was only planning to restore order from a French fortress at the border, far away from the threatening crowds of Paris. Louis's dramatic tale nearly convinced the officials. They were awestruck to be in the presence of the king, the queen, the little prince and heir, and his older sister. Sosa's mother burst into tears, and the officials then promised to help Louis and escort him to the French citadel at the border. But after an agonizing all-night meeting, they changed their minds. Someone had rung the church bells, putting everyone on alert. Crowds poured into the streets. National guardsmen from nearby communities filled the town. And people soon began to understand the recent movements of foreign mercenaries. Clearly, some kind of conspiracy was afoot. No way could the patriotic town of Varennes let the king be abducted or slip away. By dawn, two couriers from Paris arrived with a decree from the National Assembly, a clear order that the kidnapped king should be stopped and detained. When the couriers and town leaders presented the decree to the royal couple, Marie Antoinette hurled it to the floor and declared, what insolence? Louis only sighed wearily and said, there's no longer a king in France. People crowded into the streets and yelled, to Paris, to Paris. The town leaders then turned around the luxurious royal carriage and the smaller cabriolet that they also had. They packed up the royal family and they set out for Paris. Thousands of National Guardsmen accompanied the carriages. They were worried about an attack from General Bouillet. But the king's hope that he would be rescued, his hopes faded as the crowd surrounding the carriages got bigger and bigger on the way to Paris. General Bouillet had heard about the masses of civilians and guardsmen around the coach, and he wisely slipped over the border into exile. It took four days for the royal cortege to reach Paris. The accompanying crowd grew to over 30,000 people. There were at least 6,000 guardsmen and thousands of men, women, and children. Many of them carried clubs, pitchforks, or pikes. Onlookers were curious. They were elated at their chance to catch a glimpse of the king and queen. The mood was festive, but an undercurrent of fear and anger washed through the crowd. Nervous individuals taunted the royal bodyguards in their splendid yellow livery. Some of them hurled rocks or pieces of dung at them. The rumors of the king's flight had spread out in waves from Paris. These rumors sent shivers of terror across France. Messengers on horseback carried news of the flight and then news of his recapture. These astonishing stories were followed by more rumors that surely the Austrians had invaded. Maybe there were 60,000 of them. There were also rumors that internal enemies, aristocratic ones, had plotted the king's flight, and now they planned to steer him away. Maybe the plotters were in cahoots with the emigres who had fled just across the border. Panic spiraled across France. Terrified by the rumors, townspeople everywhere took up arms and swore oaths to live free or die. And those who were close enough to the route to Paris, they flocked to join the convoy. They wanted to surround the king and protect him, but they also wanted to prevent him from running away again. Meanwhile, inside the carriage, the king and queen were exhausted. They were distraught and stunned. Finally, they were relieved when three deputies arrived and also Lafayette. These men would assure their safety and escort them to Paris. Lafayette and his troops guided this strange procession around the city to enter from the northwest and travel down the Champs-Élysées. They wanted to avoid the radical working class neighborhoods in the east where popular radicalism ran hot and where the Bastille had stood. Throngs of people lined the streets, but a strange silence hung over the crowd. Posters everywhere warned the people, whoever applauds the king will be flogged, whoever insults him will be hanged. Now take a moment to consider the significance of that official warning. What kind of monarchy was this? The people couldn't cry out, long live the king, but they couldn't insult him either. Who knew what this meant for the politics of France, for the uncertain position of the king? this reluctant constitutional monarch. In fact, when they discovered the king's flight, the National Assembly had struggled with the issue of what to do in this unprecedented moment. Never before had France been without a king or a king's regent. One deputy wrote in his diary, 
May God help us now. When the assembly ordered that the kidnapped king must be stopped, they essentially stepped up their own powers as an emergency government. The assembly voted that their laws no longer needed the king's approval. They suspended his power. This was a striking act. Never before had law been made in France without the king. Once the king was brought back to his palace, the deputies had to deal with the loaded question of what to do with this ruler who had just run away. And the king's own actions hadn't helped his case at all. When he fled, he also left behind a handwritten declaration to the French people. He detailed his criticisms of the revolution. He protested bitterly in this document about his loss of power, prestige, and revenue. Deputies on the left demanded that Louis immediately be put on trial. But moderate leaders argued that they could only keep order by supporting the king and claiming that he had been kidnapped against his will. Now, to support this fiction, the moderates used a letter from General Bouillet. Bouillet had sent this letter from his safe perch in Luxembourg. The general claimed that the king had never wanted to flee France. General Bouillet told a gallant lie. I arranged everything, decided everything, ordered everything. I alone gave the orders, not the king. It is against me alone that you should direct your bloody fury. Barnav, who was the leader of the moderates, he argued compellingly that it was time to end the revolution. It was time to promulgate the constitution and support the king. So on July 15th, the National Assembly announced the definitive results of their investigation. The king had been kidnapped. No one in France was convinced, but at least the king was back. Everyone knew that things had changed. So we need to ask now, what impact did the king's flight have on the course of the revolution? First, and most important, it radicalized the revolution. The flight of the king now made it possible to imagine France as a republic with no king at all. Remember that the French people had continued to feel loyalty, even reverence for their king, as the revolution got going. The tremendous power of the royal mystique hung on well after 1789. Despite all his bumbling and his indecisiveness, Louis still commanded respect and affection. But when he ran away, something fundamental changed in the French psyche. Timothy Tackett, the premier historian of the King's Flight, has uncovered masses of evidence from all across France of a sudden and deep disillusionment with the king. Personal letters and diaries, petitions, the press, the minutes of political clubs and town meetings, all of these sources reiterate a sense of betrayal, puzzlement, and disbelief. But people, the French people, also got angry at the king's betrayal, especially when they heard news that the king had left behind a declaration attacking the revolution. People were shocked and outraged. The declaration made clear the king's double game. Letters to the assembly poured out epithets against the king's hypocrisy. They called him cowardly and faithless, or perfidious and disloyal, or another one, a traitor to his oath, and yet another, his supposed goodness was only the most base hypocrisy. After the king fled, Parisians began to tear down symbols of royalty on public buildings. They knocked down busts and statues of kings. They smashed signs with the royal lily or the fleur-de-lis. They smeared soot and oil on the bourbon coat of arms. And in the press, caricatures depicted the king and queen as animals. Marie Antoinette suddenly found herself portrayed as a harpy. This creature had a queen's head. It also had wings, the tail of a snake, and talons. And the talons were crushing the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. An anonymous sign appeared on the wall of the Tuileries Palace just after Louis fled. This sign read, a large pig has escaped from the premises. Anyone finding him is urged to return him to his pen. A minor reward will be offered. Louis had a new name, Louis the False. Some of his loyal supporters saw the writing on the wall. Soon half the officers in the army, about 6,000 men of noble background, they turned against the revolution and left France. Many of them fled across the Rhine River to join the émigré and the king's brothers in Koblenz in German territory. Here, on the border of France, they strategized counter-revolution. Meanwhile, a radical idea began to percolate that summer of 1791. Did France really need a king? Maybe France should become a republic. Certainly, before the king's flight, 
Small groups of radicals had dreamed of creating a republic. But many people thought that a republic would only work in a small country, like one of the Swiss republics. Or maybe it could work in a young country, an isolated and weak country, a place like the new United States that didn't have an embedded tradition of monarchy. But France was large and old. It was traditional and powerful. It had been a monarchy forever. But now the idea of becoming a republic began to spring up more and more. About 650 letters and petitions poured into the assembly right after the king's flight. About a quarter of them argued that the legislature needed to take action against the king. The boldest ones proposed that they do away with the monarchy altogether. One petition from the political club of Montpellier put it succinctly. We ask only that henceforth the French might have no other king but themselves. After Louis' fight, a republic became thinkable, and the most radical revolutionary leaders began to work toward this goal. Once again, Parisian activists took the lead. The Cordelier Club became the epicenter of agitation for a republic. This political club organized a lively campaign against the king. They plastered posters on the walls all across Paris. They called for a government truly rooted in popular sovereignty. Hereditary royalty is incompatible with liberty. Over the next month, the Cordeliers targeted the assembly with about 17 petitions, and they sent in delegations demanding a republic. All of these petitions and delegations were dismissed by the legislature. Left-wing journalists published daily attacks on the king. One declared that Louis had broken the crown with his own hands. The Cordeliers worked together with other fraternal societies. Remember that Paris had about 50 of them. They also coordinated with the popular political assemblies that were called sections. In 1790, Paris had been divided up into 48 sections or electoral units. The word section also referred to the political assemblies that met to conduct local elections and to discuss neighborhood issues or bigger political matters. By 1791, the sections were meeting often, sometimes every night during a period of crisis. Only active male citizens could be full members of the section, but poorer men or women could attend and voice their opinions. In working class areas of Paris, the sections often had egalitarian politics and radical ideas. They became a force to be reckoned with. With political clubs, they planned demonstrations and festivals, fraternal banquets, petition campaigns, and collective trips to the assembly. When the assembly declared on July 15th that the king had been kidnapped, everyone knew it was a lie. The deputies who voted for it knew it was a lie. People in the streets of Paris and all across France knew it was a lie. One bookseller commented, the common people are furious. There is a frightful uproar throughout the city, from the square in front of the National Assembly to the smallest cafe. Then the Cordelier Club and the sections sprang into action. On July 17th, around noon, thousands of men and women marched to the Champ de Mars, where the Festival of Federation had taken place a year earlier. One Cordelier had drawn up several copies of a petition. It denounced Louis XVI's actions. It called for the immediate election of a new legislature. The petition didn't use that dangerous word republic, but clearly that was the goal. 6,000 people signed the petition and hundreds more stood in line. Lafayette had sent his National Guardsmen to oversee this demonstration. And that morning, the people had found two suspicious looking men lurking under the revolutionary altar of the nation. Maybe they were only hoping to peer up the skirts of women who were signing the petition. But a rumor spread that the two men were planning to explode a bomb. They were dragged out and hanged. Otherwise, the day was peaceful and the demonstrators were unarmed. But not surprisingly, the National Guard was on edge. Lafayette and the mayor of Paris declared martial law. Lafayette sent in more guardsmen. Before long, some demonstrators threw rocks and hurled insults at the soldiers. The guard then fired directly and repeatedly into the crowd. Panic broke out as the demonstrators turned and fled. They were trampling on one another. Some guardsmen on horseback even chased the people as they surged out of the stadium. In the words of one observer, no one would ever forget this terrible atrocity. 
The next day, the mayor reported an official death tally of two soldiers and 12 demonstrators. But actually, about 50 Parisians had been killed, and many more had been wounded. In October 1789, the National Guard had marched with the people to Versailles to get the king and queen, but now for the first time, they had fired on the people. This massacre at the Champ de Mars shocked Paris and shocked France. The incident polarized people. Some blamed the Republican petitioners for daring to question the monarchy and stir up disorder. Others indicted Lafayette and the National Guard. Barnave and the moderates in the National Assembly put the blame on Republican troublemakers. The Assembly reestablished the old regime system of police spies. They hounded radical journalists and arrested suspects. They hoped to bring this period of agitation to a close. So the assembly finally put the finishing touches on the constitution and sent it to the king. At this point, Louis pretty much had to agree. On September 14th, he formally accepted the constitution of 1791. The queen wrote in her journal, the constitution is a tissue of impracticable absurdities. She advised Louis to be as terse as possible in his acceptance speech. This constitution performed a delicate balancing act between king and legislature. The single chamber legislature would initiate lawmaking and it would have charge of financial matters. The king would have a suspensive veto, the power to declare war and the right to appoint ministers and diplomats. One of its authors commented, the constitution was a veritable monster. There was too much republic for a monarchy and too much monarchy for a republic. And in fact, in less than a year, the monarchy would be overthrown altogether. For now, let's stand back and look at the staggering results of the king's attempt to escape France. Without a doubt, this event caused the revolution to take a more radical turn. Only a minority of the people believed in the idea of a republic. It was too hot to handle for now, but for some, it became a live possibility. And at the same time, the king's flight had unleashed panic across France, making it all the more possible for later events to precipitate fear and paranoia. This is a point worth remembering when we reach the terror. The king's flight deepened the dread of those who opposed all the revolutionary changes. It provoked thousands of nobles, including many officers in the royal army, to leave France entirely. And finally, their own flight left the king and queen in an even more fragile position. They continued more than ever to play a double game and to hope for rescue from abroad. The kings of Austria and Prussia issued a joint declaration calling on European sovereigns to restore the French monarchy. In the next lecture, we'll look at foreign responses to the revolution among France's European neighbors. The revolution had caught Europe's attention. It sparked debate about reformist politics everywhere. It spurred a flood of radicals to flock to Paris, and it stunned neighboring monarchs. Lecture 16, Foreign Reactions, A Divided Europe. In June 1790, a Prussian named Jean-Baptiste Clotz appeared at the National Assembly in Paris. He was leading a delegation of 35 foreigners. This group included several Middle Easterners, but they were mostly Europeans, especially foreign radicals from nearby lands, Dutch and Italian patriots, Belgian revolutionaries, and Swiss Democrats in exile. Clotz congratulated the French revolutionaries for inspiring people across the globe and he exhorted them to spread the light of liberty and revolution to all countries. Clothes and his band of foreigners represented one international response to the revolution, but not everyone was so enthusiastic. In fact, the early revolution split Europe in two. The revolution had a divisive impact on political thought and ideology and on the internal politics of other nations. It also affected international geopolitics. By 1792, France would go to war with Austria and Prussia over its revolution. This lecture explores the tremendous international repercussions of the French Revolution throughout Europe. We'll focus on two key elements from the early years before France went to war. First, 
When the Europeans reacted to the French Revolution, they began to invent a division that is fundamental to modern politics, the debate between radicals or liberals versus conservatives. The debate between the conservative Edmund Burke and the revolutionary Tom Paine will give us an influential example. Then we'll look at the human diaspora across Europe. Foreign radicals poured into revolutionary France. And at the same time, French counter-revolutionary nobles and emigres fled out of France. Paris became the cosmopolitan capital of political radicalism. The foreign radicals wanted to spread revolution abroad. And at the same time, the emigres wanted foreign monarchs to help them invade France and crush the revolution. This international context, this deepening divide over the revolution, will also help us to understand the outbreak of war, the subject of our next lecture. First, let's look at responses in Great Britain, France's great commercial rival and frequent enemy in the 18th century. The British watched the events of the revolution with great interest. Initially, they had a favorable response. Great Britain was Europe's premier constitutional monarchy. And at first, the French seemed to be following in their footsteps and inventing a constitutional monarchy of their own. The English had also experienced revolution themselves, twice in fact, in the 17th century. They had even beheaded their king, Charles I. For 11 years, they had no king at all from 1649 to 1660. Then, in the glorious revolution of 1688, the English parliament had called in William and Mary to replace their king, James II, because they wanted to make sure that the British monarchy remained Protestant. Now, a hundred years later, the British elites prided themselves on their stable government with its balance of power between king and parliament. But some people in England complained that power was concentrated in the hands of just a few. Most men couldn't vote, and the House of Commons certainly didn't represent British citizens as a whole. The American revolutionaries had just spotlighted the flaws in the British system of representation. In the 1780s, British radicals were already lobbying for parliamentary reform of their electoral system. Then events in France inspired them even more. Political clubs like the London Corresponding Society organized the middle classes and the workers in this campaign. They demanded voting rights for all men. Some reformers also argued for other causes like religious toleration or the abolition of slavery. In January 1790, one of these English radicals, the Englishman Tom Paine, wrote to his acquaintance Edmund Burke, the revolution in France is certainly a forerunner to other revolutions in Europe. But Burke sincerely hoped Paine was wrong. And in fact, these two men soon became the leading voices in a battle over the revolution's implications for Britain and beyond. Their struggle, like the French Revolution itself, played an integral role in defining modern democratic politics. Burke would become known as the father of modern conservatism. And Tom Paine became the iconic figure of the transatlantic age of revolutions. It's worth taking a look at what these two men had to say. One event especially provoked Burke to write his ideas down. On the 4th of November, 1789, an English Unitarian minister by the name of Richard Price gave a fiery sermon. He praised the outbreak of revolution in France right after the American Revolution. Tremble, all ye oppressors of the world. I see the ardor for liberty catching and spreading. His bold words infuriated Edmund Burke. Burke was an Irish-born politician who was already a major player in British politics. He hadn't wanted the Americans to break away from Britain, but he had supported their demand for fair representation and more equitable taxation. But now, Burke fired off a treatise against this revolutionary moment. His treatise, Reflections on the Revolution in France, attacked the French Revolution and defended the British system as it stood. What did he argue? First, Burke celebrated the way hierarchy and tradition held society together. King and queen over their subjects, aristocrats over commoners. These fundamental hierarchies were natural. They were emotionally powerful and orderly. To Burke, equality was just a ridiculous pipe dream. Custom, religion, and deference secured the social order. In a famous passage, Burke lamented the fate of Marie Antoinette as the beautiful embodiment of fallen majesty and hierarchy. It is now 16 or 17 years since I saw the Queen of France at Versailles, 
glittering like the morning star, full of life and splendor and joy. Little did I dream that I should have lived to see such disasters fallen upon her. Burke condemned the French for destroying chivalry and failing to defend the queen during the October days when the Parisians marched out to Versailles and threatened her. Then he attacked egalitarian individualism as egotistical and greedy. Also, Burke dismissed the new rights ideology. He viewed the concept of natural rights as abstract, impractical, and dangerous. Government was meant to control people for their own good. Here's Burke. Society requires that the inclinations of men should frequently be thwarted, their will controlled, and their passions brought into subjection. Burke also warned against abrupt changes in government. He wasn't opposed to reforms. He had advocated many reforms over the course of his political career, but he believed in gradual change. The drastic reforms in France struck Burke as the very epitome of disorder. Things like nationalizing church property that undermined property and broke the social contract. Burke's book was rhetorically powerful and it captured a pervasive unease with France's fast moving revolution. Reflections on the revolution in France became an instant bestseller. 7,000 copies were snapped up in just the first week. 30,000 copies had sold by the time of Burke's death in 1797. Its influence far surpassed these numbers. It was widely translated across Europe, and it especially influenced German conservative theorists. Not surprisingly, kings and nobles loved his work. King George III of Britain had copies given to his courtiers. Catherine the Great of Russia sent Burke her warmest congratulations. At home, Burke's treatise helped turn British sentiment against the French Revolution. But it also proved deeply divisive. Burke's friend, Philip Francis, wrote to him, the mischief you are going to do is palpable. It is visible. It is audible. I sniff it in the wind. I taste it already. Over the next two years, some 600 pamphlets appeared. They disputed the questions raised by Burke, rights versus duties, innovation versus tradition, republic versus monarchy, equality versus hierarchy, revolution versus order. Various well-known radicals wrote replies, including the feminist Mary Wollstonecraft, the chemist Joseph Priestley, the political philosopher William Godwin, and the Prussian quotes from the beginning of this lecture. Some anonymous pamphlets riffed on Burke's own language. For example, he had referred to the poor masses as the swinish multitude. Left-leaning pamphleteers made the most of this unfortunate phrase. Here's my favorite title, One Penny's Worth of Pig's Meat, or Lessons for the Swinish Multitude. This pamphlet compiled juicy tidbits from radical writings from all over the place. But by far the most famous and influential response to Burke came from Thomas Paine and his 1791 treatise called The Rights of Man. Tom Paine was the Quaker son of a corset maker. He had worked as an artisan, a teacher, a shopkeeper, and a tax collector. Then he went from England to the American colonies in 1774. There he discovered his true vocation, pamphleteer and revolutionary rabble-rouser. The American, John Adams, disliked Paine's dangerous egalitarianism. But Adams said in 1805, I know not whether any man in the world has had more influence on its inhabitants or affairs for the last 30 years than Tom Paine. Back in 1776, Paine's highly popular pamphlet, Common Sense, had inspired the American colonists with its lively attack on hereditary monarchy. It called for equal rights and for American independence. Now, Paine was back in England. In 1791, he once again captured the popular imagination with the power of his pen. About a quarter million copies of the two volumes of the Rights of Man rolled off the presses in Great Britain in just the first two years. And Paine, he bridged the Atlantic. He dedicated part one to George Washington and part two to Lafayette. What does Paine have to say in the Rights of Man? He simultaneously defended the French Revolution and criticized the British system. He countered Burke's vision and laid out a bold program of political and social reforms. Burke had emphasized the importance of historical continuity. He portrayed government as a partnership between the dead, the living, and the yet to be born. Paine famously attacked Burke's viewpoint, which he called, quote, governing beyond the grave. I am contending for the rights of the living. 
Paine advocated innovation and revolution rather than tradition. He declared that each generation had the right to make government for itself. Paine hated the arbitrary and despotic governments of Europe with their kings and landed aristocrats. They had produced only misery for people, poverty and war, injustice and unemployment. He contrasted Burke's lofty defense of Marie Antoinette with his contempt for the common man. He pities the plumage but forgets the dying bird. Paine defended the concept of equal and universal natural rights at length and he called for a representative government system to protect civil rights and carry out popular sovereignty. He compared the promising new French constitution with the deep inequities in the British electoral system. Paine deliberately wrote in everyday language in a direct and simple style. He promised, I shall avoid every literary ornament and put it in language as plain as the alphabet. Paine's frank language shocked some people but it was rhetorically effective and it won him a wide audience. Then in part two of his work, Paine presented his most radical program. He called on the state to support equality. If taxation became more progressive, the state could offer poor relief. It could pay for public education and set up public works for the unemployed. It could grant pensions to the old and to war veterans. Paine had an electric influence, particularly among the working class radicals of the early 19th century. He spurred them on to demand that Parliament expand voting rights and also introduce wholesale social reforms. The great historian E.P. Thompson called the rights of man the foundation text of the English working class movement. But Paine's treatise did not make him popular with the government. He was accused of seditious libel. In September 1792, according to one story, the poet William Blake warned Paine at a meeting of radicals you must not go home or you are a dead man. Whether the Blake story is true or not, Paine did flee across the channel to France. A few weeks later, he was tried and sentenced to death in absentia. Meanwhile, France welcomed him and offered him citizenship. They elected him to the legislature. He became a leading French revolutionary, but he faced 10 months of imprisonment in 1794 during the terror. Just before he was thrown in prison, he produced another controversial work called The Age of Reason. This treatise attacks Christianity in the name of a rational deist God. It alienated many of Paine's devout American supporters. Nevertheless, he returned to America in 1802. He died there, poor and isolated, seven years later. And as for Burke, he also withdrew more and more from public life but he kept on lobbying against France. He published his last work in 1796. It was called Letters on a Regicide Peace, and it warned the British not to make peace too easily with those French revolutionaries. Both Burke and Paine had tremendous long-term influence, but in the short term, Burke's position was stronger in Britain. By early 1793, British support for the French Revolution had soured. The British were appalled when the French executed their king. By February 1793, the two countries were at war. War and fear of revolution at home had produced a conservative backlash in Great Britain. The government took decisive steps to squelch the growing radical movement in towns like London, Sheffield, and Edinburgh. The authorities used libel laws to go after pamphleteers. They put several leaders of reform clubs on trial for treason. Then Parliament passed laws that prevented large meetings. They drove the radical movement entirely underground. But it would resurface powerfully in the 19th century. And in the heyday, in their heyday of the early 1790s, the British political clubs kept up a constant dialogue with the French Jacobins. In many cases, Britain actually traveled across the Channel to take part in the revolution directly. A nucleus of radicals around Tom Paine formed a club known as the British Club. It met at White's Hotel in Paris, and a few Americans joined in the British mix. This Anglophone community of radicals formed alliances with leading French revolutionary politicians, and also with foreigners from other nations. In the early 1790s, Paris had become a cosmopolitan mecca for rabble-rousers from across Europe and the Americas. Some who came were observers with revolutionary sympathies, like the young poet William Wordsworth. 
But some foreigners in Paris had much more explicit political intentions. For example, some Irish secretly sought French aid with a rebellion against their British occupiers back home. And political activists from Italy, the German Rhineland, or the Kingdom of Savoy in the French-speaking Alps also came with the dream of igniting revolution in their own homelands. Some important future revolutionaries cut their teeth in Paris in the early 1790s, like the Italian utopian socialist Philippe Buonarroti and the Venezuelan Francisco de Miranda, who later helped instigate the Spanish-American Wars of Independence. Within this swirl of transnational revolutionary dialogue, some of the most vocal groups of foreigners were refugees from revolutions of their own, especially the Dutch patriots, the Swiss, and the Belgians. This era is often called the Age of Revolution. The American and French revolutions are well known. Less well known are key revolts in smaller countries. In the 1780s, revolution had broken out in Switzerland, the Dutch Republic, and the Austrian Netherlands, the territory that's now called Belgium. The leaders of these revolts, like the Americans and the French, drew inspiration from the Enlightenment, from the dialogue about political reform and popular sovereignty. They also could draw on their own indigenous traditions. The Dutch drew on memories of their 16th century revolt against the Spanish. Let's take a brief look at the revolutions that sent a diaspora of radicals to France. These earlier revolutions are also important because France would later invade and occupy all of these territories in the name of spreading revolution. In some cases, France later set up sister republics in these lands. The Dutch Republic had no king, but the prince of the House of Orange traditionally had a great amount of power. Alongside the prince, there were powerful commercial leaders with aristocratic status, and they largely ruled politics. Seven years before the French Revolution, many middle class and artisanal city dwellers pushed for greater political voice. City by city, these Dutch patriots formed citizen militias and successfully pushed for elections to replace the Orangist leaders. But five years later, the King of Prussia brought in troops to support his ally, the Dutch Prince of Orange. The Prussians and the Orangists crushed the Patriot Revolt. Then 10,000 Dutch Patriots fled to France in the late 1780s. These Dutch political refugees followed French revolutionary events. They hoped that the French would help them spark revolution back in the Netherlands. In the same year as the Dutch Revolt, Democrat rebels demanded a broader franchise in Geneva in the Swiss Confederation of Cantons. When they were repressed by the patricians, these Swiss revolutionaries also fled to France. In the 1780s, the Belgians also attempted revolution against their Austrian occupiers. Austria was a formidable power in the 18th century. Its ruler, Joseph II, reigned directly over Belgium, Hungary, Bohemia, and parts of Italy, southern Poland, southwest Germany, and the Balkans. And like other earlier Austrian Habsburg rulers, Joseph was also emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. This was a loose affiliation of dozens of small states in Central Europe. Now, Joseph had become an aficionado of the Enlightenment. He believed that Enlightenment monarchs should make modernizing reforms from above. In the early 1780s, he tried to streamline and centralize the administration and the justice system. He wanted to make them more efficient the way the Enlightenment had directed him. Then, to be an enlightened king, he also introduced all kinds of religious reforms that infuriated Catholic Belgium. He closed down monasteries. He sounded like the French revolutionaries. He suppressed various Catholic holy days. He limited the carnival season of Mardi Gras to just one day. In 1788, the Belgians finally rebelled against their ruler, Joseph. By December 1789, the Belgian patriots had driven the Austrian troops out of most of the Austrian Netherlands. In early 1790, delegates from the 10 provinces of Belgium met at Brussels and proclaimed the United States of Belgium. They took inspiration directly from the Americans. They wrote up a constitution that was modeled on the American Articles of Confederation of 1776. But this new Belgian Republic was weakened by factional fighting. And within just a few months, the new Austrian emperor, Leopold II, kicked out the Belgian revolutionaries. Guess where they went? South, over the border, to France. All of these foreign radicals, 
engaged in French revolutionary politics in various ways. Many became journalists or members of French political clubs, but they also formed their own national political organizations and they produced their own newspapers. Here are a few examples. The Swiss Helvetic Club smuggled pamphlets into Switzerland. They called for revolutionary reform of the Swiss Confederation. Also, immigrants from the Alps of Savoy formed the Club of Foreign Patriots. And the Committee of United Belgians and Liegeois imagined a Belgian Republic, one that would work this time, and they called on the French to help them create it. No foreigner was more excited about creating international revolution than Jean-Baptiste Kloetz. This Prussian nobleman rejected his noble status. He rejected his Christian name. He renamed himself Anacarsis Klotz after an ancient philosophic journeyer to Greece. Klotz was dedicated to universal revolution. He worked energetically to become the ringleader of the foreign radicals in Paris. He networked with German, Dutch, Belgian, Swiss, and Italian patriots, and of course, with the French. Eventually, he was made a French citizen, and he was elected as a deputy into the legislature. Above all, he used his pen to call for spreading revolution abroad. He believed that liberty was a universal human goal. He took to calling himself the order of the human race. He wasn't shy. He urged France to create what he called a universal republic, a vast colonizing republic with Paris at its center. At first, the French revolutionaries avoided these international causes of the various foreign revolutionaries who'd come to France. But this would change. Some French revolutionaries would join with Clotes, and they would begin to call for a war of liberation and transnational revolution. Excitement about revolutionary politics had turned Paris into a cosmopolitan center for radicals from all over the place. But at the same time, these new politics drove many French opponents of the revolution out of the country. The revolution created a double diaspora, in and out. Let's look now at emigres who left France. Maybe about 150, 160,000 French people would eventually go into exile. They fled to various European countries and even to the New World. These emigres came from all social classes, but aristocrats and clergy departed more often than anyone else. In the first two years of the revolution, most of the emigres came from aristocratic background. During the peasant revolts, the prince de Conti fled in disguise as a peasant wearing a revolutionary cockade on a battered hat. The king's youngest brother left right after the fall of the Bastille. And on the night when Louis tried to flee, his other brother gave him one last hug and then rode north out of the country. Thousands of other nobles also fled, including many officers in the royal army. The émigré nobles who were in exile, they congregated in the German town of Koblenz, not too far from the border with France. Here they set up a shadow government, and they plotted counter-revolution. The king's cousin, the Prince de Condé, organized an army of maybe 20,000 strong. Despite their noble heritage, they were a ragtag bunch. They were poorly equipped. Later, the noble émigré and romantic novelist Chateaubriand he recalled that he could never get his broken musket to fire, even when they eventually actually went into battle. He wistfully called this emigre army a feudal levy, the last image of a dying world. These emigres dreamed of restoring the old regime in all its glory, complete with an absolutist monarch, privileged aristocrats, and an all-powerful Catholic church. They had three ideas for counter-revolution. Help the king to escape. No go, that didn't work. Provoke insurrection in France. No luck there either. A few pathetic attempts petered out. Third idea, convince European monarchs to intervene in France on Louis' behalf. Some of the princelings and bishops of the Holy Roman Empire happily backed the counter-revolutionary emigres. They hated the French revolutionaries who had actually taken away some of their lucrative seigneurial rights in Alsace. Gustavus III, the king of Sweden, also offered his support, but Sweden was distant and not very strong. Catherine the Great of Russia sent financial support because she would be happy if the Western and Central European powers went to war with one another. That might distract them from her own attempts to grab Poland. The French emigres tried the hardest to get the backing of Prussia and Austria, 
the two great rival powers of Central Europe. Like other European monarchs, the Prussian and Austrian rulers disliked all this revolutionary activity. They had already put down revolution in the Dutch Republic and in Belgium, but they remained leery of intervening in a country as powerful as France. But when Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were brought back to Paris, and when they were humiliated after they tried to run away, it made a huge impression on Frederick William II of Prussia and Leopold II, the Austrian ruler of the Holy Roman Empire. They began to listen more willingly to Louis' two brothers in exile. Two months after the French king's flight, the Austrian and Prussian rulers issued a warning to the French revolutionaries. The warning was called the Declaration of Pilnitz. Their joint action was all the more striking because Austria and Prussia had been at war with each other on and off for decades. But now the two rival kings joined together to call on the crowned heads of Europe to restore liberty and power to the King of France. This declaration of Pilnitz was more of a bluff than a real threat of action. The kings only promised to act if other kings across Europe would join them. This wasn't very likely, not at all for the moment. In fact, Britain, France's biggest rival, liked the weakened position of the French crown. It was happy to stay neutral. But the French revolutionaries didn't see Pilnitz, this declaration, as just a bluff. They wouldn't forget this threat in the coming months when they were debating whether to go to war to save the revolution. Some leading revolutionaries began to warn that outside powers like Austria and Prussia might join with French counter-revolutionary emigres. They might together invade and crush the revolution. Some of the French also began to dream of spreading revolution abroad. By the spring of 1792, France went to war against Austria, then Prussia, and soon other parts of Europe as well. The next lecture will explore why the revolutionaries went to war. Lecture.